Lucius Aelius Aurelius Commodus, born August 31st, A.D. 161, in Lanuvium, near Rome, was the son of Emperor Marcus Aurelius and Faustina the Younger. His twin brother, Titus Aurelius Fulvus Antoninus, died in 165, and on October the 12th, 166, Commodus became Caesar alongside his younger brother, Marcus Annius Verus. After Verus's death in 169, Commodus became the sole surviving son of Marcus Aurelius. I'm sure you know who Marcus Aurelius is, and if you don't, or if you do and would like to learn more about him, go and check out my very extensive video on the life of this great philosopher king. Now, back to Commodus. Under the care of his father's physician, Galen, Commodus received education from various tutors, including Onesicrates, Antistius Capella, Pithalaus, and others, focusing on his intellectual development, doing their best to give him a well-balanced perspective of the world. In 172, Commodus was present at Carnuntum, Marcus Aurelius's headquarters during the Marcomannic Wars. It is believed that on October 15, 172, he received the victory title Germanicus in the presence of the army, commemorating his father's triumph over the Marcomanni. On January the 20th, 175, Commodus joined the College of Pontiffs, marking the beginning of his public life. In the April of 175, Avidius Cassius declared himself emperor in Syria amid rumors of Marcus Aurelius's death. Despite Cassius' rebellion, Commodus assumed his toga virilis on the Danubian front on July 7, 175, signaling his formal entry into adulthood. Cassius was later killed by one of his centurions before the campaign could gather much speed. Commodus then accompanied his father on a journey to the eastern provinces, visiting Antioch and being initiated into the Eleusinian mysteries in Athens. They returned to Rome in the autumn of 176. And if you are waiting for a video on the Eleusinian mysteries, give me a few days. It'll be there. Marcus Aurelius, the fifth of the five good emperors, and the first since Vespasian to have a legitimate biological son, named Commodus as Imperator, on November 27th, 176. This date, while often considered the start of Commodus's reign, the exact chronology is still uncertain, but we generally can choose this as a roundabout date. He was proclaimed Augustus, or Emperor, some time before June 17, 177, and he likely counted his reign from the salutation in 176. Commodus was the first emperor born in the purple during his father's reign, a distinction he held until 337. On 
December 23, 176, both imperators celebrated a joint triumph. On January the 1st, 177, at the age of 15, Commodus became consul, becoming the youngest consul ever up to that point. And this was a break from tradition too, because at the time, the minimum age for consulship was around 30 years old. So, he was doing very well for a young lad. He then married Brutia Crispina, and accompanied his father to the Danubian front in 178. When Marcus Aurelius died on March 17, 180, Commodus, at the age of 18, became the sole emperor. Upon assuming power, Commodus devalued the Roman currency significantly. He reduced the weight of the denarius from 96 per Roman pound to 105 per Roman pound. Now that's 3.85 grams to 3.35 grams. He also lowered the silver purity from 79% to 76%, with the silver weight dropping from 2.57 grams to 2.34. In the year 186, he further reduced the purity and silver to 74%, making it 2.22 grams making it 108 to the Roman pound. This devaluation was the most significant currency manipulation since the reign of Nero. While Aurelius's reign had been marked by almost continuous warfare, Commodus's rule, rather, experienced relative peace on the military front. It was a good time. However, it was characterized by political strife and the increasingly arbitrary and capricious behavior of the emperor. Cassius, Dio, a contemporary and sometimes first-hand observer, described Commodus's accession as a descent from a kingdom of gold to one of iron and dust. Now, perhaps it's a little harsh. I mean, the reign of Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher king, is a very hard act to follow. But let's get back to Commodus. Despite the importance of his reign, Commodus's years in power are not well documented. The main surviving literary sources are Herodian, Cassius Dio, and the Historia Augustus, with the latter being considered unreliable due to its fictionized elements. Cassius Dio's reports for this period exist only as fragments and abbreviations. Commodus, after a brief time with the Danube armies, negotiated a peace treaty with the Danubian tribes and returned to Rome, celebrating a triumph on the 22nd of October 180 for concluding the wars. Unlike his predecessors, he showed very little interest in administration often delegating governance to a series of favorites, starting with Sauterus, a freed man from Nicomedia, serving as his chamberlain. Discontent with this situation led to conspiracies and attempted coups, prompting Commodus to take a more dictatorial role in governance. 
despite growing animosity from the senatorial order, evidence suggests that he remained popular with the army and common people. Thanks to his generous displays of largesse and participation in extravagant gladiatorial contests. Though not a skilled combatant, he engaged in staged fights, killing animals from a distance and having fellow gladiators submit to him. It all sounds a little silly now, but back then I'm sure it would have made him feel like quite a tough guy. Now, of course the bread and circuses were serving as somewhat of a distraction. A distraction from what? Well, his reign witnessed economic struggles. We'll get to them. To fund his largess and entertainment, he imposed taxes on the senatorial order. Notably, inscriptions provocatively reversed the traditional order of the two nominal powers, the Senate and the people, into the people and the Senate. Now, you'll probably see a lot of that SPQR. Well, that was the Senate and the people of Rome. Now, in Latin, we say Senatus Populus Que Romanus. But of course, he was saying Populus Senatus Que Romanus. So, turning this on its head, well... Of course, this did not make the nobility very happy. But, then again, they already have enough as it is, don't they? At the start of his reign, at the age of 18, Commodus inherited key advisors from his father. And his father had the best advisors including Tiberius Claudius Pompeianus, Gaius Brutius Tasons, and Titus Fandanius Vitrasius Pollio, among many others. He was Marcus Aurelius. Of course he had the best advisers. With four sisters and their husbands as potential rivals, family dynamics at this time played a significant role in the politics. Lucilla, over ten years his senior, and holding the rank of Augusta as the widow of Lucius Verus, orchestrated a conspiracy against Commodus in 182, allegedly due to envy of Empress Crispina. Remember, that was the one that he had married. Lucilla's involvement led to her exile, and later, execution, while Pompeianus retired from public life. The conspiracy also resulted in the execution of two men who were allegedly involved. One named Anianus, and another Quintianus. One of the Praetorian prefects, Publius Tarutenius Paternus, was later found to be part of the plot, and he and his colleague Sextus Tigidius Perennus orchestrated the murder of Sauterus, the disliked chamberlain. Apparently, Sauterus was running his mouth off all over Rome, and this does not win you many friends, of course. Devastated by the loss of Sauterus, Commodus's discontent provided an opportunity for Perennus to further his own position. Perennus implicated Publius Tarotenius Paternus in a second conspiracy purportedly led by Publius Salvius Julianus, who was engaged to Paternus's daughter. 
Salvius and Paternus, along with several other notable consulars and senators, were consequently executed. As a consequence, Didius Julianus, a relative of Salvius Julianus, and a future emperor, was removed from the governorship of Germania Inferior. Following the assassination of Sauterus, Perennus assumed control of the government, and Commodus appointed a new chamberlain and confidant in Cleander. A freedman from Phrygia, Cleander had married one of the emperor's mistresses, Demonstratia, and was in fact responsible for Salterus's murder, but nobody really knew that at the time. Following the attempts on his life, Commodus spent a considerable amount of time away from Rome, often at the family estates in Lanuvium. Given his physical strength, which was reportedly quite impressive, he just dedicated much of his time to athletic pursuits, engaging in horse racing, chariot racing, and combat with both animals and men. Now this was done mostly in private, but occasionally he would make a public spectacle of it, and this of course was much to the chagrin of the upper classes, but the people and the army thought that it was a fantastic display. In 183, Commodus assumed the consulship alongside Alphidius Victorinus and adopted the title Pius. During this time, conflict erupted in Dacia, but there are few details available. Notably, two future contenders for the throne, Claudius Albinus and Pescenius Niger, distinguished themselves in the campaign. In 184, the governor Ulpius Marcellus extended the Roman frontier northward to the Antonine Wall in Britain. However, due to the legionnaire's revolt against Marcellus, harsh discipline, another legate, Priscus, was acclaimed as emperor. Priscus rejected the acclamation, leading Perennus to dismiss all legionary legates in Britain. At the Capitoline Games on October 15th, 184, a cynic philosopher publicly accused Perennus before Commodus. Although the accusation was deemed false, the philosopher was still executed. According to Cassius Dio, Perennus, while ruthless and ambitious, was not personally corrupt and was actually a pretty effective administrator. In the following year, Soldiers from Britain accused Perennus of plotting to make his son emperor. Commodus, influenced by Cleander seeking to eliminate his rival, granted permission for their execution, along with Perennus's wife and sons. Bad luck for them. This event led to a new wave of executions with Alphidius Victorinus choosing to uh, take matters into his own hands rather than having somebody else do it in a painful manner. Ulpius Marcellus was replaced as the governor of Britain by Pertinax. Marcellus was brought back to Rome, tried for treason, and narrowly escaped death 
very lucky for Marcellus. After Cleander concentrated power and engaged in corrupt practices, for example selling public offices and titles to the highest bidder, unrest began to spread throughout the empire. Army deserters, deserters rather, caused trouble in Gaul and Germany, leading Peskinus Niger to undertake a military campaign against the deserters in Gaul. While a revolt in Brittany was quelled by legions from Britain, things were certainly hitting the fan in the provinces, and this never bodes well with the people back home, especially when people are losing. In 187, Maternus, one of the leaders of the deserters, attempted to assassinate Commodus during the festival of the great goddess. However, he was betrayed and quickly executed. That same year, Pertinax uncovered a conspiracy against Cleander by two of his enemies, Antistius Burus and Arius Antoninus. Consequently, Commodus withdrew from public appearances and preferred to reside on his estates, spending his days in quiet contemplation. In early 188, Cleander removed the current Praetorian prefect and assumed supreme command of the Praetorian Guard, enjoying unprecedented power. Cleander continued selling public offices, reaching its climax in 190 when he appointed a record 25 suffect consuls, all under his influence and close watch. Now in 190 there was a bit of bad luck for Rome, and a food shortage struck them very hard. Cleander faced blame orchestrated by the prefectus Anone Papyrus Dionysius. A mob protest during a horse race in the Circus Maximus led to Cleander's downfall. In June 190, the mob called for Cleander's head, and Commodus, under the influence of his mistress, Marcia had Cleander beheaded, because you have to give the people what they want, of course. The purge also included the execution of Cleander's son, Praetorian Prefect Julius Julianus. Commodus's cousin, Ania Fundania Faustina, and his brother-in-law, Mamertinus, Papirius Dionysus was also executed. In AD 191, Commodus assumed more direct control, ruling through a cabal consisting of Marcia, his chamberlain Eclectus, and the Praetorian prefect Quintus Emilius Latius. In defiance of the Senate, which he loved doing, Commodus consistently emphasized his unique status as a figure of godlike power, generosity, and physical strength. He commissioned numerous statues across the empire, portraying himself as Hercules, reinforcing the perception of him as a demigod, formidable in stature, a guardian, and a warrior battling both humans and beasts. Now, by aligning himself with Hercules, he asserted his claim as the son of Jupiter, the chief deity of the Roman pantheon. 
These tendencies escalated to megalomaniacal levels, moving away from emphasizing his lineage from Marcus Aurelius, the true source of his authority, and instead highlighting his personal role as the architect of a new order, reshaping the empire according to his own image. I'd like you to imagine for a moment the Roman emperor having a lot of help defeating the lions and all of the beasts in gladiatorial combat, not doing very much himself, at least what he was doing from a very great distance, and then upon defeating it, flexing his muscles and yelling, look how great I am, I am the son of Hercules. I think this is fantastic. I can only imagine it. In 191, a destructive fire swept through Rome, causing extensive damage to the public buildings, including the Temple of Pax, the Temple of Vesta, and even parts of the Imperial Palace. Seizing the opportunity in 192, Commodus declared himself the new Romulus and formally re-founded Rome, renaming the city Colonia Lucia Ania Commodiana. That's right, naming Rome after himself. He altered the names of all of twelve monuments, months rather, to correspond precisely with his various names. Furthermore, in a rather grand display, he renamed the legions Commodiane, labeled the grain importing fleet from Africa as Alexandria Commodiana Togota, designated the Senate as Commodian Fortunate Senate, and bestowed the name Commodianus upon his palace, the Roman populace, and more. The day of these reforms was to be known as Dies Commodianus. All of a sudden, everything in Rome, including Rome itself, was named after Commodus. If it's not a little bit arrogant, then perhaps it's way too confident. By these actions, Commodus portrayed himself as the central figure of the empire, the essence of Roman life, and the core of its religious identity. Remember, he also claimed to be the son of Jupiter, so I'm sure the Roman people were very surprised to hear that they had a demigod ruling over them. I'm sure they felt very lucky. He even replaced the head of the Colossus of Nero near the Colosseum with his own likeness, equipped it with a club, placed a bronze lion at its feet to create the image of Hercules Romanus, and inscribe a boast about being the only left-handed fighter to conquer twelve times one thousand men. Well done, Commodus. In November 192, he organized plebeian games, during which he engaged in a spectacle of shooting hundreds of animals with arrows and javelins each morning, followed by gladiatorial combat every afternoon, where, guess what, he emerged victorious in every single fight and was undefeated. In December, he declared his intention to commence the year 193 by assuming both the roles of consul and gladiator on the 1st of January. As Marcia, one of his confidants, 
discovered the list of individuals slated for execution, she found that she was on the list, along with some close friends of hers, Laetus and Eclectus. So, consequently, the three of them decided to get together. Upon having some rather heartfelt conversations about it, they decided they had no way out, and it was either die from the execution, or form a plot to assassinate the emperor. So, on the 31st of December, Commodus's food was poisoned by Marcia, but he managed to vomit up the poison. Subsequently, the conspirators dispatched his wrestling partner, Narcissus, to strangle him in his bath. Now, this seemed to work, and he lay there in the cold water for some time. Following his demise, the Senate very quickly declared Commodus a public enemy, and set to work on erasing his memory, and restoring the original name of Rome and its institutions. Remember all those statues of Commodus? Well, they were dismantled, and his body was interred in the mausoleum of Hadrian. The death of Commodus marked the conclusion of the Nerva Antonine dynasty. Pertinax succeeded Commodus, but had a very brief reign, becoming the initial contender to be overthrown during the Year of the Five Emperors. Video on that later on. In 195, Emperor Septimus Severus seeking to curry favour with the family of Marcus Aurelius, rehabilitated the memory of Commodus, and finally had the Senate deify him. Well, I think that Commodus had already deified himself by that point, if you know what I mean. So, let's have a little bit of a retrospective on the character and uh, the strength, that physical prowess that he was known for. Cassius Dio, an eyewitness to Commodus's reign, portrays him as not naturally wicked, but on the contrary as guileless as any man that ever lived. His great Simplicity, however, together with his cowardice, made him the slave of his companions, and it was through them that he, at first, out of ignorance, missed the better life, and then was led into lustful and cruel habits, which soon became second nature. Commodus's actions suggest a rejection of his father's policies, advisors, and lifestyle, indicating an alienation from the surviving members of his family. Raised in an environment of stoic asceticism, he wholly rejected these principles upon assuming sole rule. And of course, if you know anything about Marcus Aurelius, I'm sure that you couldn't imagine him slaying the animals in the arena and rigging fights to make himself look good. This is simply something that is not within Marcus Aurelius's makeup. However, kids always want to rebel, and that's exactly what Commodus did. There were repeated attempts on Commodus' life, and Roman citizens were often killed just for the fact that they displeased him. Notably, 
the attempted extermination of the Quintilii family occurred, where Condianus and Maximus were executed on the pretext of their wealth and talent, making them discontent with the existing state of affairs. Another disturbing incident took place at the Roman baths at Terme Torin, where Commodus had an attendant thrown into an oven for delivering lukewarm bath water. Rejecting his father's philosophical tendencies, Commodus took great pride in his physical strength. He was all brawn and very little brain, or at least if he had a brain, he tended to ignore it for the other characteristic that he so cherished. The contemporary historian Herodian described him as exceptionally handsome. Ordering numerous statues depicting him as Hercules with a lion's hide and club, Commodus considered himself the embodiment of the demigod Hercules, and often replicated the hero's feats by engaging in arena combat with various wild animals. Notably, and in reference to the aforementioned, he was left-handed, a characteristic of which he was particularly proud of. According to accounts from Cassius Dio and the writers of the Augustan history, Commodus was a skilled archer who could shoot the heads of ostriches in a full gallop and kill a panther who was attacking a victim in the arena. Commodus harbored a fervent passion for this gladiatorial combat, going to the extent of participating in the arena himself, donned as a secutor. His engagement in gladiatorial contests was widely regarded as scandalous and dishonorable by the Romans. Herodian noted that the spectators found it unseemly for an emperor to partake in such sporting events instead of focusing on campaigns against external threats to Rome. Rumors even circulated that he was not Marcus Aurelius' son, but rather the offspring of a gladiator with whom his mother Faustina had a liaison at the coastal resort of Caeta. In the arena, Commodus, of course, always emerged victorious, as his opponents invariably submitted to the emperor. Now, rather than killing his opponents, he simply accepted their surrenders. The defeated opponents often welcomed their scars inflicted by the emperor as a mark of fortitude. Indeed, one can imagine that if you had a scar that was inflicted by the Roman emperor punching you in the face, that it would be quite a story to tell to your friends back home. Cassius Dio claimed that Commodus would have citizens without feet due to accident or illness, bought to the arena, where they were tethered together for him to club to death, pretending that they were giants, a sort of reenactment of the old mythological stories. Dio also asserted that Commodus privately engaged in lethal combat, using deadly weapons to kill and maim opponents for his own amusement. For each appearance in the Roman arena, he charged the city of Rome a million sesterces, which of course put a great strain on the economy. It's no wonder he had to start watering down the silver content. Commodus was infamous for battling exotic animals in the arena, much to the horror and disgust of the people in attendance. Once again, according to the 
historian Cassius Dio, he once slew a hundred lions in a single day. On another occasion, he decapitated a running ostrich with a specifically designed dart, parading its bleeding head and his sword to the senator's seating area, suggesting that they were next. It's no wonder he was so popular with the other senators. So those senators in attendance did not quite see the humor in it, but they found it more ludicrous than frightening, and it's noted by some contemporaries that they concealed their laughter at how ridiculous this was with laurel leaves. Commodus also took on three elephants and a giraffe in a single day, killing them in the arena single-handedly. It was hard enough to source these animals for gladiatorial combat without Commodus using them all up for his own vanity fights. Well, quite an interesting character, isn't he? The Emperor Commodus. And although he is long gone, we have the pleasure of reading about him, thanks to Cassius Dio and the writers of the Historia Augusta. It's such a great pleasure to be able to hear about these rather interesting ancient figures, don't you think? Now, if you are still listening, I would advise you to like and subscribe the video, and we can have more of this content in the future. Thank you for joining me this evening. I'm the ASMR Historian. Good night, everyone. Thousands of years ago, a city was founded that would echo through the ages. An eternal city. The city of Rome. Walk with me through the ancient streets and thoroughfares as we explore the myths and legends of its earliest traces. Close your eyes. Let's explore them together as we understand the founding of Rome. The Founding of Rome is a historical event steeped in both archaeological evidence and mythological tradition. Archaeological findings suggest that Rome developed from the gradual union of several hilltop villages during the First Bronze Age, or perhaps the Early Iron Age with prehistoric habitation of the Italian peninsula dating back as far as 48,000 years. Settlement in the area of Rome can be traced to around 1600 BC, with evidence on the Capitoline Hill possibly dating as early as 1700 and the nearby valley housing the Roman Forum showing signs of a developed necropolis by at least 1000 BC. The process of amalgamating these hilltop settlements into a single polity likely occurred by the later 8th century BC and may have been influenced by the trend for city-state formation emerging from ancient Greece. According to Roman mythology, the city of Rome was founded by Romulus, the son of the war god Mars and the Vestal Virgin Rhea Silvia. Romulus, 
along with his twin brother Remus, were said to have been raised by a she-wolf at the Lupercal, before being discovered and raised by a shepherd named Faustulus. The brothers, upon learning of their royal lineage, sought to establish their own city and choose different hills as potential sites. Their disagreement over the choice of hill ultimately led to Remus's death, and Romulus proceeded to found the city of Rome on the Palatine Hill. However, modern historians cast doubt on the existence of a single founder or founding event for Rome, and no material evidence has been found linking early Rome to Alba or Troy, as suggested by the myth. Despite this skepticism, the legendary account of Rome's founding remained prominent in Roman culture, with festivals such as the Parilia commemorating the city's anniversary. The traditional date for the founding of Rome is 753 BC. According to the Veronian chronology. This date, along with the adjacent year of 752, has been officially sanctioned by various ancient historians and was celebrated in festivals and ceremonies throughout Rome's long history. Despite potential inaccuracies in Varro's calculations, the year 753 continues to be widely accepted. The conventional division of pre-Roman cultures in Italy revolves around the distinction between those cultures that spoke Indo-European languages and those that spoke non-Indo-European languages. The Italic languages, including Latin, are classified as Indo-European, and were primarily spoken in the lower Tiber Valley. While it was once believed that Faliscan, spoken north of Vey on the right bank of the Tiber, was a separate language, Inscriptions discovered in the 1980s indicate that Latin was more widely spoken in the area. Etruscan speakers were concentrated in modern Tuscany, with a similar language called Raetic, spoken in the upper Adige region, near the eastern Italian Alps. A reconstruction of the historical connection between peoples and their languages suggests that Indo-European groups arrived in Italy in waves of migrations during the first and second millennia BC. The first wave included a Western Italic group, which encompassed Latin followed by a central Italic group consisting of Osco-Umbrian dialects. Greek and Celtic migrations to the Italian peninsula occurred much later, from across the Adriatic Sea and the Alps respectively. These migrations are believed to have displaced speakers of Etruscan and other pre-Indo-European languages, although it's possible that Etruscan arrived through migration as well, likely some time before 2000 BC. 
the onset of the Iron Age, marked a period of gradual increase in social complexity and population, leading to the emergence of proto-urban settlements in central and northern Italy. These proto-urban agglomerations typically comprised clusters of smaller settlements that were geographically close enough to be considered part of the same community. Over time, these settlements would undergo a process of unification and urbanization. Archaeological evidence indicates that human occupation of the area around modern-day Rome dates back at least 5,000 years. However, the presence of a dense layer of much younger debris has obscured any Paleolithic and Neolithic sites in the region. Traces of occupation have been discovered in the broader vicinity of Rome, including areas such as Livinium and the coastal region near Ardea dating back to the 15th century BC. Before the emergence of the more regional Letial culture, the area was inhabited by the Apennine and Proto-Villanovan cultures. These early cultures left behind significant archaeological remnants that provide insights into the prehistoric occupation and development of the region that would eventually become what we know as modern-day Rome. Archaeological evidence suggests that Rome underwent a gradual development over an extended period of time, with definite occupation by the middle of the Bronze Age. Core samples taken from the area reveal significant differences in the terrain compared to the present-day landscape. During the Bronze Age, the region around the Forum Boarium, situated north of the Aventine Hill, served as a seasonally dry plain. Now this area formed multiple advantages, including serving as a safe inland port for seafaring ships of the era, a spacious location for watering horses and cattle, and a secure ford of the Tiber River. This proximity to the Tiber made it a crucial point for trade and transportation, serving as a major ford between Etruria and Campania. The surrounding hills, including the Capitoline, offered defensible positions for the settlement, and control over important resources, such as salt production over the river. Excavations in the Forum Boarium have uncovered thick deposits of manure and ancient pottery shards dating back to the middle of the Bronze Age. Evidence suggests the presence of three separate bronze-using settlements on the Capitoline Hill during the period from 1700 to 1350, followed by occupation in the neighbouring valley that later became the Roman Forum from 1350 to 1120. Structures from the 13th century BC indicate that the Capitoline Hill was already being terraced for management of its slope. 
By the final Bronze Age, around 1200 to 975, there was clear evidence of occupation on the Capitoline Forum and the adjacent Palatine Hills. Scholars speculate that settlements may have also existed on other hills, such as Janiculum, Quirinal, and Aventine. By 1000 BC, a necropolis existed in the Forum for cremation graves, and by the early Iron Age, around 900 BC, graves began to be placed into the ground. Additionally, cemeteries appeared on the Esquiline, Quirinal, and Viminal hills by the 9th century BC. They contained pottery, imported Greek wares, and many bronze objects, which was the style at the time. Remains of huts on the Palatine, dating back to the 9th or 8th centuries BC, suggest accelerating development during this period. By this time, four major settlements had emerged in Rome, with nuclei located on the Palatine, the Capitoline, the Quirinal, and Velia Hills, among others. However, there is no evidence linking any settlement on the Quirinal Hill with the Sabines, as some ancient accounts allege. The area of the Forum underwent significant transformation into a public space during this period. Burials ceased, and portions of the area were paved over. Votive offerings began to appear in the Comitium in the 8th century, indicating the development of a more central religious cult. Other public buildings, including the Domus Publica, the official residence of the Pontifex Maximus, are believed to have been constructed between 750 and 700 BC. Religious activity also commenced on the Capitoline Hill during this period, possibly connected to the ancient Greek cult of Jupiter Feretrius. Additionally, discoveries of imported Greek pottery from Euboa and Corinth indicate Rome's connections beyond Latium. The first evidence of a proper wall appears in the middle or late 8th century on the Palatine, dated between 730 and 720. This circuit of the wall likely marked what later Romans believed to be the original pomerium, or sacred boundary, of the city. Gates and streets connected to the wall, along with remains of various huts, suggest that Rome had acquired a defined boundary and a more sophisticated level of social and political organization by this time. The use of the forum as a public space indicates the development of a shared civil and ritual space for all inhabitants. This demonstrates an increased level of centralization. Similar to other Villanovan proto-urban centers, archaic Rome was likely organized 
around the clans that guarded their own areas, but had confederated by the later 8th century. The development of city-states may have been a Greek innovation that spread through the Mediterranean from 850 to 750. The earliest votive deposits found in the early 7th century on the Capitoline and Quirinal hills suggest that by that time a city had formed with monumental architecture and public religious sanctuaries. By 600 BC, a process of synoikismos, or unification, had been completed, resulting in a unified Rome characterized by a central forum area, public monumental architecture, and by this point, civic structures. Now, that's all good and well, but what about the ancient founding myths? Let's have a little bit about them. Hmm? By the late Roman Republic, the commonly accepted origin myth stated that their city was founded by a Latin named Romulus on the day of the Parilia festival, which is around 21st of April from memory, around 750 BC. So once more, the key elements of the myth included Romulus's murder of his twin Remus, with their lineage tracking back to the god Mars, the god of war, and the royal family of Alba Longa. The supposed descent of this dynasty from Aeneas, himself purportedly descended from the goddess Aphrodite and the royal family of Troy. Livy's History of Rome and Virgil's Aeneid were particularly influential in shaping this narrative. Some accounts even suggested the existence of a Mycenaean Greek settlement on the Palatine earlier than Romulus and Remus's arrival, dating all the way back to the 12th century BC. However, modern scholars apt at ruining everybody's fun, largely regard these traditional accounts as myths, lacking persuasive archaeological evidence for the Romulan foundation or the early Greek settlement. The name Romulus itself is believed to have been retrojected from the city's name rather than reflecting a historical figure. Kind of like saying, the chicken came before the egg. While some scholars, such as Andrea Carandini, suggest that these foundational myths may reflect underlying historical events, this viewpoint remains somewhat controversial and a minority perspective in current scholarships. Well, despite their mythical nature, the Romans' origin myths reveal how they perceive themselves as a blend of different ethnic groups and foreign influences, reflecting the multicultural reality of Latium these myths also served as a means of societal control, with the patricians using their supposed descent from Alba Longa nobility and legendary figures to justify their dominance 
of Roman institutions. The Romans attached great importance to the foundation of their cities, undertaking numerous rituals and attributing them to remote antiquity. They even maintained the hut of Romulus, a primitive dwelling on the Palatine associated with their founder. Although there was no solid evidence linking it to Romulus himself. The ancient historians had conflicting views on the date of Rome's foundations, with some placing it around 1100 BC, remarkably close to the fall of Troy, while others connected it to the establishment of the Roman Republic and counted back from there. These estimates were based on various calculations, including the number of consuls and the length of the regal period. However, modern scholars generally reject these synthetic calculations. From Claudius's secular games in AD 47, to Hadrian's Romea in AD 121, the official date of Rome's founding was commonly accepted as 753 BC, following the chronology established by Varro in the late 1st century. Augustus Fausti and the Secular Games celebrated Rome's 900th and 1000th anniversaries under late emperors, also used dates computed from a foundation a year later in 752. Despite some errors in Varro's work, this date is still the most widely used, so let's not waste time arguing about it. By the late Republic, the founding of Rome had become closely associated with the Parelian Festival, celebrated annually on April 21st. Originally a festival for the purification of shepherds and their flocks, it became intertwined with Rome's foundation myth, especially with the legend of Romulus and Remus, who were raised by shepherds. This association led to the restructuring of the festival as the urban Romea in 121. Now, the most famous version of the legend, Romulus and Remus are the grandsons of Numitor, the king of Alba Longa. After Numitor is overthrown by his brother Amulius, and his daughter Rhea Silva is forced to become a Vestal Virgin, she becomes pregnant, allegedly by the god Mars, and gives birth to twins. Well, Amulius isn't very happy with this. He orders the infants to be left to die on the slopes of the Palpatine, or simply thrown into the Tiber River. But they are saved when they are suckled by a she-wolf at the Labrigal and then discovered by the shepherd Faustulus, who takes them in along with his wife, Aka Larentia. Now, some interpretations suggest that Larentia may have been a lady of the night, hence the association with she-wolf. Apparently, the old Latin words for wolf and Lady of the Night were the same, 
kind of like a slang term. Faustulus eventually reveals the twins' true identities, and they dispose or kill Amulius, restoring Numitor to his throne. They then establish a new city at the site where they were rescued. However, conflict arises between the brothers during the foundation of the city, and it culminates in the death of Remus. The cause of the conflict varies in different accounts, ranging from disputes over the city's name, the interpretation of omens, or the exact location of the city's boundaries. Some versions of the tale even suggest that Romulus dealt with Remus by his own hand, while others describe a general melee that resulted in the somewhat accidental death of Remus. Either way, the city is not called Reem. Now Romulus, after ritually ploughing the future boundary of the city, erects his first wall and declares it an asylum for exiles, criminals, and runaway slaves. Sounds like how my country was founded. The population of the city grows, but it remains predominantly male. That is, of course, a problem. When Romulus fails to secure wives for the men through diplomacy, he orchestrates the abduction of women on the neighboring Sabine tribes during the religious celebration of Consualia. Well, this act, no doubt, did not impress the Sabines, but ultimately peace is established through the intervention of the abducted women who urge their husbands to reconcile with Romulus. Titus Tartius, a Sabine king, is then reinstalled as a co-ruler alongside Romulus. Now, what do modern scholars think of all of this? It tiptoes between history and mythology, as so often the ancient world does. Well, the story of Romulus and Remus has been interpreted by modern scholars in various ways. Some suggest that it reflects anti-Roman propaganda from the late 4th century BC, while others argue that it likely originated from indigenous Roman traditions. Regardless of its origins, by the 3rd century BC, the legend was widely accepted by Romans, and was even depicted on some of Rome's earliest silver coins. This mythological tale has been seen as embodying universal human themes, such as virgin birth, intercession by animals, humble origins, the triumph over evil, all of which are found in myths across different cultures worldwide. The indigenous tradition of Romulus was intertwined with the legend of Aeneas, who was believed to have journeyed from Troy to Italy. This connection originates from a prophecy in the Iliad, suggesting that Aeneas' descendants would eventually reclaim and rule Troy. By the 6th century BC, 
Greeks began speculating about Aeneas's legacy outside of the Greek world, leading to the first attempts to link him with Rome by historians, such as Hellenicus of Lesbos and Damastes of Sigeum. However, a more concrete connection between Aeneas and Rome emerged in the late 4th century BC, when Rome began formal interactions with the Greek world. According to Livy's account, in his first book, Aeneas, a demigod of the son of the Trojan prince Anchises, and the goddess Venus, flees Troy after its fall during the Trojan War. He sails to the western Mediterranean with his son Ascanius and his companions, where he allies with a local leader named Latinus and marries his daughter Lavinia. Thus, founding the city of Lavinium. Subsequent conflicts led to the establishment of the Alba Longa by Ascanius, Aeneas's son. The royal lineage of Alba Longa eventually produces Romulus and Remus, linking the events of their mythical story to Aeneas. Dionysus of Halicarnassus also presents a similar narrative, suggesting that migrations from Greece into Italy occurred in the 18th century BC, with settlers founding cities, Rome being among them. This trend of rationalizing Greek myths into pseudo-historical traditions was part of a broader Hellenization process across Italy, driven by Greek historians' efforts to portray Italians as descendants of Greeks and their heroes. Archaeological evidence supports the existence of cults dedicated to Aeneas and Hercules in Lavinium and Rome respectively. They were there by the 6th century BC, and seemed quite prominent. These stories became entrenched in Roman historical beliefs by the time, despite being speculative and of little historical value. The syncretism of these myths reflects Roman aspirations to establish a prestigious ancestry, which served both to claim a current heritage with the Greeks and to assert ancestral enmity, thus enhancing Rome's political status. During the Pyrrhic War, the Greek world was awash with approximately 60 different myths surrounding the foundation of Rome. Interestingly, many of these myths attributed the city's founding to an eponymous figure named Romos, or Rome, rather than the more familiar Romulus. One intriguing tale suggested that Rome was established by Romos, the son of Odysseus and Circe, from Greek mythology. This narrative might have become uncomfortable for the Romans as their power grew and tensions with the Greeks escalated. As identifying as descendants of the Greeks became less desirable, the Romans embraced the Trojan foundation myth instead. However, the name Romos 
was not entirely forgotten, and it's speculated that some Romans changed it to the native Romulus, while others just retained the original name, resulting in both of the names being used to represent the city's founders. Another variation of the myth, attributed to Hellenicus of Lesbos, claimed that Rome was founded by a woman named Rome, one of the followers of Aeneas. According to this account, after landing in Italy, Rome and her companions burned their ships, symbolizing their commitment to establishing a new home. These myths also differed in their depiction of Roma, the eponymous matriarch, with some versions suggesting she was born in Troy, and others suggesting she was born in Italy, either before or after the great journey of Aeneas. By the early 3rd century BC, myths surrounding Rome's foundation varied widely in their genealogies of Romulus or the city's founder. Some tales suggested that Romulus, the son of Zeus, was the city's founder, while others proposed intricate family trees connecting Romulus to Aeneas and other legendary figures. Additionally, authors from different regions wrote their own territories in the story, with Polybius from Arcadia proposing an Arcadian origin for Rome, rather than a Trojan one. These diverse narratives reflect that rich tapestry of cultural influences and regional pride that shaped the ancient Roman identity. So what do you think? Do you think that it was just a gradual immigration? People coming from different parts of Italy and perhaps Greece, perhaps other parts down from Gaul, all meeting around those hills, eventually forming what is known as Rome, or was it Romulus? Perhaps, as we just mentioned, it was the woman who founded Rome. Is there any way to know for sure? I don't know. But what I do know is that if you enjoyed this video, you should like and subscribe. And more important than that, have a good night. I'll see you next time everybody. Goodbye. In the vibrant tapestry of the ancient Mediterranean, the culture of Rome stands as a testament to human ambition, from its majestic architecture to its rich literary tradition, Rome's influence permeated every aspect of life in the ancient world. Join me and together we may delve into the complexities of ancient Roman culture, exploring its triumphs, tribulations, and enduring legacy. The Culture 
of ancient Rome encompassed nearly 1200 years of history, from the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire, spanning a vast territory from lowland Scotland and Morocco even to the Euphrates River. Life in ancient Rome centered around the city itself, with its iconic seven hills and monumental architecture, including structures like the Colosseum, Trajan's Forum, and the Pantheon. The city boasted theaters, gymnasia, taverns, baths, and for those so inclined, houses of ill repute, providing diverse amenities for its numerous inhabitants. Residential architecture ranged from modern houses to opulent country villas, with imperial residences gracing the elegant Palatine Hill. Most of the population lived in insulae, densely packed apartment blocks in the city center. At one point, Rome was the largest city in the world, likely hosting a population exceeding one million people at its peak. Urbanization was widespread throughout the Roman Empire, with numerous urban centers and military settlements dotting the landscape. In particular, Italy was urbanized with a rate comparable to England in 1800. Talk about being ahead of the curve. Urban centers, of course, required a steady supply of food, necessitating complex logistical efforts to acquire, transport, store, and distribute provisions. Provisions such as vegetables, fruits, fish, and meat, which were often imported from various regions. One example of this, later on, uh, around the time of Julius Caesar, was the amount of grain that was being imported from the province of Egypt. Rome had taken over this province uh, right around the time of 30 BC, I believe, from memory. So commerce, in general, was flourishing within the empire, facilitated by efficient roads and safe transportation networks. Do remember that the Roman world was all using Roman currency. That made trade and travel a lot easier. Aqueducts provided water to urban centers, while luxury goods like wine and oil were imported from regions like Hispania, Gaul, and Africa. Well, in other places in the world at the time, the luxury good was clean water. So Rome was quite ahead of its time. Rural areas, however, faced the same challenges that any rural area does, such as poverty and overcrowding, with the plight of rural slaves often worse to their urban counterparts. Cultural influences were, of course, diverse, with Greek culture gaining prominence from the 2nd century BC onward. 
Greek household slaves played key roles in educating Roman youth, while Greek art and aesthetics influenced Roman sculpture and architecture. The Roman Empire reached its zenith under Emperor Augustus in the first century AD, becoming the most extensive political and social structure in Western civilization. However, by the third century AD, its vast size necessitated division into Western and Eastern Roman Empires. The Eastern Roman Empire, or Byzantium, also known as the Byzantine Empire, persisted until the fall of Constantinople, which is now called Istanbul, you may have heard of it, in 1453, leaving a profound and lasting impact on Western civilization through its contributions to art, law, language, architecture, and governance. Well, that's the introduction out of the way. So, if we're going to talk about daily life in Rome, we best understand the social structure. So let's begin there. The early social structure of Rome was centered around the family, headed by the pater familias, who held absolute power over his household, including his wife, children, slaves, and property. But I suppose, if he has absolute power, they all count as property, don't they? Now, I did say that word, slave, and you may have thought, well, they had slaves in the Roman Empire? Well, you bet they did. In fact, slavery was integral to Roman society, with slaves being mostly prisoners of war who were brought and sold in markets. Despite some legal protections, slaves often faced cruelty and exploitation. Well, Generally, being a slave is not the most enjoyable job occupation. But every now and then, the slaves decided to get their own back. Another video about that coming very soon. Now, the plebeians, who lacked legal status, could enter into a clientela relationship with a patrician, granting them limited legal capacity under the patronage of a noble family. The authority of the pater familias extended to both civil and criminal matters, with kings overseeing military affairs and foreign policy while also adjudicating disputes between gentes for familias. During the Roman Republic, citizens, including both patricians and plebeians, were allowed to vote in two assemblies, the Comitia Centuriata and the Comitia Populi Tributa. The former was based on age wealth and residence, while the latter comprised 35 tribes from Rome and the countryside. These assemblies elected various magistrates, such as praetors, censors, consuls, and caestors. 
Roman law and social views evolved over time, gradually emancipating family members and improving justice. Now, life in ancient Roman cities revolved around the Forum. Indeed, we still use this word in our modern day when we describe a place for people to meet. Think about the internet term of a forum where people can post their opinions and, of course, have them critiqued by others. Well, it was the same in ancient Rome. People would go to the forum to engage in commerce, public speaking, and general socializing. Well, apart from that, their daily routines attended going to school, going to public baths, and enjoying the various forms of entertainment that Rome had to offer, such as the famous gladiatorial combat at the Colosseum and chariot racing at the Circus Maximus. Of course, uh, at different times in Rome's history, you had different kinds of entertainment, and depending on what emperor was ruling over you, you may get a good deal on the tickets. Or the gladiatorial combat would be cancelled completely. Personally, I would have liked to have been around when Emperor Commodus himself was participating in the gladiatorial games, albeit they were very much skewed to his favour. In the countryside, however, life was slower paced, but still quite lively, with local festivals and social events. They didn't have the coliseums and amphitheatres that the big cities had, but they may do with what they did have, just like country people do in our modern day. Estate owners often retreated to their rural properties for rest and recreation, while slaves toiled continuously to maintain their master's wealth. Unfortunately, the slaves very rarely received any time off from their countless jobs. Farm owners engaged in economic and social activities at village markets, ending their day with a meal prepared from their midday leftovers. Well, that's right, it was lunch and dinner for the Romans. Now, what about the clothing that the Romans wore? Well, they weren't all wearing the stereotypical togas, weren't they? Well, in ancient Rome, clothing, of course, played a significant role in distinguishing social classes and conveying status. The type of garment worn, its material, color, and adornments all indicated the wearer's position in society. Plebeians typically wore coarse and dark tunics made from inexpensive materials, such as wool, while patricians donned tunics made from finer fabrics, like linen or treated white wool, which was, of course, much more expensive. Magistrates and senators wore tunics with distinguishing features, such as purple stripes for senators. And purple, by the way, was the most expensive color. I believe that in those days they were extracting it from the blood of shellfish, 
Uh, it was quite expensive to make. Now, military tunics. They were a little bit different. Of course, you needed to be able to move quite fast when you were a soldier. Had to be form of a function for the upper classes, but function over form for those who had to spring into action. So, of course, the military tunics were shorter than the civilian counterparts. And, of course, we cannot mention Roman clothing without talking about togas, which were also important garments with different types denoting various stages of life and achievements. Young boys wore the toga praetexta until they reached adulthood, while the toga virilis symbolized Roman citizenship for men. The toga picta was reserved for triumphant generals, adorned with embroidery representing their battlefield exploits, while the toga pulla was worn during mourning. Footwear also reflected social status, with different colors and styles worn by different classes. For example, Patricians would often wear red or orange sandals. Senators had brown footwear, and soldiers donned heavy boots. Women's clothing in particular included the stola, a brightly colored dress that was worn underneath a tunic, over a tunic, rather often fastened with a fibula or a brooch. A pala was a kind of shawl, commonly worn with the stola for additional warmth or just for decorations. Of course we had jewellery as well. You had to accessorize if you wanted to look very upper class. Various accessories, such as the bulla worn by children, or the lunula, symbolizing a woman's transition to adulthood, further complemented Roman attire, and carried symbolic significance within society. Now, like with any city, you have to have restaurants, don't you? You have to have a vibrant food culture. Of course, the Romans themselves had developed their own dietary habits. Well, of course, what they were eating was always going to be a reflection of the changes in social structures and economic conditions. From the early days of the Republic, around 200 BC, that is, Romans generally adhered to pretty simple food habits. Meals were divided into breakfast, ientaculum, lunch, prandium, and dinner, senna. Breakfast consisted of pretty basic sort of fare, like bread, a bit of salad, olives, cheese, fruits and cold meats that might have been left over from the previous night. Lunch was often considering a uh, consisting rather of mostly the same things, and we know this from a lot of the uh, remains that we found in Roman houses, the uh, DNA that we've conducted on a lot of Roman remains as well. As with our modern day, family members typically all sat down to eat together. The remains that we found in Roman houses often find stools around a table, which means that, yes, we were a 
having the family dinners back in the old days. However, as Roman society evolved, separate dining rooms called triclinia were designed, furnished with dining couches. Food was usually prepared beforehand and bought to the diners, who would use their fingers to eat. Now they did have spoons, and we have found a great many of them, but they were just employed for soups and things where you couldn't really use your hands to eat. The majority of the time there was no knives, no forks, you would simply just pick the food up with your hand and do it the old-fashioned way. Or we can say Indian style, as many modern Indians still choose to adhere to this practice in traditional areas. Now the big change in Roman food culture, of course, was wine which became a staple drink in Rome around 250 BC. But it was generally mixed with water and consumed in moderation, most of the time, at least. And it wasn't exactly like the wine that we have today. Even during drinking events, which were called commissatio, an arbiter vivendi was appointed to determine the ratio of wine to water. Kind of like a bartender in the ancient times. The wine to water ratio of 1 to 2, 1 to 3, and even 1 to 4 were common measurements. But of course, you didn't want to water it down too much. Various drinks made from grapes and honey were also popular, such as mulsum, which was a honeyed wine, a grape juice called mustum was also popular, along with mulsa, which was just water with honey mixed into it. Of course, before the world had sugar, at least the sugar that we know it, we were generally using honey to sweeten our food. Wine consumption varied by gender and social class, with estimates ranging from 0 0.8 to 1.1 gallons per day for males, and about half a gallon per day for females. And I've met females who can drink much more than that, believe me. Drinking non-watered wine, especially on an empty stomach, was frowned upon and considered a sign of alcoholism. Accusations of alcoholism were used as a means to discredit political rivals, and were taken very seriously in Roman society. Now particularly if you were of the philosophical ilk, if somebody would accuse you of being an alcoholic, well, they were saying that you were one who struggled in engaging in moderation. And of course, if somebody cannot engage in moderation with alcohol, it is perhaps perceived that they may fail to engage in moderation in other activities. And then, of course, lead one to exercise poor judgment. During the imperial period, the staple foods of the lower class Romans also known as the plebeians, included vegetable porridge, bread, fish, fruits, meat, and olives. Subsidized or free food distributions 
were sometimes provided in cities. In contrast, the aristocratic patricians enjoyed elaborate dinners with a variety of delicacies, wines, and entertainment to suit all tastes. Women and children often ate separately. Although societal norms became more permissive over time, allowing decent women to attend dinner parties with men. Now, what about schooling? Did Rome have schools? Well, of course they did. You couldn't conquer the known world without an education, couldn't you? Formal schooling began in Rome around 200 BC, marking a significant development in educational standards. Children typically started their education around the age of six, with a curriculum focused on foundational skills such as reading, writing, and arithmetic. Over the course of the next six to seven years, they would gradually advance to more complex subjects. By the age of twelve, students would also begin studying Latin, Greek, grammar, and the literary classics. Public speaking and oratory were also emphasized, as being an effective speaker was highly valued in Roman society. Oratory was considered an art form that required practice and skill, and proficient orators always commanded respect and influence. Well, just like with our modern day, if you can talk the talk, you can pretty much get yourself in or out of anything. While education was available to both boys and girls, from affluent families that is, it was predominantly geared towards the boys. Wealthy girls might receive private tutoring at home, but opportunities for a formal schooling were quite limited, and it was often quite strange to send your daughter to a formal school. However, there were instances where girls were allowed to attend school, albeit less frequently than boys. As with our modern day, and many modern countries, access to education was often determined by one's economic and social status. And of course, poor families could not afford the costs associated with schooling. In some cases, a gifted slave could be utilized to provide education to children from less affluent backgrounds. Now think of this. Slaves were generally cheap, at least cheaper than the education. If you had a slave who had come from, let's say, Gaul, perhaps you would say to your son, well, you are going to be learning the Gallic language from our slave. And that slave would have it added to his duties, that he would make you proficient in this language. Now, by the time you grow up, at least you have some kind of skill. At least you can turn around and say, well, Perhaps if you need an administrator in Gaul, or 
somebody to help out. Well, maybe you can put me on the wage. You never know who you will meet. Well, despite all of these limitations, education still played a crucial role in shaping the intellectual and social development of Roman youth, preparing them for the responsibilities and opportunities of adulthood. Latin, the native language of the Romans, played a crucial role in shaping the linguistic landscape of Europe and also beyond. Indeed, we still use many Latin phrases in our uh, modern language. For example, we use etc. We use ad hoc. Sometimes we may say compus mentis of sound mind and non compus mentis, not of sound mind, which to this day is used as a legal defense. If you want to plead insanity, you could say I was non compus mentis. Now, most surviving Latin literature consists of classical Latin, which was the language of literature, philosophy, and administration during the height of the Roman Empire. Following the decline of the Western Roman Empire, Latin evolved into various Romance languages, including French, Italian, Portuguese, Romanian, and Spanish. Romance languages, you say? Well, it's not the romance of the roses and red wine on the moonlit night. It is just the Roman's language. I'm not quite sure how it turned into the term romance, but here we are. These languages that I've just listed gradually diverged from the vulgar Latin, forming distinct linguistic identities while retaining elements of their Latin roots. English, our language, although of Germanic origin, has indeed borrowed heavily from Latin and Latin-derived words. The Norman conquest of England in 1066 also brought Anglo-Norman French, a Romance language derived from Latin which significantly changed and influenced the English language, particularly among the upper classes. Additionally, the revival of interest in classical culture during the Renaissance led to the adaptation of many Latin words into English. Latin remains in use today in various ways. Another way, apart from the aforementioned, is ecclesiastical Latin, the traditional language of the Roman Catholic Church, continues to be used in religious ceremonies and texts. A deep understanding of classical Latin was once a standard part of the educational curriculum in many Western countries, and indeed is still taught in some schools today, albeit to a lesser extent than in the past. Despite being supplanted by other languages as a lingua franca, Latin's enduring influence continues to be felt in various aspects of our modern society. But what about sports? 
They must have had sports, too. How would people in ancient Rome keep fit and enjoy themselves? Well, of course they had sports, and plenty of them. As a matter of fact, we do remember that the Romans took after the Greeks, who gave us the Olympics, so they must have the same pastimes, albeit somewhat changed to fit Roman sensibilities. The campus in ancient Rome served as a multifunctional space, where various physical activities and sports were practiced. It began as a drill ground for Roman soldiers, and later transformed into a recreational area that all the citizens of Rome were welcome to. Here, young people gathered to engage in sports such as wrestling, horse riding, boxing, and even swimming. They even had ball games, like field hockey, handball, simply just throwing the ball back and forth to each other, and even early forms of football, all quite popular among the Romans of the day. But it wasn't just outside, in the sun. Some people preferred a more gentle approach. Board games were there to provide indoor entertainment for those with different sensibilities. With dice games like tessere or tali, Roman chess, which was called la trunculi. They also had Roman checkers, which was called calculi. Tic-tac-toe as well, or in my country as we call it, noughts and crosses. It was referred to in ancient Rome as terni lapili. And of course, ludus duodecum scriptorum and tabula, which were predecessors of backgammon. All of these were commonly played. One can only imagine that they would be done among friends or family affairs before and after dinner, with the mother urging them, please put away the calculi or the latrunculi, it's time for us to have dinner. Now, the Roman populace also enjoyed grander spectacles, massive events where everybody would show up, and they were a little bit more gruesome, albeit a little bit more exciting than a game of Roman latrunculi. Well, they enjoyed spectacles such as chariot racing, musical and theatre performances, gladiatorial combat, and the occasional public execution, which was indeed quite popular. Now if we want to talk about the gruesome parts of Rome's sporting past, we of course must mention the Colosseum, Rome's iconic amphitheatre. It wasn't just a small place. It could accommodate up to 60,000 spectators and hosted a variety of events. One of the more interesting parts was when they flooded the entire arena to do a mock naval battle. They brought boats in and everything. From memory, I believe it was the Battle of Salamis between the Persians and the Greeks, although I may be wrong, and I probably am. But if they did not do the Battle of Salamis, it is certainly a missed opportunity. Apart from these organized activities, Romans frequented bars, bathhouses, 
and uh, just engaged in leisure and socialising with one another. Graffiti on the walls of many of these more simple establishments provides an insight into the daily lives of the ancients, showcasing the multicultural nature of Roman society. Overall, ancient Rome offered a diverse range of recreational activities and entertainment options to its inhabitants. Certainly a worthy menu of different entertainment options for a place deemed as the greatest city, the eternal city. It must have been difficult to be bored. Well, that is it for our Lives of the Ancient Romans video. I hope you've enjoyed it, learned something, and gained a little bit more of an insight into what an average day would have been like for an ancient Roman. If you've enjoyed the content, like and subscribe, and leave your comments down below. It's been a pleasure to be with you. And, until next time, good night everybody. In the grand amphitheatres of ancient Rome, a spectacle unfolded that would echo through the ages. Gladiatorial combat. These warriors, bound for a life of clenched fists, faced fierce beasts and each other in epic battles for the entertainment of the cheering masses. Join me as we step into the arena where the clash of swords and the roar of the public created a symphony both tragic and glorious. Gladiators Derived from the Latin word gladiator, meaning swordsman, were armed combatants who entertained audiences in the Roman Republic and Empire. They engaged in violent clashes with other gladiators, wild animals, and condemned criminals, creating a spectacle for the onlookers. While some gladiators volunteered, risking their lives for social standing, the majority of these people were despised slaves, subject to harsh training, social marginalization, and even segregation in death. Regardless of their origin, Gladiators embodied Rome's martial ethics, offering spectators examples of valor and skill. Their ability to fight or die with dignity could earn them admiration and popularity. Therefore, they were celebrated in both high and low art and their role as entertainers was commemorated in various objects throughout the Roman world. The origins of gladiatorial combat are debated, 
with evidence dating back to funeral rites during the Punic Wars in the 3rd century BC. This practice quickly became integral to Roman politics and social life, evolving into increasingly elaborate and costly games. These gladiator games endured for nearly a millennia, and reached their zenith between the 1st and 2nd century AD. As Christianity emerged, the disapproval of the games grew due to their association with pagan rituals, not due to their association of cruel and harsh death, though. That was okay. Eventually, in the 5th century, the popularity of the contests waned, leading to their eventual disappearance. So, let's go all the way back and try to first trace the origins of these gladiatorial games. How did they come about? Well, the origin of gladiators remained debated among early literary sources. In the late 1st century BC, Nicolaus of Damascus suggested an Etruscan origin. Etruscan means Italian but not Roman. While Livy, a generation later, attributed their inception to the Campanians in 310 BC, after their victory over the Samnites. Later, in the 7th century AD, Isidore of Seville connected gladio terms to Etruscan roots. Despite this, modern scholars reassessing pictorial evidence propose a companion origin or influence on the games. Campania, hosting the earliest gladiator schools, is depicted in tomb frescoes from the Paestum, around 4th century BC, showing paired fighters in rituals resembling Roman gladiator games. While evidence on the Etruscan side is less conclusive, the Paestum frescoes may represent an older tradition influenced by Greek colonists. Livy credits the first gladiator games, 264 BC, to Decimus Junius Brutus Scaeva, who staged a munus, a commemorative duty, in Rome's Forum Boarium to honour his deceased father. The development of gladiator munera and types heavily influenced by Rome's conflicts with Samnian, is evident in Livy's account. The Samnite, a frequently mentioned and popular gladiator type, emerged from this very war. The captured, splendid armour of Samnite armies was used in Roman triumphs, while Campanians in disdain of the Samnites, equipped their gladiators in a similar fashion, coining the term Samnites for them. Livy's narrative reflects the latter theatrical nature of the gladiator shows, portraying armed barbarians as treacherous and degenerate, conquered by Roman iron and courage. The gladiator Munus evolved into a morally instructive enactment, emphasizing the gladiator's honorable choices in combat. And of course, 
the Romans always win. In 216 BC, Marcus Aemilius Lepidus received a three-day gladiator Minera in the Forum Romanum, featuring twenty-two pairs of gladiators. Scipio Africanus, ten years later, organized a commemorative munus in Iberia for his father and uncle, attracting high-status non-Romans as volunteers. These events were linked to the overall context of the Punic Wars, celebrating military victories and expiating disasters, serving as a morale-boosting purpose. The next recorded Munis in 183 BC for Publius Licinius surpassed previous extravagance, lasting three days with 120 gladiators. Also, they had free meals for everybody, which certainly helps to draw the crowds. The popularity of Gladiatoria Minera extended far beyond Rome, evident in Rome's Iberian allies adopting the culture of gladiator games themselves. By 184 BC, smaller Roman Minera became so commonplace that they went unremarked, with larger events like Titus Flaminius's four-day games with 74 gladiators in 174 BC being slightly more notable. In 105 BC, Rome experienced state-sponsored barbarian combat, with gladiators from Capua offered by the ruling consuls as part of military training. This marked a shift as gladiator contests transitioned from private Minera to inclusion in state games during major religious festivals. While traditional ludi were dedicated to deities, ludi is how we refer to as state games, Munera could be dedicated to the divine or heroic ancestors of aristocratic sponsors. Gladiatorial games in Rome served as a powerful tool for self-promotion, particularly among politicians. Sponsors found these events, which combined extravagance with entertainment, also as effective ways to gain popularity without significant personal cost. And so, the gladiatorial contests became a significant business, benefiting trainers, owners, and even political figures. Ambitious individuals strategically timed gladiator shows to coincide with election seasons, and use the lavish spectacles to secure votes. The old bread and circus strategy. In the late Republic, gladiator ownership equated to political influence in 65 BC, Julius Caesar organized an unprecedented spectacle with 320 gladiatorial pairs, despite heavy opposition from the Senate. The spread of gladiatorial games throughout the Republic prompted anti-corruption laws that attempted but failed to curb their political exploitation. After the assassination of Caesar, 
Augustus assumed control over the games, regulating their provision as a civic and religious duty. Imperial authority limited private and public expenditure on Monera, linking the greatest games with the state-sponsored imperial cult. Despite attempts to control all of the costs, the extravagance of gladiator games continued to persist. All the way up to 109 AD, Trajan celebrated his Dacian victories with 10,000 gladiators and 11,000 animals, holding these events over the course of 123 days. Legislation by Marcus Aurelius in 177 AD later on had very little impact in stemming these contests, and his son, Commodus, who I have also made a video about, continued the trend of escalating expenses associated with gladiatorial events. He even went into gladiatorial events himself, our boy Commodus, but that is a story for the Commodus video, which you can find in my Ancient Rome playlist. The decline of gladiatorial contests was a complex process. The crisis of the third century placed a growing financial burden on the Roman Empire due to military demands, and lesser magistrates found providing various obligatory contests increasingly unrewarding in exchange for uncertain privileges. Despite this, emperors continued to subsidize the games due to sustained public interest, and in the early 3rd century AD, the Christian writer Tertullian condemned Christians attending gladiatorial games considering the combats as murder and the witnessing spiritually and morally harmful, viewing the gladiator as an instrument of pagan human sacrifice. Hmm. Now, one historian, Carolyn Osiak, has some comments on the violence itself, which I'll fill you in on. And I quote, The reason we would suppose, would be the primarily bloodthirsty violence. But his is different. The extent of religious ritual and meaning in them which constitutes idolatry. Although Tertullian states that these events are forbidden to believers, the fact that he writes a whole treatise to convince Christians that they should not attend the shows, that apparently not everyone agreed to stay away from them. In the subsequent century, Augustine of Hippo criticized the youthful fascination of his friend Olypius of Thagaste, who later became a fellow convert and bishop with the Monera spectacle, considering it detrimental to Christian life and salvation. Amphitheaters continued to be venues for the dramatic administration of imperial justice. For example, in 315, Constantine the Great condemned child snatchers to be thrown to wild beasts in the arena. Fair enough, I say. Good job, Constantine. A decade later, he prohibited criminals from being compelled to fight to death as gladiators, stating, 
bloody spectacles do not please us in civil ease and domestic quiet. For that reason, we forbid those people to be gladiators who, by some reason of some criminal act, were accustomed to deserve this condition and sentence. You shall rather sentence them to serve in the mines, so that they may acknowledge the penalties of their crimes with blood. This action has been construed with a prohibition on gladiatorial combat. However, in the final year of his life, Constantine wrote a letter to the citizens of Hispellum, granting them the right to celebrate his rule with gladiatorial games. In 365, Valentinian threatened to impose fines on a judge who sentenced Christians to the arena, and in 384, like most of his predecessors, attempted to restrict the expenses of gladiatorial games. You see, they were just way too expensive. Always had been, and the emperors in later times were dealing with other issues, especially around the time of Valentinian. Well, the empire wasn't as prosperous as it used to be. In 393, Theodosius I embraced Nicene Christianity as the state religion. And you know what that means. It means that all pagan festivals were cancelled. Sorry to break it to you, kid, but the party's over. The Ludi, however, persisted, gradually shedding their pagan elements little by little. Honorius officially ended the gladiator games completely in 399, and then again in 404, when he found out people were doing it behind his back in the Western Roman Empire. Remember, at that time, the Roman Empire had already split in half, by the way. So, the reason why he did this was because of the martyrdom of St. Telemachus by spectators. And that's a whole other story on its own. But it was a scandal at the time, certainly. So by this time, the gladiatorial contest had more or less faded in popularity. The Romans had changed. It was a different world. And this relic of the old world pagan past had to go Well, let's talk less about the games, and more about the people, the gladiators themselves. Do you want to learn about them? I'm sure you do. Well, let's learn more about how they were divided and what they did. The earliest gladiator types, as we had said before, were named after Rome's enemies. Now, along with the Samnites, you also had the Thracians and the Gauls. Now, as Rome conquered these places, the Samnite became Secutor, and the Gaul became Mermilo, the most popular type. Especially after Julius Caesar's uh, conquest of Gaul and his triumph. Fighting Gauls became uh, quite a popular pastime of the Romans. In mid-Republican Minera, similar types typically fought. Later, fantasy types were introduced, set against complementary counterparts. For example, the nimble Retiarius faced the heavily armoured Secutor. 
depictions usually show common types, but literary references allow a tentative reconstruction of others. Even novelty fighters included those on chariots, mounted gladiators, and even fighters with boxing gloves, called cestus fighters, and they were likely from Greece. The gladiator trade spanned the empire and was under official supervision. It wasn't just a touch-and-go thing, it was properly organized. Rome's military successes provided soldier prisoners, redistributed for state mines, amphitheaters, and open market sales. After the Jewish revolt, Jewish prisoners, rejected for training, entered arenas as other jobs. The strongest were sent to Rome, where surrendered enemy soldiers could redeem honor through gladiator training. So you imagine, you go out to Gaul, and you pick out the biggest, tallest guy with the scruffiest moustache you can find, and you say to your soldiers, do not kill that guy, just capture him, because he is going to be awesome at fighting lions. During the Principate and the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, two additional gladiator sources emerged. First, the condemned slaves, damnati, or sent to gladiator schools, games, the ad ludum gladiatorium for crimes. So you would either get there, completely forced into it, or if you committed a crime, your punishment was to become a warrior in the Colosseum. Second, paid volunteers called octorati, constituting about half, and possibly the more skilled half, were around by the late Republic. Now as for the poor and non-citizens, meaning non-Roman citizens, joining a gladiator school offered a trade meals, housing, and even a chance for fame. Mark Antony even chose gladiators as his personal bodyguard. And here's something else. Gladiators retained prize money and gifts, with examples like Tiberius enticing retired gladiators back and Nero granting spiculous property equal to triumph celebrators. Starting in the 60s AD, female gladiators emerged as rare and exotic markers of exceptionally lavish spectacle. Nero in 66 AD arranged a munis featuring Ethiopian women men, and children, to impress King Tiridates of Armenia. Now, Romans found the concept of a female gladiator, even novel and entertaining, or just outright absurd. Juvenal and Petronius offered satirical portrayals of female gladiators, portraying them as hunting or fighting in unconventional ways. And some things never change, don't they? Immunus during Domitian's reign in 89 AD included a battle between female gladiators described as Amazons. A 2nd century AD relief from Halicarnassus depicted combatants named Amazon and Achillea. 
in the same century, an epigraph praised a member of Ostia's local elite as the first to arm women in the history of its games. Female gladiators likely underwent similar regulations and training as their male counterparts. Roman morality dictated that all gladiators be from the lowest of the social classes, and emperors who deviated from this norm faced quite a lot of criticism. Some viewed female gladiators, regardless of their type or class, as indicative of corrupted Roman appetites, morals, and concepts of womanhood. Septimus Severus, before becoming emperor, attempted to introduce dignified displays of female athletics in Rome. However, the crowd's negative reaction led him to ban female gladiators completely in 200 AD. And that's not fair. Come on, just let them fight. I'm sure it'll be okay. Now, in terms of the higher-ups of Roman society, we're talking all the way up to emperors, there were some that were involved in the arena performances, either publicly or privately. Now, some names that we can put across is Geta, Caracalla, Caligula, Commodus, Hadrian, Titus, many of them. However, they were involved with very minimal risks to themselves. They didn't put themselves in real harm's way. Claudius, described as morbidly cruel and boorish, engaged in a spectacle where he fought a whale trapped in the harbour. This did not make him very popular and earned him much disapproval from the commentators. Now, Commodus stood out as a fanatical participant. He compelled Rome's elite to attend his performances as a gladiator, and despite most of his gladiatorial performance being bloodless and fought with wooden swords, he consistently emerged victorious. Commodus claimed remarkable feats, such as restyling Nero's statue as Hercules Reborn, dedicated to himself, boasting of titles like Champion of Secutores. Well, his extravagant performances once included him killing 100 lions in a single day, likely from an elevated platform for safety of course, and decapitating a running ostrich with a specially designed dart, theatrically gesturing towards the senatorial seats afterwards. In return for these displays, he received a substantial stipend from the public purse. But enough about Commodus. Now the games were meticulously advertised in advance, with advertisements providing details such as the purpose of the event, the organiser, the venue, the date, and the number of paired gladiators, ordinariae, to participate. Additional attractions like executions, music, and amenities for spectators, such as sun awnings, water sprinklers, food, drinks, sweets, and occasionally door prizes, believe it or not, were also highlighted. Enthusiasts and gamblers received a detailed program, Libellus, 
on the day of the competition, containing names, types, and match records of gladiator pairs, along with their scheduled appearances. The night before the fight, gladiators enjoyed a banquet, a time to address personal matters. This event resembled a ritualistic or sacramental last meal, serving as both a family and public occasion. Notably, even the condemned, including those set to die the next day, and those aforementioned damnati with a slim chance of survival, likely participated in all of this. This pre-game gathering may have also served as a means to generate additional publicity for the upcoming event. Official Monera during the early Imperial Era adhered to a standard form known as Munus Legitimum. The proceedings typically commenced with a procession entering the arena led by lictors carrying faces symbolizing the magistrate editor's authority over life and death. Following them, trumpeteers played a fanfare and images of gods were brought in to witness the events. A scribe recorded the outcomes, usually, and a man carried a palm branch to honour the victors. The magistrate editor, accompanied by a retinue carrying the arms and honour to be used, entered, with the gladiators presumably coming in last. The entertainments often kicked off with venations, or beast hunts, and bestiari, beast fighters. Subsequently, the Ludi Meridiani took place, featuring variable content that usually included the execution of condemned criminals. Some were condemned to fatal reenactments based on Greek or Roman myths, possibly involving gladiators as executioners. However, the preference of both the audience and the gladiators was for even contests, eschewing the dignity of fatal performances. Comedy fights, some potentially lethal, were also part of the program. Lightly armed fighters, like the Retiarius, could endure longer in the arena compared to their heavily armed counterparts, and these were both brought out in even numbers. Sometimes the lightly armed opponents would face the heavily armed opponents, and each use their strengths and weaknesses of each other. Most bouts typically lasted between 10 to 15 minutes, with some stretching to a maximum of 20. In the Republican Minera, one could witness between 10 and 13 matches a day, assuming one match at a time during the afternoon. Spectators favoured highly skilled, even matched with complementary fighting styles, although they were more expensive to train and hire. Of course, your proper gladiators, who had it as a career, had to be paid. And those condemned slaves usually went down pretty easily, a little too easily for the crowd's liking. 
general melees involving several lower skilled gladiators were less costly, but they were less popular. Even among ordinarii, winners might face a new, well-rested opponent, either a prearranged third-choice gladiator called a tertiarius, or an unadvertised extra called a substitute gladiator at the magistrate editor's whim. The arrangement allowed for two combats for the cost of three gladiators instead of four, resulting in prolonged and sometimes bloodier contests, albeit of potentially lower quality. Experienced gladiators demonstrated a considerable degree of stagecraft, valuing bravado and skill more than they valued bloodshed. Some gladiators built their careers and reputation on bloodless victories. Trained gladiators adhered to professional rules of combat overseen by a senior referee and an assistant. Referees, who were often retired gladiators, held significant authority and could stop or pause bouts as needed, ensuring rest, refreshment, and a rub-down for the combatants. Now, believe it or not, during many of the gladiatorial contests, you had a band playing. That's right, musical accompaniment during the Ludi and Minera played a crucial role, serving as interludes or even building to a frenzied crescendo during the high points of the combats. The Zliten mosaic from Libya, which was done around 80 to 100 AD, depicts musicians accompanying provincial games with various instruments including the ancient forms of a long straight trumpet, a large curved horn called a cornu, and a water organ called a hydraulis. Similar scenes of musicians, gladiators, and bestiari are found in several Pompeian tomb reliefs. Now, how did a gladiator claim victory. Well, a gladiator claimed victory by overcoming or killing his opponent, earning the palm branch and an award from the editor. Exceptional fighters might receive additional recognition, such as a laurel crown and money from the crowd. However, the most significant reward for those initially condemned to Ludus was manumission, symbolized by the gift of a wooden training sword from the magistrate editor. In some cases, victorious gladiators could receive these gifts multiple times, as exemplified by Flammer's four awards although some would choose to remain a gladiator. Matches were concluded either by the defeat of one gladiator or the death of the other, but a defeated gladiator could signal surrender by raising a finger, prompting the referee to stop the combat and refer to the magistrate editor's decision. In the earliest Minera, death was often considered the penalty for defeat. However, during the imperial era, the practice of 
sparing defeated gladiators' lives became more common, especially in matches advertised as sin missione, or without reprieve for the defeated. Now do remember that this decision was up to the magistrate, and a gladiator who was denied the privilege of living faced dispatch by his opponent, and to die well he should neither ask for mercy or cry out. Seneca described a good death as one where the gladiator offered his throat to the opponent, directing the blade to the vital spot. Some mosaics depict defeated gladiators kneeling in preparation for the moment of their death, with Seneca's reference to the vital spot likely indicating the neck, as confirmed by gladiator remains from Ephesus. The body of a gladiator who died honorably was placed on a couch of Libertina and then removed to the arena morgue, where it would be stripped of armor and its throat probably cut as confirmation of death. Tertullian, a Christian author, described a more humiliating removal method during Ludi Meridiani in Roman Carthage. Arena officials, often dressed as Dispater, god of the underworld, and Mercury, used a mallet and a heated wand to strike and confirm the death of a gladiator respectively. The body was then unceremoniously dragged from the arena. The bodies of the Noxiae, and possibly some Damnati, were disposed of in rivers, or simply left unburied. Denial of funeral rites condemned the deceased to restless wandering upon the earth, as a larva or a lemur. Ordinary citizens were usually buried outside town or city limits, to avoid ritual and physical pollution, while professional gladiators had their own separate ceremonies. Well, thank you very much for joining me. I'm sure we learned a lot about gladiators tonight, didn't we? If you've enjoyed this content, consider subscribing to the channel and leaving your comments down below, I always respond to them, but until then, allow me to wish you a good night, I'll see you next time everybody. As you wander through the timeless streets of ancient Rome, imagine the whispers of power and intrigue that linger in the air. The cobbled roads beneath your feet bear witness to the grandeur of Emperor Hadrian's reign. As you close your eyes, let the ambience of the city transport you to an era where political secrets danced in the shadows. I am the ASMR historian. Come with me as we explore together the life of a man who once shaped the destiny of an empire.
Let us go back almost two thousand years and explore the life of Hadrian. Publius Aelius Hadrianus, known as Hadrian, was born on January 24th, AD 76, in Italica, modern-day Santiponche, near Seville, a Roman town founded during the Second Punic War. His family's origin was linked to Hadria, modern Atri, a town in Italia. His father, Publius Aelius Hadrianus Afer, was a senator of Praetorian rank from Italica, and his mother, Domitia Paulina, came from a distinguished Hispano-Roman senatorial family in Gades. Hadrian had an elder sister named Aelia Domitia Paulina. Hadrian's early life included a close relationship with his wet nurse, the slave Germana, who he freed, and she outlived him. His father's cousin, Trajan, a notable senator born in Italica, played a significant role in Hadrian's life. Hadrian's parents passed away in 86, when he was only ten years old, and he and his sister became wards of Trajan and Publius Achilius Atianus, who later became Trajan's Praetorian Prefect. Growing up physically active and enjoying hunting, Hadrian was called to Rome by Trajan at the age of fourteen for further education befitting of a young Roman aristocrat. Hadrian's strong interest in Greek literature and culture earned him the nickname Graeculus, Greekling. His early political career began with his service in various roles, such as a member of the Decembriri, Stibilius Judicantus, a military tribune with Legio II Adiotrix and Legio V Macedonica, and later with Legio XII Primigenia. His three tribunates provided him with a career advantage compared to many scions of older senatorial families. In 101, Hadrian returned to Rome and was elected quaestor, later serving as quaestor imperatoris Traiani, acting as a liaison officer between Emperor Trajan and the Senate. He played a crucial role in composing and delivering the Emperor's communiques and speeches. He succeeded Licinius Sura, Trajan's influential friend and advisor, in this capacity. Subsequently, he became ad actus senatus, which means the person responsible for keeping the Senate's records. During the First Dacian War, Hadrian joined Trajan's personal entourage, but returned to Rome to assume the office of tribune of the plebs in 105. After the war, he likely served as praetor. During the Second Dacian War, Hadrian served Trajan once again. He was released to become the legate of Legio I Minervia and the later governor of Lower Pannonia in 107, 
where his responsibilities included dealing with the Samartians. Between 107 and 108, Hadrian successfully defended Roman-controlled Banat and Oltenia against an invasion by the Lazyges, negotiating a peace treaty whose exact terms are unclear. The treaty may have involved concessions, including a one-time tribute payment and the transfer of Banat to the Lazyges. In his mid-thirties, Hadrian embarked on a journey to Greece, where he gained Athenian citizenship and served as the eponymous Archon of Athens in 112. The Athenians honoured him with a statue and inscription in the theatre of Dionysus, providing a detailed account of his cursus honor. After his time in Greece, Hadrian's activities became less documented until Trajan's Parthian campaign. It is suggested that he may have remained in Greece until he was recalled to join Trajan's expedition against Parthia as a legate. When the governor of Syria was dispatched to address issues in Dacia, Hadrian was appointed as his replacement and given independent command. Through all of these years, Hadrian continued to secure promotion after promotion and expand his sphere of influence. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And Hadrian, by this point, knew a lot of people. As Trajan fell seriously ill and returned to Rome, Hadrian remained in Syria, effectively commanding the Eastern Roman army. The Emperor Trajan passed away on August 8, 117, in Selenus Cilicia, leaving behind a legacy of one of Rome's most admired and popular emperors. Around 100 or perhaps 101, during his quaestorship, Hadrian got married, congratulations, to a lovely lady named Vibia Sabina who was actually Trajan's grandniece. The marriage, possibly arranged by Trajan's Empress Plotina, had complex dynamics, marked by a strained relationship between Hadrian and Trajan. Trajan was not enthusiastic about the marriages, and it faced challenges due to the couple's poor connection. So you see that this was more of a political marriage, as most marriages were during the day, but generally people got along for the sake of it. These two, however, were having some difficulties. The marriage may have, however, served more political purposes, securing the support of Plotina, Salonia, Matilda, who was Hadrian's mother-in-law, and their extended family. Plotina and Matidia held significant influence, and Hadrian's succession could maintain their social and political standing. Despite these connections, the relationship between Hadrian and Trajan remained intricate, with evidence of conflicts, possibly 
related to Hadrian's attempts to influence Trajan through his boy favorites. Interesting. In 112, Trajan elevated Matidia to Augusta after the death of Ulvia Marciana. Hadrian's failure to attain a senior consulship late in Trajan's reign indicated a lack of clear favoritism. Despite Trajan's active support of Hadrian's advancement, he still wanted to exercise some caution, as seen in the measured promotion and the withholding of certain privileges. So it wasn't like in some other cases where the one in power, if they did favor you strongly, would not just allow you to climb the ladder, but help you up in a very swift fashion. In Hadrian's case, however, although he had many powerful connections, Trajan himself wanted him to do it by the book. The issue of succession was critical for the stability of the Roman Empire. Nominating an heir too early might be perceived as an abdication. That being said, delaying it could lead to chaotic power struggles, and may land you in the same situation as many did with the Praetorian Guard, who certainly seem very fond of assassinating the emperors they swore to protect. So, as Trajan lay on his deathbed, slowly dying, the customary process involved a deathbed adoption wish, witnessed by others. However, this did not occur. Instead, an adoption document, signed by Trajan's wife Plotina, and dated the day after Trajan's death was prevented. Hadrian, still in Syria at the time, violated Roman adoption laws, which required both parties' presence. Therefore, the circumstances surrounding Hadrian's adoption raised rumors and speculation, naturally. Feademus, Trajan's young manservant, died soon after Trajan, leading to suspicions of foul play to avoid awkward questions. No loose ends. Historical sources differ on the legitimacy of Hadrian's adoption, with Dio Cassius considering it dubious, and the Historia Augusta writer asserting its genuineness. An Aureus minted early in Hadrian's reign presented him as Trajan's Caesar, reinforcing the official position of his legitimate succession. Upon Hadrian's accession, he informed the Senate through a letter that he was the new emperor, citing the urgency of the troops' acclamation due to the belief that the state could not be without an emperor. The legion's loyalty was rewarded with customary bonuses, and the Senate endorsed Hadrian's acclamation. Public ceremonies celebrated Hadrian's divine election, including the deification of Trajan at Hadrian's request. Remaining in the east, Hadrian suppressed the Jewish revolt that began under Trajan, and addressed disturbances along the Danube frontier. In Rome, Hadrian's Praetorian prefect, Atianus, claimed to uncover a conspiracy involving leading senators. Hadrian found 
and executed the alleged conspirators, claiming Attianus acted independently. The reasons for these executions are unclear, but may relate to potential rivals and opposition to Hadrian's intended policy changes. One of the executed senators, Gaius Ividius Negrinus, was possibly Hadrian's chief rival for the throne, and the Historia Augusta suggests Hadrian considered him as his heir apparent before deciding to eliminate him. In 125, Hadrian appointed Quintus Marcius Turbo as his Praetorian prefect. Turbo, a close friend of Hadrian, was a prominent figure in the equestrian order, serving as a senior court judge and procurator. Hadrian's appointment of Turbo might have been an attempt to mend relations with the Senate, especially after the controversial actions of his former Praetorian prefect, Atianus. Hadrian restricted equestrians from trying cases against senators, reaffirming the Senate's legal authority over its members. Despite these measures, Hadrian's relationship with the Senate remained strained for the rest of his reign. Some sources indicate that Hadrian occasionally used a network of informers known as the Frumentari to discreetly investigate individuals of high social standing, including senators and his close associates. This further contributed to the discord between Hadrian and the Senate during his rule. His reign marked a departure from traditional Roman imperial practices, as he spent more than half of his rule outside of Italy. Unlike previous emperors who relied on reports from imperial representatives, Hadrian wished to personally witness the state of the empire. While previous emperors often left Rome for extended periods due to military campaigns, Hadrian's incessant travels reflected a calculated shift in attitude. Rather than viewing the empire as a purely Roman hegemony, Hadrian aimed to integrate provincials into a commonwealth of civilized peoples with a shared Hellenic culture, albeit under Roman supervision. Because we couldn't have people developing their own cultures now, couldn't we? Hadrian had also supported the creation of municipia, which means municipal towns, allowing semi-autonomous urban communities with some of their own customs and some of their own laws, instead of immediately imposing new Roman colonies with Roman constitutions. This cosmopolitan and ecumenical approach is evident in coin issues from Hadrian's later reign depicting the emperor raising up personifications of various provinces. Aelius Aristides noted that Hadrian extended a protecting hand over his subjects, helping them stand to their feet. However, Hadrian's departure from traditional Roman practices did not sit well with Roman traditionalists. Nero, a previous emperor, had faced criticism for neglecting his responsibilities while enjoying a prolonged and peaceful tour of Greece. Hadrian's extensive travels, 
his embrace of diverse cultures, and the creation of semi-autonomous municipalities drew criticism from those who thought that he was a little bit too Greek, and perhaps much too cosmopolitan for a Roman emperor. Before Hadrian's arrival in Britannia, the province faced a major rebellion from 119 to 121, leading to the dispatch of troops and military losses. In 122, Hadrian initiated the construction of a wall. I'm sure you can guess what it's called. That's right, we all know Hadrian's Wall. With the stated purpose of separating Romans from the barbarians. And a quick reminder that the word barbarian to the Romans meant anybody who was not a Roman. So it's not just the uh, image we have of Celtic people running around looking like Vosengeterix and that sort of thing. It was just anybody who was not Roman in their culture. The actual threat, or, or its resurgence, is speculative. But the decision may have been influenced by a general desire to halt the empire's expansion and reduce defense costs, because after all, the bigger the empire, the more expensive it is to patrol. The wall, serving as a deterrent and controlling cross-border trade and immigration, was complete by the time Hadrian concluded his visit to Britannia in the year 122, although he never actually saw the finished wall himself, its construction continued to be associated with his name. After his time in Britannia, Hadrian likely continued through southern Gaul, at Nemausus, he may have overseen the construction of a basilica dedicated to Plutotina, his patroness who had recently been deified at his personal request. Around the same time, Hadrian dismissed his secretary Ad Epistolus, the biographer Suetonius, for excess familiarity toward the Empress. I think we all know what that means. The dismissal of Gaius Septicius Clarus, a colleague of Praetorian Prefect Marcius Turbo, under similar allegations, may have served as a pretext to remove him from office. Hadrian spent the winter of that year of 122-23 to at Taraco in Spain, where, in his spare time and grand wisdom, he restored the Temple of Augustus. In 123, Hadrian sailed across the Mediterranean to Mauritania, where he personally led a minor campaign against local rebels. However, his visit was shortened due to reports of war preparations by Parthia, prompting him to swiftly change course and head eastwards. Now, during those travels, he stopped at Cyrene, where he personally financed the training of young men from well-bred families for the royal mil Roman rather military. This investment in local communities exemplified by his earlier restoration effects in Cyrene after the Trojanic Jewish revolt in 119 was described as characteristic of Hadrian's approach. Upon reaching the Euphrates, 
Hadrian personally negotiated a settlement with the Parthian king Osroes I, inspected Roman defences, and then headed westward along the Black Sea coast. It is likely that he spent this winter in Nicomedia, the principal city of Bithynia, which had recently suffered a rather terrible earthquake. Hadrian provided funds for its reconstruction, and was hailed a hero out of restoring the province. During this same period, Hadrian may have visited Claudiopolis and encountered Antonos, a young man of humble birth, who later became Hadrian's lover. Ooh. Details about their meeting are unclear, and depictions of Antonus suggest that they met when Antonus was around twenty, shortly before his death in 130. If they had met in 123, Antonus would have been a youth of about thirteen or fourteen, which is a big yikes. The historical specifics of their relationship remain largely unknown, and probably will remain largely unknown for a great long time to come. Continuing his journey through Anatolia, Hadrian is traditionally associated with certain locations, including the alleged foundation of a city, Hadrianathere, after a successful boar hunt. During this time, plans to complete the Temple of Zeus in Cizicus, initiated by the kings of Pergamon, were implemented, and a colossal statue of Hadrian was also placed in the temple. Several cities, including Pergamon, Ephesus, Sardes, and more, were promoted as regional centers for the imperial cult. In the autumn of 124, Hadrian arrived in Greece and took part in the Eleusinian Mysteries. He had a special commitment to Athens, where he had been granted citizenship and an archonet. At the request of the Athenians, he revised their constitution, adding a new tribe named after himself. He also actively intervened in Athenian affairs. For example, he created two foundations to fund public games, festivals, and competitions when no citizen was willing to sponsor them themselves. He also granted an imperial subsidy for the Athenian grain supply, a move which no doubt made him wildly popular among the lower classes. During the following winter, Hadrian toured the Peloponnese, visiting Epidaurus, where he erected temples and a statue in his honor. It is believed that Hadrian and Antinous may have already been lovers at this time. Hadrian showed particular generosity to Mantinea, restoring its temple of Poseidon Hippios, and rebuilding ancient shrines in the region. In an effort to integrate Greek nobles into Roman political life, Hadrian persuaded Hercules Herculanus, the leader of the Hercules family that had ruled Sparta, to enter the Roman Senate. This marked a significant step in overcoming the reluctance of Greek elites 
to participate in Roman politics. In March 125, Hadrian presided over the Athenian festival of Dionysia. Added to this, he was wearing Athenian dress, which is quite a special thing for a Roman emperor, not something you see every day, that's for sure. He also committed extensive research to complete the construction of the Temple of Olympian Zeus in Athens, which had been under construction for more than five centuries. Upon his return to Italy, Hadrian visited Sicily, and coins commemorated him as the restorer of the island. In Rome, he observed the completed pantheon, and his villa at Tibur in the Sabine Hills. In March 127, Hadrian began a tour of Italy, restoring the shrine of Cupra in Cupra Maritima, and improving the drainage of the Fusine Lake. However, his decision in 127 to divide Italy into four regions, each under an imperial legate with consular rank, was not very popular with the Roman Senate. These legates had jurisdiction over all of Italy, except for Rome itself, shifting Italian cases from the Roman courts. This change was not well received, and it did not last long beyond Hadrian's reign. Around this time, Hadrian began to fall ill, but it did not prevent him from embarking on a journey to Africa in the spring of 128. His arrival coincided with rain ending a drought, and he took the opportunity to inspect the troops, delivering a speech to them. Hadrian returned to Italy in the summer of 128, but his stay was brief as he embarked on another tour that would last for three years. In September 128, Hadrian attended the Eleusinian Mysteries once again. During this visit to Greece, he focused on Athens and Sparta, the two ancient rivals for dominance in Greece. Hadrian had initially considered concentrating his Greek revival efforts around the Amphiketonic League based in Delphi, but he eventually opted for a grander project. His new Panhellenion was intended to be a council that would unite Greek cities, kind of like a EU sort of thing. Hadrian initiated the preparations for this council, which involved determining the legitimacies of each city's claim to be considered Greek. After setting things in motion, Hadrian travelled to Ephesus. From Greece, Hadrian continued his journey through Asia to Egypt, likely transported across the Aegean with his entourage by an Ephesian merchant named Lucius Erastus. Hadrian later sent a council a letter, uh, the Council of Ephesus that is, endorsing Erastus as a suitable candidate for town councillor, and uh, offering to cover the requisite fee. Hadrian arrived in Egypt before the Egyptian New Year on August 29th, year 130. His stay in Egypt began with the restoration of Pompey the Great's tomb in Pelusium, 
where he offered sacrifices to Pompey as a hero and composed an epigraph for the tomb. This restoration was likely connected to a need to reaffirm Roman Eastern hegemony following social unrest during Trajan's late reign, as Pompey was widely acknowledged for establishing Rome's power in the East. During their time in Egypt, Hadrian and Antonius also held a lion hunt in the Libyan desert, marking one of the earliest pieces of evidence that they travelled together. During a journey on the Nile, Antonos, Hadrian's favourite, drowned. The exact circumstances of his death remain unknown, and of course, that opens it up to various speculations, including accident, murder, religious sacrifice, or perhaps Antonos had just had a little bit too much of life. The Historia Augusta provides an account of this event, and I will read it now. I quote from the Historia Augusta. During a journey on the Nile, he lost Antinous, his favourite, and for this youth he wept like a woman. Concerning this incident there are various rumours, for some claim that he had devoted himself to death for Hadrian, and others, what both his beauty and Hadrian's sensuality suggest. But, however this may be, the Greeks deified him at Hadrian's request, and declared that oracles were given through his agency, but these, it is commonly asserted, were composed by Hadrian himself. In honour of Antinous, Hadrian founded a city for him on October 30th, 130, and it was of course called Antinopolis, the city of Antinous, if you didn't work that out already. Following this, he rather sadly continued his journey down the Nile to Thebes, where he visited to the Colossi of Memnon on November 20 and the 21st was commemorated by four epigrams inscribed by Julia Balbino. Hadrian then headed north, reaching the Fayum at the beginning of December. After journeying down the Nile, Hadrian travelled east during 130 to 31 to organize and inaugurate his Panhellonion, centered on the Athenian temple to Olympian Zeus. This grand league aimed to bring together all Greek cities, with membership applications requiring mythologized or fabricated claims to Greek origins and affirmations of loyalty to Imperial Rome. Hadrian saw himself as the protector of Greek culture and urban self-government, presenting himself as the heir to Pericles. The Panhellonian, based on games, commemorations, and a non-political Hellenism, had varying appeal to Hellenized cities in Asia Minor. Hadrian bestowed honorific titles on many regional centres, including Palmyra. After spending the winter of 131-32 to in Athens, where he dedicated the Temple of Olympian Zeus, Hadrian headed east to Judea around 132. During his visit to Roman Judea, Hadrian considered plans to rebuild Jerusalem as a Roman colony with various privileges. 
The intent was to assimilate the Jewish temple into the traditional Roman civic religious imperial cult, a practice that was very common in other provinces. However, strict Jewish monotheism resisted these efforts, leading to a massive anti-Hellenistic and anti-Roman uprising led by Simon bar -Kaba. Barakaba punished Jews who refused to join the rebellion, and a Roman army was requested to suppress the resistance. The revolt is traditionally linked to Hadrian's abolition of circumcision, but some scholars dispute this claim, citing issues with the reliability of the Historia Augusta, and suggesting other contributing factors like Roman administration, tensions between locals and Roman colonists, and messianic expectations. The Jewish uprising, believed to have started around the summer, or perhaps the fall of year 132, overwhelmed the Romans with its organized ferocity. There was just too many Jews. Hadrian summoned General Sextus Julius Severus from Britain and brought in troops from various regions, including the Danube. Roman losses were substantial, with an entire legion, which was around 4,000 troops, reportedly just lost, wiped out by the rebels. Hadrian's reports to the Roman Senate omitted the customary salutation, reflecting the severity of the conflict. The rebellion was, however, quashed by 135, resulting in significant casualties among the Jewish population, with estimates of 580,000 Jews dead, numerous towns destroyed, and many enslaved. In the aftermath, Hadrian made some pretty significant changes to the region. He erased the name of the province and renamed it Syria Palestina. Jerusalem was renamed Elia Capitolina after Hadrian and Jupiter Capitolinus and it was rebuilt in the Greek architectural style. The main forum was placed at the junction of the main Cardo and Decumanus Maximus. After suppressing the revolt, Hadrian built a temple dedicated to Zeus, uh, Zeus rather, Hypsistos for the Samaritans on Mount Gezerim. The harsh repression marked the end of Jewish political independence from the Roman imperial order. In 133, Hadrian took to the field with his armies against the rebels, and then finally returned to Rome, likely in the same year. In the final years of his life in Rome, Hadrian faced the aftermath of the Third Jewish War, which he considered a disappointment to his aspirations for a cosmopolitan empire. In 134, he issued an imperial salutation for the conclusions of the war, although it wasn't officially concluded until the next year. Commemorations and achievement awards were subsequently kept quite minimal. Empress Sabina died around 136, after an unhappy marriage that Hadrian had maintained as a political necessity. Hadrian himself acknowledged that Sabina's ill temper and irritability would have been sufficient grounds for divorce if he were a private citizen. 
Unfortunately, when you're an emperor, you have to keep up appearances. Following her death, there was speculation, of course, as there always is, supported by the Historia Augusta, that Hadrian may have had her poisoned. Well, I suppose we'll never know. Sabina, who had been made an Augusta around 128, was deified shortly after her death, in accordance with the established imperial tradition. His marriage to Sabina was childless, and given his declining health, he turned his attention to the issue of succession. In 136, he adopted Lucius Seonius Commodus, an ordinary consul of that year, who then took the name Lucius Aelius Caesar. Aelius was the son-in-law of Gaius Avidius Nigrinus, one of the four consulars executed in 118. Despite a delicate health and a reputation more akin to a voluptuous, well-educated great lord than a leader, Aelius served honourably as joint governor of Pannonia Superior and Pannonia Inferior. Unfortunately, he didn't last very long, and died on January the 1st, 138. After Aelius's death, Hadrian adopted Titus Aurelius Fulvus Boenius Arius Antoninus, who later became the Emperor Antoninus Pius, which is a much easier name to say. To ensure dynastic stability, Hadrian required that Antoninus adopt both Lucius Seonius Commodus, that son of Aelius Caesar, and Marcus Annius Verus, the grandson of an influential senator of the same name, and a close friend of Hadrian. Annius was already betrothed to Aelius Caesar's daughter, Seona Fabia, the eventual co-emperors Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus were descendants of this arrangement. While Lucius Verus was not that relevant, Marcus Aurelius certainly was, and if you look through my videos on the old philosophers, you'll find a rather detailed video about his life and his philosophies. Hadrian's final years were marked by conflict and discontent. The adoption of Aelius Caesar was very unpopular, and it led to conflict with Hadrian's brother-in-law and Serianus's grandson. In 137, a possible coup attempt involving Fuscus resulted in both his and Servianus's execution. During his last years, Hadrian faced illness and multiple attempts at taking his own life. Now, I personally think that these attempts of taking his own life may have been out of loneliness. I think that in his later life he pictured himself with Antoninos, not lonely and all by himself. Perhaps Hadrian left his heart in the Nile River. So sad. Hadrian did pass away on the 10th of July, 138, at the age of 62. In his villa at Belier, after a reign of 21 years. Historical accounts by Dio Cassius and the Historia Augusta provide details of his declining health, with some modern interpretations suggesting signs of coronary artery disease in the later portrayals. He was initially buried at Puteoli near Baie on an estate once owned 
by the orator Cicero. Subsequently, his remains were transferred to Rome and interred in the gardens of Domitia, near the nearly completed mausoleum. After the completion of the mausoleum of Hadrian in Rome 139 by his successor, Antoninus Pius, Hadrian's body was finally cremated, and his ashes were placed there alongside those of his wife, Bibia Sabina, and his first adopted son, Lucius Aelius Caesar, who had also died a rather early death in 138. The Senate, initially reluctant to grant divine honours to Hadrian, was eventually persuaded by Antoninus, who threatened to refuse the position of emperor if they did not do so. Hadrian was given a temple on the campus Martius, adorned with reliefs representing the provinces. To recognize Antoninus's filial piety in advocating for Hadrian's deification, the Senate awarded Antoninus the title Pius. Despite some ill will towards Hadrian in the Senate, commemorative coinage honoring his deification was kept to a minimum. It would seem that you have to do everything right to be remembered in a good way by the Senate. They seem to be very, very judgmental people. Don't hang around judgmental people, everyone. Find people who appreciate you for who you are, not what they want you to be. And, on that note, we've reached the end of the life of Hadrian. I'm glad you've joined me today, and I hope you've learned something. If you can hear me out there, and you're not already fast asleep, then allow me to wish you good night, and I'll see you next time. In the heart of ancient Rome, amidst the grandeur of marble temples and bustling forums, flowed a passion as rich as the crimson nectar of the gods, the love of wine. From the vineyards of the Italian countryside to the opulent banquets of the elite, wine was more than a mere beverage. It was a symbol of prestige, pleasure, and divine indulgence. As poets extolled its virtues, and philosophers pondered its mysteries, wine became an integral part of Roman life, weaving its way into the very fabric of society. In the symphony of Roman civilization, it was the melody that echoed through the ages, a timeless testament to the enduring allure of Bacchic bliss. Let's start from the beginning, really slowly. In ancient Rome, Wine was initially considered a luxury item, and imported at considerable cost. 
It was associated with the Liber Pater, the wine god, albeit not as prominently in later times. There were supposed prohibitions on women drinking wine, with elite women in particular, expected to maintain their chastity and purity, reflecting broader societal expectations of behavior. Wine played a multifaceted role in Roman religious and social life. Liber, Bacchus, and Dionysus were credited with the creation of wine, which was offered as a libation to various deities, including ancestors. Strong wine, that with a high alcohol content, called temetum, was reserved for men and gods like Jupiter, while mixed wine was associated with Venus and considered unsuitable for official sacrifices. The association of Venus with wine underscored the connection between wine, intoxication, and pleasure, encapsulated in the phrase, without food and wine, Venus freezes. Wine festivals, such as the Vinalia, were significant cultural events, with the Vinalia Prima celebrating the previous year's vintage, and the Vinalia Rustica honoring the grape harvest. As Rome expanded, its attitudes towards wine evolved, Influenced by neighboring Etruscans and Greeks, wine gradually became more ingrained in Roman culture. Over time, wine transitioned from a luxury enjoyed primarily by the elite to a staple of everyday life. Cato's recommendations regarding wine rations for slaves reflect this shift highlighting the increasing accessibility of wine across broad social classes. The proliferation of vineyards and the changing dietary habits of Romans further underscored the growing importance of wine in Roman society. It not only played a crucial role in religious rituals and social gatherings, but also became a symbol of generosity, wealth, and prestige among the elite. The Bacchanalia were secretive Roman cults dedicated to Bacchus, the god of wine, freedom, intoxication and ecstasy, influenced by the Greek Dionysia and the Dionysian mysteries. Likely introduced to Rome around 200 BC from Greek colonies in southern Italy and Etruria, these cults initially involved occasional women-only gatherings. However, once word spread, they grew in popularity, admitting priests and initiates of all genders and classes, employing music, dance, and of course, abundant wine, participants sought ecstatic religious experiences. The Roman Senate perceived the Bacchanalia as a threat to its authority and morality, leading to brutal suppressions in 186 BC, resulting in the execution of thousands of initiates and leaders. Despite this ban, 
illicit bacchanals persisted clandestinely, particularly in southern Italy, which was likely their place of origin. As Rome encountered diverse cultures, it intersected with religions such as Judaism and Christianity, both of which held wine in quite positive regard. Grapes and wine feature prominently in the Hebrew and Christian Bibles, symbolizing abundance and blessings. In the Torah, grapevines were among the first crops planted after the Great Flood, and in Canaan, grapevines were abundant, reflecting the land's fertility. Jews under Roman rule integrated wine into their daily lives, but disapproved of the excesses associated with Roman practices. Many Jewish perspectives on wine were adopted by Christianity, which emerged in the first century AD. Jesus' first miracle involved turning water into wine, and wine plays a central role in the sacrament of the Eucharist. The Romans noticed parallels between Bacchus and Christ, both featuring narratives of life after death. What a coincidence. Bacchus symbolized the yearly cycle of the grape harvest and dormancy, while Christ's death and resurrection story held similar symbolism. The act of drinking wine during the Eucharist represented consuming Christ, akin to the rites of the Bacchus festival. So it makes one wonder did they get the idea from the Christians, or did the Christians get the idea from them? Chicken and the egg, of course. The significance of wine in Christianity grew, and the church eventually became the dominant influence in the world of wine, surpassing ancient Rome and shaping wine culture for centuries, up to and including the Renaissance. Romans attributed both healing and harmful properties to wine. It was believed to alleviate mental disorders, like depression and memory loss as well as physical ailments including bloating, constipation, and gout. Even conditions such as snake bites, tapeworms, urinary problems, and vertigo were thought to be treatable with wine. Cato extensively documented wine's medical uses providing recipes such as a laxative made from grapevines treated with ashes, manure, and hellebore. He suggested soaking flowers of plants like juniper and myrtle in wine to aid with snake bite and gout. Additionally, he advocated for a mixture of old wine and juniper boiled in a lead pot to address urinary issues, and believed that combining wine with acidic pomegranates could cure tapeworms. The Greco-Roman physician Galen further contributed to understanding wine's medicinal benefits. He used wine liberally in treating gladiators, relying on its antiseptic properties for wound care and its analgesic effects for surgery. 
Galen even developed pharmaceutical concoctions known as theriacs made from wine, which were believed to have miraculous healing powers against various elements. But of course the Romans were fully aware of the negative effects of excessive wine consumption also. It wasn't all fun and games after all. Wine was thought to induce madness and provoke quarrels as warned by Lucretius. Seneca the Elder believed that drinking wine exacerbated physical and psychological flaws. Heavy drinking was, of course, frowned upon, with those who indulged considered dangerous to society. Roman figures like Cicero criticized rivals like Mark Antony for their excessive drinking habits highlighting a social stigma associated with overindulgence in wine. Oh, and by the way, he was perhaps right to do so, to launch this criticism on Mark Antony, as it is written that Mark Antony once drank so much that he vomited in the Senate. Not very classy at all. So what about the origins of viticulture? This is what we call the production of grapevines. Well, we have to go back quite far to figure that one out. The origins of viticulture and winemaking on the Italian peninsula are so old that they are, of course, shrouded in much uncertainty. But the evidence that we do have suggests that the Mycenaean Greeks may have exerted some influence through early settlements in southern Italy. However, concrete evidence of Greek influence doesn't really emerge until around 800 BC. Prior to this, Viticulture was firmly established within Etruscan civilization, which thrived in the region now known as Tuscany, a renowned winemaking area. Even to this day, Tuscany wine is a uh, very famous. Well, what about the Greeks? We must talk about them. After all, they are credited with bringing some of the wine culture to the Romans. Well, for the ancient Greeks, wine held a central place in daily life, and also served as a valuable commodity for trade. Greek colonies were encouraged to cultivate vineyards, both for local consumption and for commerce with other Greek city-states. The abundance of native grapevines in southern Italy provided an ideal environment for wine production, leading to the Greek designation of the region as Oenotria, meaning the land of vines. It's likely that the Greek settlers also bought their own winemaking techniques further influencing the methods employed in Italy. During the Republican era of Rome, the development of winemaking was shaped by the skills and knowledge of allied regions and territories conquered during Rome's expansion. By 270 BC, Roman control extended over the Greek colonies in southern Italy. Additionally, the Etruscans, those native Italians in Tuscany, who had established extensive trade networks, particularly in Gaul, 
were gradually assimilated into Roman culture by the first century BC. The Punic Wars between Rome and Carthage had a significant impact on Roman viticulture. The Carthaginians were known for their advanced winemaking techniques, as documented by the Carthaginian writer Margo. Although Rome destroyed Carthage and its libraries, Margo's agricultural treatise, comprising of 26 volumes, managed to survive. These writings were later translated into Latin and Greek in 146 BC, and became influential works in Roman literature, cited extensively by authors such as Pliny, Columella, Varro, and Gargilius Martialis. Despite Margot's original texts not surviving to the present day, their insights and techniques have endured through the writings of these Roman authors. During most of Rome's winemaking history, Greek wine held the highest prestige, commanding higher prices compared to domestic Roman wine. However, the 2nd century BC marked the beginning of what is referred often to as the Golden Age of Roman winemaking, characterized by the emergence of Grand Cru vineyards, akin to early first growths in Rome. A notable event during this period was the Opimium Vintage of 121, named after Council Lucius Opimius. This vintage was renowned for its exceptional harvest and the remarkably high quality of wine produced. Some of the finest examples from this vintage were still being enjoyed over a century later, attesting to its exceptional nature. Pliny the Elder, a prominent Roman writer, extensively documented the prestigious first growths of Rome. Among the most notable were Falernian, Alban, and Cayacuban wines. Other esteemed vineyards included Raeticum, Hadrianum from the Atri or the Adriatic, Praetutium along the Adriatic coast near Emilia Romagna and Marche, and Lunense in modern-day Tuscany. Around Rome itself there were renowned estates, such as Alban, Sabinum, Setinum and Signinum. Moving southward towards Naples, estates like Falernium, Calinum, and others were also highly esteemed. In Sicily, the first growth estate of Mamertinum also stood out for its quality. Estimates of wine consumption in ancient Rome tend to vary, but it was consumed by all classes, including the very young. Women, however, generally consumed less wine than men. Wine was typically diluted before consumption, often with an equal volume of water except for certain occasions, such as libations to the gods, and for the elderly. Modern estimates suggest that on average each member of Rome's urban population consumed around half a litre of undiluted wine daily, 
highlighting the widespread popularity and importance of wine in Roman society. Pompeii, situated south of Naples on the Campanian coast, emerged as a vital hub for wine production in the Roman world. The fertile slopes of nearby Vesuvius provided an ideal environment for vineyards, yielding some of the finest wines accessible to Rome and its provinces. Renowned for their wine-drinking prowess, the Pompeians contributed to the city's reputation as a center of Bacchic worship, evidenced by depictions of Bacchus on frescoes and artifacts scattered throughout the area. Merchants from Pompeii stamped their amphoras, that was like a big jug for storing wine, with distinctive emblems, leading to the widespread distribution of Pompeian wine across the Roman Empire, reaching as far as Bordeaux, Narbonne, Toulouse, and even some parts of Spain. Interestingly, the popularity of Pompeian wine also led to early instances of wine fraud. That's right. Counterfeit stamps were discovered on amphoras containing non-Pompeian wine. This underscores the esteemed reputation and widespread demand for Pompeii's renowned wines, which transcended regional boundaries within the Roman world. Well, of course, it all had to come to an end in Pompeii. The eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD had a catastrophic consequence for Campana's thriving maritime export and trade network. The eruption obliterated ports, vineyards, and warehouses storing the previous year's vintage leading to a sharp increase in wine prices. Supply and demand. This sudden spike in prices rendered wine inaccessible to all but the wealthiest individuals, exacerbating the growing demand for wine among the less affluent population. In response to the wine shortage, and the potential for lucrative profits. There was a rapid expansion of vineyards closer to Rome, with existing grain fields being replanted with grapevines. However, these efforts eventually led to a surplus of wine, which of course caused the prices to plummet and adversely affected the interest of the wine producers and traders. It's very hard to price gouge when there's so much supply available. Completely defeated the point of those enterprising young capitalists who set up the vineyards in the wake of the Vesuvius eruption. Furthermore, making everything a lot worse, the conversion of grain fields to vineyards contributed to a food shortage in Rome, compounding the challenges that were already faced by a growing population. In 92 AD, Emperor Domitian took decisive action to address the situation by issuing an edict that not only prohibited the establishment of new vineyards in Rome, but also mandated the removal of half of the vineyards in wine-producing provinces across the empire. This measure aimed to restore balance to the wine market and alleviate the strain on food resources caused by the shift in agricultural priorities. 
Despite the widespread disregard for Emperor Domitian's edict in the Roman provinces, the impact of the decree on the nascent wine industries of Spain and Gaul remains a subject of debate among historians. The edict aimed to limit vineyard expansion, ensuring that wine production would meet domestic demand without generating surplus for foreign trade. However, its disregard for trade considerations may have stifled the growth of viticulture and winemaking in these burgeoning wine regions. Well, either way, something had to be done. And it was. The preservation of Pompeii has offered valuable insights into Roman winemaking and viticulture practices. Excavations have revealed intricate planning patterns through preserved vine roots, and entire vineyards have been unearthed within the city walls. These discoveries such as those at Pompey's former cattle market, the Forum Boarium, provide a comprehensive understanding of pressing and production techniques used in conduct junction with vine cultivation. Furthermore, efforts to recreate Roman wine have been facilitated by replanting some of these ancient vineyards with original grape varieties. Experimental archaeology has played a crucial role in reviving ancient winemaking techniques and understanding the nuanced processes involving in Roman wine production. Thus, the preservation of Pompeii continues to enrich our knowledge of ancient winemaking practices and will continue to do so for what I assume to be quite some time. The ancient Romans played a significant role in spreading viticulture and wine production to regions that would later become famous wine-growing areas. Through trade, military activities, and settlements, they introduced wine culture and vine planting practices to various regions throughout the empire. Roman wine merchants traded with both allies and enemies, extending their influence to places like Carthage, southern Spain, Gaul, and the regions surrounding the Rhine and Danube rivers. During Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars, Roman wine merchants were already established in areas like Kibilona, indicating the early presence of Roman viticulture. Roman garrisons in places such as Bordeaux, Mainz, Trier and Colchester led to the planting of vineyards to meet local demand and reduce the need for long-distance trade. Retired soldiers, familiar with Roman viticulture, founded settlements where vineyards were established. While imported grapevines may have been used, evidence suggests that native vines were also cultivated potentially giving rise to the grape varieties grown in those regions even up to our modern day. As Rome expanded, so did the wine trade and market economy. Initially, Rome exported wine to settlements and provinces across the Mediterranean, but by the first century AD, Competition from provincial wine producers emerged. The Roman market economy encouraged provincial exports 
contributing to the growth of supply and demand. The Roman conquest of Carthage expanded Rome's control over southern and coastal Spain, although full dominion of the Iberian Peninsula occurred later under Caesar Augustus. Roman colonization spurred the development of winemaking in regions such as Tarraconensis, including modern Catalonia and Galicia, and Hispania Baetica, encompassing Andalusia and Cordoba's Montilamoriles and Cadiz's Sherry regions. While viticulture was introduced to Spain by the Carthaginians and Phoenicians, Roman advancements in wine technology and infrastructure transformed grapes from a private crop to a profitable commercial venture. Spanish wines, notably from regions like Rioja, were traded widely and even influenced the development of wine regions like Bordeaux. Historians suggest that vines from Rioja may have been used to establish the first Roman vineyards in the Bordeaux region. Spanish wines including the esteemed Caritanum from Serret, modern-day Jerez de la Frontera, were highly regarded back in Rome. Serratanum, believed by some to be an early form of sherry, was praised by poets like Martial. Spanish wines found markets beyond Rome as well, with archaeological finds of Spanish amphoras in regions like Aquitaine, Brittany, and Britain. Strabo and Columela praised the beauty and quality of Baetica's vineyards, with Columela being influenced by the region's viticulture. Further archaeological findings suggest that the Celts were among the first to cultivate grapes in Gaul, with grape pips dating back to 10,000 BC discovered across France. While the extent of pre-Roman Celtic winemaking is unclear, Greek influence, beginning around 600 BC near Massalia, introduced new winemaking methods to the region, albeit limited to areas with Mediterranean climates. Now back to the Romans, who were known for their strategic vineyard selection, sought hillside terrain near rivers and towns, avoiding frost-prone valleys. Upon seizing Massalia in 125 BC, they expanded inland, establishing Narbonne along the Via Domitia in 118 BC. Despite Gaul's very high potential for winemaking, local tribes were more eager to purchase the fancy Roman wine, albeit at a much higher price. Further up the Rhone Valley, the Romans identified regions suitable for grape cultivation based on the presence of Quercus ilex trees indicating a warm climate suitable for viticulture. Vienne, near Côte produced a renowned resin-flavored wine, marking the first French wine, if we can classify it as French, to gain international recognition, all the way back in the first century A.D., 
Bordeaux's viticultural history began with the Roman interest in supplying its seaport, initially sourcing wine from the Gailac. Bordeaux's strategic location facilitated wine transportation along the Atlantic coast and to Britain. Pliny the Elder mentions local plantings, including the Balisca grape, possibly ancestral to the Cabernet family. Further up the Rhone, the Romans encountered regions that would become Beaujolais, the Maconnais and Côte Chalonnaise, and the Côte d'Or. The Romans supported Gaul's Aedui tribe, founding Augustinum in Burgundy, possibly initiating vineyard planting. Evidence of wine production in this region dates back to Emperor Constantine's visit in 312 AD. The origins of France's other major wine regions are somewhat less clear. Although Gallo-Roman vineyards have been found in Sancare's chalk hillsides, Emperor Julian owned a vineyard near Paris in Montmartre, and a 5th century villa in Epernay reflects Roman influence in Champagne. Where wild vinifera vines existed along the Rhine since ancient times, viticulture in the region began with the Roman conquest of Germania. The earliest evidence of wine production in Germania dates to Ausonius's work Mosella in 370 AD, describing thriving vineyards along the Mosel. Orsonius, a Bordeaux native, praised the vineyards, suggesting long-standing viticultural tradition in the area. Roman settlers planted vineyards along the Mosel and Rhine to supply the growing demand of soldiers along the German frontier and to reduce the costs of importing wine from Rome, Spain, or Bordeaux. To facilitate trading, the Romans considered constructing a canal linking the Seine and Mosul rivers. Alternatively, Tacitus described an inferior beer-like beverage as an alternative to wine. The steep hillsides along the Mosul and Rhine provided ideal conditions for grape cultivation, with south-southwest facing slopes maximizing sunlight exposure and shielding vines from cold winds. The river's reflection provided additional warmth, enabling the production of wine in Germania, possibly even early ancestors of Riesling grapes. German wine began to gain a good reputation, and it was traded downriver to the North Sea and to merchants in Britain. Despite the ongoing military tensions, neighboring Germanic tribes, such as the Alemanni and Franks, were eager consumers of German wine until a 5th century edict banned wine sales outside of Roman settlements. The party is over. Wine historian Hugh Johnson suggests that this prohibition may have motivated barbarian invasions, leading to the sacking of Roman settlements like Trier. In ancient Rome, 
winemaking was often done by treading the grapes, most likely by foot, similar to the French pigeage. The free run juice, believed to have been the most beneficial medicinal properties, was prized and kept separate from juice obtained later by pressing the grape. Pressing took place in a specialized room with an elevated concrete platform containing a shallow basin. Long wooden beams attached to a windlass were used to apply pressure to the crushed grapes. This labor-intensive and, frankly, expensive process was mainly used on large estates, while smaller wineries relied on treading alone. The grape skins were pressed one to three times, with the juice from the latter pressings being coarser and more tannic, resulting in a lower quality wine called Eora. After pressing, the grape must was stored in a large earthenware jar called a dolia, where fermentation took place for anywhere between two weeks to a month. Small holes in the top of the dolia allow the carbon dioxide to escape. To enhance the flavor, white wine might age on its lees, and chalk or marble dust was added to reduce the acidity. Wines were sometimes exposed to high temperatures to bake them, similar to modern Madeira production. To sweeten the wine, a portion of the must was boiled to concentrate sugars in a process known as defrutum, or honey and lead were added. Fortunately, in our modern days, we no longer add the lead. Another method involved blending unfermented must with finished wine, known as sous reserve. Well, it's all very involved, isn't it? The culture of wine in the ancient Roman provinces, and in ancient Rome itself. Perhaps the Germanics really did invade the Roman provinces because they were denied of such a privilege. Wine is love, wine is life. Perhaps I will drink a glass of wine this evening. Thank you very much for joining me. Once again, it's been a great time. I'd like to remind you to leave your comments down below. Like the video and, if you feel so inclined, subscribe to the channel. I wish you all the best. And I will see you in the next video. Good night, everybody. One finds themselves in the midst of a bleak and hopeless existence. A slave. A life of submission and backbreaking labor. It is a joyless existence. One man dares to stand up and says, No more. 
leading the greatest slave revolt to ever shake the eternal city of Rome. A glimmer of hope, a chance of freedom. His legacy of bravery continues to inspire us, and such a tale is what we are about to explore today. Close your eyes, and allow me to tell you all about how Spartacus led the Third Servile War. The Third Servile War, known also as the Gladiator War, or the War of Spartacus, according to Plutarch, marked the final uprising in a series of slave rebellions against the Roman Republic, referred to collectively as the Servile Wars. This particular rebellion stood out as it directly threatened Rome's heartland in Italy, and posed a significant challenge to the Roman military. Commencing in 73 BC, the rebellion originated with the escape of approximately 70 slave gladiators from a school in Capua. These fugitives swiftly overwhelmed the Roman forces, dispatched to apprehend them, and within a span of two years, their numbers swelled to include roughly 120,000 individuals, encompassing men, women, and children. Surprisingly, the able-bodied adults among them formed a highly effective armed force that repeatedly demonstrated its capability to resist or even defeat Roman military units, ranging from local patrols to trained legions led by consuls. This formidable slave army roamed across Italy, raiding estates and towns with relative impunity, sometimes splitting into separate but interconnected bands under various leaders, among whom was the renowned former gladiator known as Spartacus. Before we continue, I'd like to invite you, if you enjoy this content, to like, leave your comments down below for the algorithm, and subscribe to the channel. Well, back to the video, thanks in advance. As the slave army's depredations and military successes escalated, the Roman Senate grew increasingly alarmed as of course they would. Ultimately, Rome responded by assembling an army comprising eight legions, placed under the command of Marcus Licinius Crassus. After a protracted and arduous fighting retreat before Crassus's legions, and in the light of the encircling legions of Pompey, and Lucillus Varro, the rebels launched a final, full-scale assault against Crassus's forces. How did all of it end? Well, we'll have to get to that at the end of the video. Plutarch's account suggests that the slave's primary aim was to escape to freedom and depart Roman territory by way of Cisalpine Gaul. However, other sources, such as Apian and Florus, characterize the revolt as a civil war with the intention 
of capturing the city of Rome itself. Well, whichever way it was, the Third Servile War wielded significant and enduring ramifications for Rome's broader historical trajectory. Pompey and Crassus capitalized on their victories to advance their political ambitions, utilizing their public acclaim and the implied threat of their legions to sway the consular elections of 70 BC in their favor. A little bit of corruption going on, it would seem. Well, their subsequent actions as consuls contributed substantially to the erosion of Roman political institutions and facilitated the transition from the Republic to the Empire. All of this we will explain in detail later. But first, we have to look at the situation before the revolt. So we'll come back to Crassus and Varro later. Okay, so let's get into that situation before the gladiators and the slaves went crazy. Throughout Roman history, the presence of a readily available and inexpensive labor force in the form of slaves played a crucial role in the economy. Now these slaves were acquired through various means, such as purchase from foreign merchants or enslavement of populations during military conquests. Especially during the 2nd and 1st centuries BC, by the way, Rome's extensive involvement in conquests led to the importation of tens to hundreds of thousands of slaves from European and Mediterranean regions. Of course, when you had that many slaves, the economy around slavery was matching up with the numbers. The rules of supply and demand, of course, would reflect the pricing structures of the slaves, and the more slaves, well, the cheaper it got. You'd be surprised the class of people who could afford to get one. While some slaves served as household servants or craftsmen, a significant portion toiled in harsh conditions in mines and on agricultural estates, particularly in regions like Sicily and southern Italy. During the Roman Republican era, Slaves were generally treated quite harshly and were considered property rather than individuals under the law. Owners had virtually unchecked authority over them, with the power to mistreat or even kill them without any legal repercussions. The lowest grades of slaves, predominantly engaged in agriculture and mining labor, endured lives of grueling physical work. Now just a quick note. As we had just mentioned, you could get away with treating your slave poorly, or even killing your own slaves. Now this of course leads one to believe, well, I would rather go to a owner who was perhaps not of the best economic status. Perhaps my living conditions would be a lot simpler, but if he could only afford a single slave, then perhaps there is less chance that he would dispose of you in a cruel manner. 
After all, he would want a return on investment. The oppressive treatment and sheer magnitude of the slave population, of course, fueled occasional rebellions, and the Third Servile War was not the first, and definitely not the last. In Sicily, for instance, the First and Second Servile Wars erupted in 135 and 104 BC. In these conflicts, small bands of rebels found widespread support among fellow slaves eager to escape their oppressive conditions. While these uprisings posed significant challenges to Roman authority and required substantial military intervention to suppress, they were not perceived as existential threats to the Republic. After all, they're just slaves. How hard could they fight? Well, foreshadowing. They are about to find out how hard slaves can fight for their freedom. Spoiler alert. It's pretty damn hard. So, the dynamics had completely shifted with this Third Servile War. The First and Second Servile War were confined to the outlying regions like Sicily, and they were generally stopped before they could get in the sight of anybody in the main province. But this uprising brought the spectre of the slave revolt right to the heartland of Rome itself. So, let's get to the beginning. In the Roman Republic of the first century BC, gladiatorial spectacles held significant popularity as a form of entertainment. To meet the demand for combatants in these games, numerous training schools known as Ludi, were established across Italy. Not just in Rome, either. All over the place. Where there was Romans, Roman citizens, rather, there needed to be entertainment. And you know exactly what kind of entertainment the Romans enjoyed. These schools primarily trained prisoners of war and condemned criminals, regarded as slaves, to fight in the arena. In 73 BC, a daring escape plot unfolded at the Capuan school owned by Lentulus Batiatus, involving approximately 200 gladiators. Though their plan was betrayed, around 70 men managed to seize kitchen tools and fight their way out of captivity. They also commandeered several wagons carrying gladiatorial weapons and armor. If I can imagine a gladiator charging at a Roman soldier with a, with a frying pan and another with a whisk. Upon gaining their freedom, the escaped gladiators elected leaders from among their ranks, choosing two Gallic slaves, Crixus and Oenamus, along with a figure named Spartacus. The origins of Spartacus remain somewhat unclear while some sources suggest that he may have been a Thracian auxiliary in the Roman legions who later fell into slavery. Others speculate he could have been a captive taken by the legions. Well, we don't know. Perhaps one day we will find some 
more evidence surrounding his origins. Now following their escape, this band of slaves clashed with a small contingent of troops who were dispatched from Capua, and the slaves emerged victorious. Of course they had to loot the enemy, which meant they had brand new outfits. That's right, proper Roman armor, and proper Roman swords, all the rest, everything that they needed. While the exact sequence of events immediately following their escape is not entirely consistent across sources, it is generally agreed that the group pillaged the surrounding region. While they were doing this, every slave they encountered more or less joined up with them. They recruited many slaves, and eventually retreated to a more defensible position. Right at the bottom of Mount Vesuvius. As the revolt and raids unfolded in Campania, a region frequented by the affluent and influential of Rome, Roman authorities swiftly took notice. They regarded the uprising as a significant wave of criminal activity rather than a full-fledged armed rebellion. However, later that same year, Rome mobilized a military force under Praetorian authority to suppress what they now realized was a rebellion. The praetor Gaius Claudius Glaber assembled a force of three thousand men, hastily gathered militia rather than regular legions. As the Romans perceived the situation as more of a raid than a declared war, of course you wouldn't send out your best soldiers to fight a group of slaves, wouldn't you? I mean, how tough could they be? Well, Glaber was about to find out. His forces laid siege to the slaves on Mount Vesuvius, cutting off the only known descent from the mountain. Expecting starvation to compel the slaves to surrender, Glaber opted for a waiting strategy. Despite lacking formal military training, the forces of Spartacus demonstrated remarkable resourcefulness. Utilizing local tools and employing clever, albeit unconventional tactics against the disciplined Roman infantry. In response to Glaber's blockade, the slaves fashioned ropes and ladders from vines and trees on Vesuvius's slopes, enabling them to descend the cliffs opposite Glaber's position. They maneuvered around the mountain's base, outflanked Glaber's army, and dealt a decisive blow, annihilating his forces. Subsequently, word got back to Rome, and a second expedition, led by the praetor Publius Varinius, was dispatched to deal with Spartacus and the rebels. However, Varinius appears to have divided his forces among his subordinates, Furius and Cosinius. Though specific details regarding the strength of Varinius's forces are unclear, both contingents suffered defeat 
feet at the hands of the rebel slaves. Crocinius even fell in battle, while Verinius, well, he narrowly escaped capture, and the slaves once again seized the equipment of the defeated Roman army. Of course, back in Rome, news was spreading, and the senators and upper class people were beginning to feel more than a little nervous. These victories, of course, had the other effect of drawing more slaves and even local herdsmen and shepherds to Spartacan's forces, swelling their ranks to approximately 70,000. The winter came, and during the years of 73 to 72 BC, the rebel forces used this respite to train, arm, and equip their new recruits, extending their raiding territory to include towns like Nola, Thuri, Nuceria, and Metapontum. However, things were not all perfect. Amidst these triumphs, the rebel forces also began to face losses. You can't win them all, after all. One of their leaders, who was elected first, Oenomus, presumably perished in the battle during this period and is not mentioned in further historical accounts. By the conclusion of 73, Spartacus and Crixus found themselves at the helm of a formidable armed force, fully capable of challenging Roman armies. However, discerning their ultimate intentions poses a challenge for modern historians. Due to the lack of first-hand accounts detailing the slaves' motives and objectives during the war. Consequently, historians offer conflicting theories when interpreting the events of the rebellion. One prevailing modern interpretation suggests a factional divide among the escaped slaves with Spartacus aiming to lead his followers over the Alps to freedom, while Crixus sought to remain in southern Italy to continue raiding and plundering. This hypothesis draws support from the geographic scope of the slave raids as regions like Thuri and Metapontum, distant from Nola and Nuceria, were also targeted. Lucius Gellius's attack on Crixus and his faction, numbering around 30,000, further underscores this perceived division. Plutarch also mentioned the inclination of some slaves to plunder Italy rather than seek escape. While this factional split aligns with the available evidence, Direct proof is lacking, so let's not make up our mind about it yet. In fictional betrayals, the rebel slaves are often depicted as Roman freedom fighters, battling against a corrupt society and the institution of slavery. While this interpretation is not refuted by classical historians, no historical records explicitly state that the rebels aimed to abolish slavery in the Republic. Moreover, the actions of rebel leaders, which included numerous atrocities, 
do not appear expressly geared towards ending the practice. Even classical historians, writing shortly after the events, offer conflicting perspectives on Spartacus' motives. Some, like Apian and Florus, suggest he intended to march on Rome itself, though this may have reflected Roman anxieties rather than Spartacus's actual plans. Plutarch, however, does suggest that Spartacus primarily sought to flee northward into Cisalpine Gaul, and once there, disband his forces, seeking a quiet life in the countryside. The historical evidence does not conclusively support the notion of a homogenous slave group under Spartacus's leadership. Other slave leaders, such as Crixus, Oenormus, Gannicus, and Cassus, are mentioned, but their exact roles and relationships with Spartacus remain unclear. They could have been aides, subordinates, or even independent leaders traveling alongside Spartacus's contingent. In the spring of 72, the rebel slaves embarked on a northward journey towards Cisalpine Gaul, departing from their winter encampments. Concerned by the magnitude of the uprising and the defeat suffered by the Praetorian armies led by Glaber and Verinius, the Senate decided to dispatch two consular legions under Lucius Gellius and Claudianus. Initially, the consular forces achieved success. Gellius confronted a contingent of approximately 30,000 slaves, commanded by Crixus, near Mount Garganus, and managed to vanquish two-thirds of the rebels, including Crixus himself. From this juncture, the classical sources diverge in their accounts of subsequent events until the involvement of Marcus Licinius Crassus in the conflict. The extant histories of the war provided by Apian and Plutarch present distinct narratives. While neither version directly contradicts the other, they each focus on different events, with one account omitting certain occurrences mentioned in the other and introducing unique events exclusive to its own narrative. Apian recounts a series of strategic maneuvers following the victory of Gellius's legions over Crixus's forces near Mount Garganus. Spartacus's army, which at this time numbered around 120,000, pressed northwards towards Cisalpine Gaul, with Gellius and Lentulus seeking to block their path. In a subsequent engagement, Spartacus' forces routed Lentulus' legion and then turned to defeat Gellius' army, compelling the Roman legions to retreat. Allegedly, and it's only allegedly, Spartacus executed approximately 300 captured Roman soldiers forcing them to fight as gladiators to avenge Crixus's death. Have a taste of your own medicine, Romans. Subsequently, 
Spartacus led his followers northward, and with haste, shedding unnecessary supplies and animals to expedite their movement. After further engagements with the consular armies in Picanum, Spartacus purportedly changed his intention of marching on Rome due to his insufficiently armed force, opting instead to withdraw into southern Italy. Plutarch's narrative diverges here from Apian's account. According to Plutarch, Spartacus's forces defeated Lentulus's legion after the engagement near Mount Garganus, and then proceeded into northern Italy, where they confronted a Roman army under Gaius Cassius Longinus, around Mutina, which by the way is modern-day Modena. This resulted in a, another victory for Spartacus. Plutarch omits the engagements described by Apian, and does not mention Spartacus facing the combined consular legions in Picanum. Instead, Plutarch describes Spartacus retreating southwards from Picanum, following confrontations with Crassus suggesting a different sequence of events and motivations for Spartacus's movements. In early 71 BC, Spartacus and his followers found themselves in the southern part of Italy, prompting the Senate to appoint Crassus to suppress the rebellion completely. Crassus, known for his harsh discipline, was granted praetorship and assigned a substantial force of six brand new trained legions, bolstering his army to an estimated 32 to 48,000 troops. Employing brutal tactics, including unit decimation, Crassus instilled fear in his men, ensuring their utmost obedience and determination in battle. As Spartacus's forces moved northward once more, Crassus positioned his legions on the border of the region to interrupt their march. Plutarch suggests the initial clash occurred near the Picanum region, while Apian claims it took place near Samnium. Crassus dispatched two legions under his legate Mumius to flank Spartacus, but instructed them not to engage. Disobeying orders, Mumius attacked prematurely and suffered a defeat. See, that's what happens when you don't listen. However, Crassus himself, much more experienced and somewhat more alive than Mumius, emerged victorious. He confronted Spartacus and inflicted heavy casualties on the rebels. Following this setback, Spartacus's forces faced further defeats, as Crassus's legions proved superior in subsequent engagements. He retreated southward through Lucana towards the straits near Messina. Plutarch recounts Spartacus's failed attempt to secure passage to Sicily with Cilician pirates who ultimately betrayed him, leaving the rebel slaves stranded. Yes, indeed, the pirates just took the money and said, we're not helping you. Possibly should not have trusted the pirates to begin with. 
While the rebels attempted makeshift rafts and ships, Crassus prevented their escape to Sicily. This forced them to retreat to Regium. Upon arriving at Regium, Crassus constructed fortifications across the isthmus, effectively besieging the rebel forces and cutting them off from all supplies. Despite continued raids from Spartacus's followers, as Pompey's legions returned to Italy after quelling the rebellion in Hispania, the Senate, whether at Crassus's request or seizing an opportunity, directed Pompey to bypass Rome and head south to reinforce. Crassus. Concurrently, reinforcements under the command of Lucillus, likely Marcus Terentius Varro Lucillus, were dispatched to aid Crassus. Aware that credit for ending the conflict would go to the arriving general, Crassus pushed his legions to swiftly suppress the rebellion. Learning of Pompey's approach, Spartacus attempted negotiations with Crassus to end the conflict before Roman reinforcements arrived. When Crassus declined this request, Spartacus and his forces breached Roman fortifications and retreated up the Brutium Peninsula. All the while, pursued by Crassus's legions. During this pursuit, a portion of the rebels led by Gannicus and Castus were caught and annihilated. Despite suffering significant losses, both sides endured heavy casualties. Roman forces under Lucius Quincius were decimated when confronting a faction of rebel slaves who chose to fight to the death rather than flee. With discipline faltering among the rebels and groups breaking away to attack independently, Spartacus redirected his entire force against Crassus's legions in a final confrontation at the Battle of the Salarius River. The rebels were decisively defeated, with the majority slain on the battlefield, including Spartacus himself, although the body of Spartacus was never recovered. Creepy. The rebels of the Third Servile War were crushed by Crassus, with Pompey's forces capturing and slaying 5,000 fleeing rebels that they encountered along the way. Pompey claimed a significant portion of credit for ending the conflict. This, of course, made Crassus a little bit angry with him and caused quite a lot of attention. While most rebels perished on the battlefield, 6,000 survivors were captured. What did the Romans do with them? Well, they decided to crucify all of them. All 6,000 of them, along the roadside leading to Rome, as a grim reminder of what happens when you don't do as you're told. Both Pompey and Crassus, of course, benefited politically from their roles in quelling the rebellion, leveraging their legions to secure consulship in 70 BC. The war's impact on attitudes towards Roman slavery is, of course, 
difficult to quantify. But it did coincide with a shift in attitude on the treatment of slaves, as fear among Romans led to slightly improved conditions for slaves, albeit slightly. Additionally, the wealthy began reducing their reliance on agricultural slaves, in favor of employing freed men for sharecropping arrangements. The legal status of Roman slaves continued to evolve over time, with Emperor Claudius enacting laws recognizing mistreatment of slaves as murder and granting freedom to abandoned, old, or infirm slaves. Under Antoninus Pius, further laws extended the rights of slaves, including the ability to appeal mistreatment. While these were not direct outcomes of the Third Servile War, they do reflect the changing attitudes in society towards slavery that were definitely afoot at the time. The Third Servile War marked the end of large-scale slave uprisings in Rome, and subsequent eras saw a decline in the prominence of slavery, with those legal reforms giving a light at the end of the tunnel. We may not be at the end of the tunnel, but we're certainly at the end of this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I hope that uh, none of you out there listening are slaves. If so, I hope that the spirit of Spartacus lives within you. Thank you very much for listening. I'm the ASMR historian. It's been a pleasure. Whatever trouble you're facing in your life, whatever perplexity you're having right now, know that you can conquer it. Perhaps the odds are stacked against you. Perhaps like Spartacus, you are facing an impossible task. Well, in the spirit of the video, if you have no other choice, the best thing you can do is fight even if it is fighting to the death. I'll see you next time. Good night, everybody. In the labyrinthine corridors of ancient Rome, a formidable statesman and general emerged, shaping the destiny of the Republic with an iron will. 
Envision a time where the city's political heart, the Forum, echoed not only with the grand deliberations of the Senate, but also with the undercurrents of a man destined for unparalleled greatness. Join me this evening as we discuss the life of Lucius Cornelius Sulla. Lucius Cornelius Sulla Felix, 138 to 70 BC, commonly known simply as Sulla, was a prominent Roman general and statesman. He achieved historical significance by winning the first extensive civil war in Roman history and being the initial figure in the Republic to assume power through force. Born into a branch of the patrician gens Cornelia, he faced financial struggles as his family had fallen into poverty by the time of his birth. Despite his family's humble status, Sulla's ambitions were supported by his stepmother's considerable wealth. There are conflicting stories about his early life, including one suggesting a prophetic encounter in his infancy. Following his father's death and reaching adulthood, Sulla found himself in impoverished circumstances. He may have been disinherited, leaving him with no inheritance from mummy and daddy. What a shame. During this time, he spent his youth among Rome's entertainers, including comedians, actors, lute players, and dancers. In fact, Sulla even wrote plays and engaged in the theatrical arts, particularly Attalan farces, which was a form of crude comedy. Despite his poor financial standing, Sulla likely received a typical education for someone of his class, being well versed in ancient Greek and the Latin classics. Although considered well-read and intelligent, Sulla remained a comparatively poor man in the context of the Roman political elite. He had multiple marriages, the details of which are not extensively documented, but they included relationships with women named Elia, Julia, and Aelia. The extent of these relationships is a matter of debate. Sulla also had an affair with the Hetaira Nicopolis. The sources on how Sulla amassed the fortune that later facilitated his political rise are also not entirely clear. Plutarch mentions two inheritances, one from his stepmother and another from his mistress, Nicopolis. These financial boosts supposedly occurred around the time Sulla turned thirty years old. Upon meeting the minimum age requirement of thirty, Sulla pursued the quaestorship in 108 BC. While typically candidates needed ten years of military service, an age requirement had superseded this by Sulla's time. He was assigned by lot to serve under the consul Gaius Marius. 
The Jagartine War had erupted in 112 BC, when Jagarta, claiming the kingdom of Numidia, defied Roman decrees. Scylla played a role in the conflict under the command of Marius. Rome faced challenges with commanders being bribed or defeated. In 109 BC, Quintus Caecilius Metellus was sent to continue the war, with Marius later taking over in 107 after being elected consul. Sulla, despite his lack of military experience, was entrusted with organizing cavalry forces in Italy to pursue the mobile Numidians. Sulla's role under Marius involved capturing and garrisoning fortified positions in the African countryside. He proved to be quite popular with the men and other officers. Contributing to the defeat of the Numidians in 106 BC. After Jugurtha fled to King Bocchus I of Mauritania, Marius invaded Mauritania, and a crucial battle ensued where Sulla played an important role. Following the victory, Bocchus was forced to betray Jugurtha leading to Sulla's successful negotiations that secured Jugurtha's capture. This feat brought significant publicity to Sulla's political career, and years later, Bocchus found funded the erection of a gilded equestrian statue depicting Sulla's capture of Jugurtha. In 104 BC, the Roman Republic faced a military crisis, with the Germanic tribes Cimbri and Teutones threatening Italy. Gaius Marius, a crucial military figure, sought and won repeated consulships to deal with the threat. This, however, stirred tensions in the Senate. In response to Marius's growing influence, the traditionalists in the Senate raised Sulla, a patrician but relatively poor, as a counterweight against Marius. Marius initiated military reforms in southern Gaul with Sulla serving as his legate and successfully subduing a Gallic tribe in rebellion. Sulla was elected military tribune in the following year and served under Marius, negotiating the defection of the Marsi, part of the Germanic invaders. Despite these achievements, Sulla felt Marius was withholding opportunities from him and requested a transfer to the army led by Catullus, Marius's consular colleague. In 102, as the Germanic invaders returned, Sulla and Catullus cooperated to block their advance. Catullus's army suffered defeat in the Eastern Alps, while Marius annihilated the Teutones at the Battle of Aqua Sextiae. Sulla, in charge of supporting army provisioning, competently provided for both armies. The combined Roman forces crossed the Po River and defeated the Cimbri in the Battle of the Raudian Field. Marius and Catullus were granted triumphs for their victory. Sulla, not opting for an aedileship due to its expenses, 
ran for praetorship in 99, but was defeated. The people were skeptical of his military bravado as a junior officer, and his association with the wealthy Bocus led to rejection. Unfazed by this, Sulla ran again for the praetorship in 97, promising to fund impressive shows. Elected as praetor, he was assigned the urban praetorship by lot. Sulla's term as praetor was relatively uneventful, marked by a public dispute with Strabo, possibly his brother-in-law. In 96 BC, he was assigned, likely as proconsul, to govern Cilicia in Asia Minor. While in Cilicia, the Senate asked, tasked him rather, with restoring Ario Barzanes to the throne of Cappadocia, which had earlier been usurped by Mithridates the Sixth of Pontus. Despite initial challenges, Sulla succeeded with minimal resources, swiftly levying allied soldiers and defeating superior enemy forces. Sulla's campaign brought him to the Euphrates, where he met the first Parthian ambassador in Roman history. Positioned strategically between the Parthian ambassador and Ario Barzanes, Sulla sought to assert Roman superiority. Although the Parthian ambassador, Orobazus, was executed upon his return to Parthia for this perceived humiliation, the Parthians ratified the treaty, establishing the Euphrates as the boundary between Parthia and Rome. During this meeting, a Chaldean seer prophesied Sulla's death at the height of his fame and fortune. This prophecy continued to haunt Sulla throughout the rest of his life. In 94, Sulla repelled the forces of Tigranes the Great of Armenia from Cappadocia. He likely stayed in the east until 92, when he returned to Rome. Despite his successes in the east, Sulla faced legal challenges upon his return. Accused of extorting Ario Barzanes, Sulla was brought to trial. Despite the prosecutor's absence on the trial day, leading to Sulla's victory by default, his political ambitions suffered a setback. In the years leading up to 91, relations between Rome and its allies the Socii had deteriorated. Tensions escalated due to the displacement of Italian communities from Roman public lands, the failure of various proconsuls to grant Roman citizenship to the allies and the assassination of pro-Italian plebeian tribune Marcus Livius Drusus in 91 BC. The Italians, seeking Roman citizenship and influenced by the Cimbric War and Roman extension of corruption laws, began a widespread revolt. In 91, Sulla who had been involved in Roman politics and military campaigns in the East, found his political ambitions temporarily overshadowed by the outbreak of the Social War. The conflict had two main theatres, a northern theatre from Picenum to Fukin Lake, 
and a southern theatre, including Samnium. Sulla served as one of the legatees in the southern theatre, under the consul of Lucius Julius Caesar. The Roman strategy, in the first year of the war, focused on containment, attempting to prevent the rebellion from spreading into Roman-controlled territory. Sulla, operating defensively in southern Italy, cooperated with Marius in the northern part of the southern theatre, defeating the Marsi tribe. Despite their efforts, they could not relieve the siege of the city of Acernia. In 89, Sulla continued his military service as legate under the consul Lucius Porcius Cato. After Cato's death, Sulla was perused into proconsulate and given supreme command of the southern theatre. He achieved significant victories, capturing Pompeii, Stabiae, and Aeclanum. His successes against the Samnites and the capture of Boivianum undicaronanum marked a turning point. Political developments in Rome including the passage of the Lex Julia and Lex Plautia Piperia, which granted citizenship to loyal allies, contributed to the end of the war. With victories across Italy and the support of traditional enemies, the Samnites, Sulla easily won the consulship in 88, signalling a significant shift in his political fortunes. Sulla's election to the consulship, likely influenced by his military successes in the social war, was not without challenges. Strabo, a long-time enemy of Sulla, contested the top job. Strabo may have stood for office due to deteriorating relations with King Mithridates VI of Pontus, anticipating a lucrative and glorious command against Pontus. After his election, Sulla married his daughter to one of his colleagues, Pompeius Rufus's sons. He divorced his then wife, Cloelia, and married Metella, widow of the recently deceased Marcus Scaurus. These marriages strengthened political alliances with the influential Caeceliae Matelli and the Pompeys. Sulla, with the support of his consular colleague Quintus Pompeius Rufus, was assigned the Mithridatic command by the Senate. He became involved in a political conflict with the plebeian tribune Sculpius Rufus, regarding the distribution of new Italian citizens into Roman tribes for voting. Sulla and Pompeius Rufus opposed the bill, leading to Sulpicia seeking political allies elsewhere. Sulpicia made a deal with Marius, who supported the Italian legislation in exchange for a law transferring Sulla's command to Marius. The conflict escalated into violent urban confrontations, with Sulla taking refuge in Marius's house. Marius arranged for Sulla to lift the suspension of public business, and Sulpicius forced the consuls to flee. Sulla, in a weak position, received very little in return, and he left for Capua before joining an army near Nola in southern Italy. Sulla may have believed that victory in the Mithridatic command 
was essential to recovering his career after this political setback. Sulpicius, able to enact legislation without consular opposition, revealed his deceit by introducing a law transferring the command against Mithridates to Marius. Faced with humiliation, the end of his political career, and potential danger to his life, Sulla made a very difficult choice. Hesitation, if any, may have stemmed from uncertainty about how his army would react. Addressing his troops, Sulla complained about Marius and Sulpicius, hinting that Marius would find others to fight Mithridates. Denying the soldiers opportunity for plunder in the east. The troops were initially willing to follow Sulla to Rome, but his officers, except for the quaestor Lucullus, realized his intentions and deserted him. They killed Marcus Gratidius, one of Marius's legates, during an attempt to transfer command. As the march on Rome began, the Senate and the people were shocked. The Senate sent an embassy demanding an explanation, and Sulla boldly responded that he was freeing Rome from tyrants. Entering the city without defending troops, Sulla faced hostility from common people who threw stones and tiles off their roofs at him. Almost breaking before Marius's makeshift forces, Sulla stationed troops across the city, summoned the Senate, and induced it to outlaw Marius. Marius's son, Sulpicius, and nine others. He retroactively justified his illegal march through legislation stripping the twelve outlaws of Roman citizenship. Sulpicius, betrayed by a slave, was the only one killed. Marius, his son, and the others escaped to Africa. Sulla responded by having Sulpicius's legislation invalidated arguing that it was enacted by force. According to Apian, Sulla then introduced legislation to strengthen the Senate's position and weaken plebeian tribunes. Eliminating the Comitia Tributa as a legislative body and requiring tribunes to obtain senatorial approval for legislation. Some scholars, however, question Apian's account, considering it a later interpretation of laws enacted during Sulla's dictatorship. After these political moves, Sulla sent his army back to Capua and conducted elections for the year, resulting in a resounding rejection of him and his allies. His rival, Lucius Cornelius Cinna, was elected for consul in 87 BC, instead of Sulla's candidate. Cinna, even before the election, declared his intent to prosecute Sulla at the end of his consular term. Sulla was undeterred and he compelled the consuls designate to swear allegiance to his laws. He attempted to transfer the command of Gnaeus Pompey's Strabo's army to his consular colleague, but the law was vetoed by a tribune. Quintus Pompeius Rufus, attempting to take command under the Senate's authority, was assassinated likely on Pompey Strabo's orders. Sulla promptly left Italy with his troops, 
ignoring legal summons, and assumed command in Macedonia. His use of military force against fellow Romans marked a continuation of the political violence that had categorized his social war. In Sulla's absence, Rome experienced further turmoil. Cinna and his co-counsel, Gnaeus Octavius, had a violent confrontation. Octavius induced the Senate to outlaw Cinna, leading Cinna to subon the army besieging Nola and incite another Italian uprising. Marius, aligning with Cinna, helped raise troops. By the end of 97 BC, Cinna and Marius besieged and captured Rome, killing consul Gnaeus Octavius, massacring political opponents, declaring Sulla an outlaw, and securing their election as consuls for 86 BC. In 89 BC, during the aftermath of the Social War, Mithridates VI of Pontus invaded Roman Asia. The Romans, facing financial strain and delays in preparing for war, declared war in response to Mithridates' conquests. The conflict was further complicated by a revolt in Athens against Roman rule. Aristion, a prominent Athenian politician, established a tyranny over the city, leading to joint Athenian and Pontic invasions. Mithridates orchestrated the massacre of around 80,000 Roman and Italian expatriates and their families in an event known as the Asiatic Vespers, while confiscating their properties. Rome, in the midst of preparations, took approximately 18 months for Sulla to organize five legions before he finally set off to war. Despite all of these setbacks, Rome successfully defended Macedonia against joint Athenian and Pontic forces, holding the territory under the governance of proprietor Gaius Sentius and his legatee Quintus Brutius Sura. The conflict with Mithridates would escalate further, marking a challenging period for the Roman Republic. In 87, Sulla crossed the Adriatic to Thessaly with his legions. Upon arrival, he ordered his quaestor Lucullus to retreat back into Macedonia, countering Mithridates' advances into Greece. Sulla besieged Athens and Piraeus, eventually capturing Athens, excluding the Acropolis, in March 86 BC. The city, spared total destruction, was sacked, and Sulla secured resources even by sacking temples. During the summer of 86 BC, major battles occurred in Boeotia. The Battle of Caronea and the later Battle of Orchimenus saw Pontic casualties exaggerated in sources, while Sulla's report of minimal losses is deemed rather incredible. After Caronea, Sulla learned that Lucius Valerius Flaccus, sent by Cena's government, aimed to take over his command. Sulla declared an outlaw, intercepted Flaccus in Thessaly, but turned back due to Pontic forces in Boeotia. Moving south, Sulla engaged the Pontic army of allegedly 90,000 at Orchimenos. 
His troops dug trenches to contain Pontic cavalry, and Sulla rallied his men when the Romans almost broke. The Roman forces surrounded and annihilated the Pontic army, capturing its camp. Archelaus, the Pontic general, escaped to Chalcis. These victories further solidified Sulla's military success in the Mithridatic Wars. After the Battle of Orchomenos, Sulla and the Pontic general Archelaus began to negotiate peace terms. Mithridates, facing local uprisings and naval threats, had no choice but to accept the terms including returning territories to Rome. Recognizing Nicomedes and Ariobarzanes as kings and paying war reparations. In Asia, Flaccus's army, led by his legate Fimbria, marched towards Thrace. Fimbria took command, killed Flaccus, and pursued Mithridates. In Asia, facing pressure from Fimbria's army and Lucius's fleet, Mithridates met Sulla at Dardanus in 85 and accepted all terms. Sulla then advanced on Fimbria, whose forces deserted him. Fimbria took his own life after a failed attempt on Sulla's life. Sulla remained in Asia until around 84 BC, settling various matters and finally sailing for Italy with 1,200 ships. His peace with Mithridates faced criticism for prioritizing his personal interests over that of Rome's, as it delayed victory in the Mithridatic Wars. While modern views recognize the complexity of the situation, some still argue Sulla was more concerned with personal revenge in Italy than dealing with Mithridates. The extra time in Asia provided him with additional forces and resources for future use in Italy. In the spring of 83 BC, Sulla crossed the Adriatic to Brundisium with Mithridatic veteran legions, gaining support from various factions including Crassus, Pompey and former enemies. However, the sentiment in Italy was largely against Sulla, prompting the Senate to declare a state of emergency and levy forces against him. Sulla's rapid advance was fueled by his previous wealth from looting in Asia. His strategic maneuvers involved defeating Norbanus and negotiating with Scipio, ultimately causing Scipio's forces to defect. Meanwhile, Pompey and Crassus secured additional support for Sulla. The year 82 BC saw consular elections returning Carbo and the younger Marius. Sertorius left for Hispania due to his strained relationship with the consuls. In 82, Sulla faced opposition in two theatres the younger Marius in the south, and Metellus Pius against Carbo in the north. The Battle of Scarpatortus resulted in Marius's defeat, followed by a massacre of Samnite captives and a subsequent uprising. Sulla then moved towards Rome, which opened its gates to him. The Senate was urged of suspected Sullen sympathizers, and Sulla was left to confront Carbo in Etruria. 
Sulla defeated Carbo in an indecisive battle at Clusium. Pompey ambushed legions attempting to relieve Praeneste, but Sulla had to deploy south to counter Samnite uprisings. Norbanus was defeated in the north, and Carbo attempted to retreat to Africa. The Battle of Colline Gate ensued on November 1st, 82 BC, with Sulla initially forced to retreat. However, Crassus secured victory on the right wing, and Sulla's forces ultimately triumphed, marking the end of the civil war in Italy. After the Battle of the Colline Gate, Sulla convened the Senate and gave a speech at the Temple of Bellona, during which he ordered the massacre of around three to four thousand Samnite prisoners. He then proceeded to end the siege of Praeneste, where the younger Marius took his own life. Sulla then arranged for his stepdaughter, Emilia, to marry Pompey. But she unfortunately died in childbirth. Pompey was then sent to recover Sicily, and with the capture and execution of Carbo, both consuls for 82 were now dead. In control of the city, Sulla initiated a ruthless prescription, targeting those he deemed enemies of the state. He proscribed 80 persons initially, and then added an additional 220, with the purge lasting several months. The proscriptions were viewed as a retaliation for similar actions by Marius and Cinna while Sulla was away. Approximately 1,500 nobles were executed, and an estimated 9,000 people lost their lives. The majority were killed for their property, which was confiscated and auctioned. Helping or sheltering proscribed individuals became punishable by death, while killing them, well, that would get you a nice little reward. Family members were not spared, and slaves were not exempt from rewards either. So you may imagine if your master, for lack of better words, was proscribed by Sulla, you would get your freedom and a nice little cash bonus. Maybe they'd be adding something extra into the master's food this evening. Sulla barred the sons and grandsons of the proscribed from political office for the next 30 years. Gaius Julius Caesar as Cena's son-in-law, became a target. He fled the city, but was spared through the efforts of his relatives, who were Sulla's supporters. Sulla later expressed regret in his memoirs for sparing Caesar's life, predicting the young man's future ambition, stating, In this Caesar, there are many Mariuses. In 82, or the beginning of 81, the Senate appointed Sulla as dictator for making of laws and for the settling of the constitution. This appointment, with no time limit, granted Sulla total control over Rome and the Republic, except for Hispania which Quintus Sertorius had established at the time as an independent state. Sulla's dictatorship set a precedent for later figures, like Julius Caesar, 
and marked a significant departure from Rome's tradition of avoiding concentrated power in a single person. As an optimate, Sulla sought to strengthen the aristocracy of the Senate. He implemented reforms to curb the power of the tribunes, removing their ability to initiate legislation and revoking their power to veto Senate acts. Sulla also limited the political influence of ex-tribunes, prohibiting them from holding any other office. He increased the number of magistrates elected each year and required all newly elected quaestors to become automatic Senate members. These changes allowed Sulla to expand the Senate from 300 to 600 members. Additionally, Sulla transferred control of the courts from the equites to the senators, once more solidifying the Senate's authority. He also codified the cursus honorum, specifying the age and experience required for various officers. To prevent future generals from seizing power, he reaffirmed the ten-year waiting period for re-election. Sulla also redefined maestas, laws, and reformed the Senate, looking to both the past and the future. During his second consulship in 80 BC, Sulla resigned from his dictatorship, disbanded his legions, dismissed his lictors, and walked unguarded in the forum, symbolizing the return to normal consular government. This gesture was meant to show accountability to the citizens. However, Julius Caesar later mocked Sulla for this act, considering it arrogant. After completing all of his tasks, Sulla kept his promise and relinquished his powers. He retired to his country villa near Puteoli to spend time with his family. According to Plutarch, Sulla's retirement was characterized by a life of dissolute luxury, where he associated with actresses, harpists, and theatrical people, spending his days drinking with them on couches, just like when he was a young lad. Although he remained somewhat detached from day-to-day -day politics in Rome, he occasionally intervened in matters related to his policies. Sulla focused on writing his memoirs, completing them in 78 BC, just before his death. While most of these memoirs are lost, fragments have been preserved as quotations in later writings. Accounts of Sulla's death suggest that he succumbed to liver failure, or perhaps a ruptured gastric ulcer, potentially caused by his chronic alcohol abuse. Some sources mention an infestation of worms due to ulcers contributing to his demise. Oof, that doesn't sound good. Sulla's public funeral, held in the Forum of Rome, rivaled only by Augustus's funeral in AD 14, demonstrated the scale of his influence. His body, accompanied by veteran soldiers, was brought into the city on a golden platform, and prominent senators delivered funeral orations. The main oration was likely given by Lucius Marcius Philippus, or perhaps Hortensius. Sulla's cremated remains were placed in his tomb in the Campus Martius. On the tomb, 
an epitaph composed by Sulla himself declared, No friend ever served me, and no enemy ever wronged me, whom I have not repaid in full. Plutarch also mentions seeing Sulla's personal motto, No better friend, no worse enemy, carved on the tomb. Well, that's a nice motto, I think. No friend who ever served me, no enemy who ever wronged me, whom I have not repaid in full. I suppose it's an ancient version of champagne for my real friends, real pain for my sham friends. Well, on that note, everybody, I'd like to thank you again for joining me. It's once again been a pleasure to have you here with me as we discuss our ancient past. I am the ASMR historian, asking you humbly to like and subscribe. And more importantly, sleep well. Good night, everybody. See you next time. The Punic Wars A Clash of Titans Rome and Carthage each vying for supremacy in the Mediterranean. These conflicts were not mere battles for territory, but epic struggles for dominance that reshaped the course of what we know as Western civilization. From the daring exploits of Hannibal crossing the Alps to the naval showdowns in the waters of Sicily, the Punic Wars are steeped in intrigue, betrayal, and strategic brilliance. So join me now, as we journey through a tumultuous saga, where empires rise and fall, and the fate of nations hang in the balance. It's going to be a long video, so get yourself comfortable. But I suppose all of the videos are long on this channel. Well, without further ado, let's begin. First, a brief introduction. What are the Punic Wars? The Punic Wars were a sequence of conflicts spanning from 264 to 146 BC, pitting Rome against Carthage. These wars encompassed three major engagements across the western Mediterranean, comprising extensive land and naval battles over a period of 43 years. Additionally, the uprising against Carthage, lasting four years starting in 241 is often regarded as part of the broader context of the wars. These conflicts resulted in significant casualties and material losses for both Rome and Carthage. So how did it all begin? Well, let's go right back to the start, to the prelude to the conflicts. The Roman Republic had been aggressively expanding its territory in southern Italy for around a century before the outbreak of the First Punic War. By 270 BC, Rome had conquered the southern Italian peninsula up to the Arno River following its victory in the Pyrrhic War against the Greek cities of Magna Graecia. Meanwhile, Carthage, centred in present-day Tunisia, 
had established firm dominance over southern Iberia, coastal North Africa, the Balearic Islands, Corsica, Sardinia, and the western part of Sicily, exerting maritime control over all of these regions. Starting from 480 BC, Carthage engaged in a series of inconclusive conflicts against the Greek city-states of Sicily, particularly Syracuse. By 264, Carthage had emerged as the dominant power on the island. While both Carthage and Rome were the leading forces in the western Mediterranean, despite occasional tensions, the two states had maintained more or less friendly relations with each other, formalizing their alliances in 509 BC, 348, and around 279. They also fostered strong commercial ties, being the two largest powers in the area. During the Pyrrhic War of 280 to 275, Carthage had provided support to Rome against King Pyrrhus of Epirus, who challenged Rome in Italy and Carthage in Sicily. However, Rome's expansionist policies in southern Italy clashed with Carthage's proprietary interests in the region. This conflicting approach to territorial control led to tensions between the two powers, and ultimately led to war in 264 BC. The immediate trigger for this conflict was the dispute over control of the independent Sicilian city-state of Messana, known in our modern day as Messina. In 264, hostilities erupted between Carthage and Rome, marking the beginning of the First Punic War. So just to quickly recap, it was more of a dispute about territories and the uh, control of the city-state Messana. An agreement could not be struck between the two powers, thus providing a pretext to the conflict. So first, let's understand how the armies were composed. In the Roman army, most male citizens were obligated to serve as infantry, with a minority contributing to the cavalry component. Typically, Roman legions comprised around 4,200 infantry and 300 cavalry. A portion of the infantry served as javelin-armed skirmishers called velites, while the remainder formed heavy infantry, equipped with body armor, shields, and short swords. Legionaries were organized into three ranks, with the front rank also carrying javelins. Usually they would throw their javelin first, then meet a frontal assault with their short swords. The Roman military hierarchy included consuls who led armies during wartime, and allied legions often supplemented Roman forces with additional cavalry. In contrast, Carthaginian citizens served in the army only in times of direct threat to Carthage itself. Carthaginian armies relied heavily on foreign recruits, including close-order infantry, javelin-armed skirmishers, shock cavalry, and light cavalry from North Africa, Iberia, and Gaul. 
Of course, we couldn't go past Carthage without mentioning that war elephants were also employed, sourced from indigenous African forests. Garrison duty and land blockades were common operations, and surprise attacks and ambushes were frequently employed during campaigns. Formal battles were preceded by days or weeks of camping, with infantry typically positioned in the center and cavalry on the flanks. Many battles were decided by attacks on the flanks or rear, leading to partial or complete envelopment of one side's forces. And now for the naval structure. Quinquiremes, named for their five oarsmen configuration, were the backbone of both Roman and Carthaginian naval forces throughout the Punic Wars. This type of vessel was so prevalent that Polybius often referred to it as a generic term for warship. Each quinquereme boasted a crew of 300 individuals, including 280 oarsmen, 20 deck crew and officers. Additionally, it typically carried around 40 marines, although this number could swell to as many as 120 if there were an imminent battle. In 260 BC, the Romans embarked on constructing their fleet. Now at the time, they weren't entirely sure how to uh, construct a good warship, but they got rather lucky. Well, they were down at the coast one day, and they discovered a shipwrecked Carthaginian quinquireme. So they used that as a model. Now, however, due to their lack of shipbuilding experience, well, the creation of vessels were heavier than those of Carthage, and this of course resulted in slower and less maneuverable ships. Not a good problem to have. Achieving coordination among the oarsmen for unified rowing and complex battle maneuvers demanded extensive and vigorous training. At least half of the oarsmen needed prior experience for effective ship handling. Consequently, the Romans faced initial disadvantages against the more seasoned Carthaginians. To address this, they introduced the Corvus, a 1.2 meter wide and 11 meter long bridge with a heavy spike underneath. This innovation enabled Roman legionaries, serving as marines, to board enemy ships and capture them, diverging from the conventional tactic of simply ramming into the ship and hopefully breaking it in half. Speaking of rams, during the Punic Wars, all warships were outfitted with them, featuring a triple set of 60-centimeter-wide bronze blades, which weighed up to 270 kilograms, strategically positioned at the waterline. In the century preceding these wars, boarding tactics had become prevalent, while ramming had somewhat declined. This shift had occurred as larger and heavier vessels, prevalent during this period, lacked the necessary speed and maneuverability to make ramming an effective option. Additionally, their sturdier construction reduced the impact of a ram attack, even if it managed to be successful. 
the Roman innovation of the Corvus continued this trend, compensating for their initial deficiency in ship maneuvering skills. However, the Corvus' additional weight in the prow compromised both the ship's maneuverability and its seaworthiness. Moreover, in rough sea conditions, the Corvus became impractical, leading the Romans to discontinue its use midway through the First Punic War. So, on to the war itself. Much of the First Punic War unfolded on, or at least near, the waters of Sicily. The island's hilly and rugged terrain made manoeuvring large forces somewhat challenging, favoring defensive strategies. Land operations primarily involved raids, sieges, and interdiction, with only two full-scale pitched battles occurring during the 23-year conflict on Sicily. The war commenced with the Romans establishing a foothold at Massana in 264. They coerced Syracuse, the island's major independent power, into an alliance and besieged Carthage's primary base at Acragas on the south coast. In 262 BC, a Carthaginian force attempted to lift the siege, but suffered a significant defeat at the Battle of Acragas. Subsequently, the Romans quickly captured the city, selling a large portion of its population into slavery. I'm sure they were thrilled about that. Following this victory, the land war on Sicily reached a stalemate, as the Carthaginians concentrated on defending their fortified towns and cities along the coast. This defensive posture allowed them to be supplied and reinforced without significant interference from the Romans. Consequently, the focus shifted to naval warfare, an area where the Romans at this time lacked experience. However, they rapidly built a navy to challenge Carthage's maritime dominance, Utilizing innovations like the aforementioned Corvus, the Romans secured a significant victory at the Battle of Mylae in 260. Subsequent engagements included the seizure of a Carthaginian base in Corsica. Although an attempted assault on Sardinia was repelled, Exploiting these naval victories, the Romans launched an invasion on North Africa in 256, intercepted by the Carthaginians at the Battle of Cake Echnomus off Sicily's southern coast. Despite the Carthaginians' superior seamanship, the Romans gained an advantage with the Corvus, turning the battle into a chaotic melee. Of course, the Carthaginians were thinking at this time, well, if we can just fight them on the sea, we'll mop the floor with them. Well, they didn't think they would uh, be standing on the decks of their very ships fighting the Romans, sword to sword, shield to shield. It did not work out as planned. The Carthaginians suffered another defeat possibly the largest naval battle in history in terms of combatants involved. Following this, the Carthaginians initially sought peace in 255, but after the terms were way too one-sided, they decided they had no choice but continue to resist. 
however, the Battle of Tunis in the spring of 255, a combined Carthaginian force under Xanthippus, a Spartan mercenary, managed to crush the Romans. The Romans, attempting to evacuate their survivors, faced further defeat at the Battle of Cape Hermaeum, as their fleet was heavily routed. Moreover, a storm devastated the return Ro Roman fleet to Italy, resulting in significant losses, possibly exacerbated by the unseaworthy nature of their ships due to putting all of their effort into the Corvus rather than the ships themselves. Now, despite all of these setbacks, neither side could really secure a decisive advantage. Therefore, the war persisted, marked by numerous battles and sieges, including the recapture and subsequent destruction of Acragas by the Carthaginians in 255. However, the Romans rapidly rebuilt their fleet and captured Panormus, modern-day Palermo, in 254. Over the following years, both sides engaged in skirmishes and strategic maneuvers across Sicily, with the Romans gradually gaining control of the island. In 250 BC, the Romans confronted the Carthaginians at Panormus, effectively countering their use of war elephants and achieving victory. As the Romans continued to advance, they besieged Lilibaeum and Drapana, the last Carthaginian strongholds remaining in Sicily. Despite facing intense resistance, including a defeat at the Battle of Drapana, the Romans persisted in their siege of Lilibaeum for nine years. The turning point had to eventually come, and it did, in 243, when the Romans, financially strained yet very determined, rebuilt their fleet and blockaded Carthaginian garrisons. Carthage attempted to relieve their troops, but suffered a decisive defeat at the Battle of the Agates Islands in 241. This victory was the final straw, and it forced Carthage to negotiate for peace somewhat reluctantly resulting in the Treaty of Lutatius. Carthage was forced to pay reparations, and Sicily was annexed, becoming a Roman province. Well, of course, this was the final nail in the coffin for the First Punic War. Polybius described it as one of the longest, most fiercely contested wars in history cementing Rome's dominance in the western Mediterranean and laying the foundation for its maritime power for centuries to come. But, of course, war never changes, and it never ends. The mercenary or truceless war erupted a few years later, in 241, over a dispute regarding the payment of wages owed to 20,000 foreign soldiers who had fought for Carthage during the First Punic Wars. It seems that Carthage had neglected to pay its bills. Led by Spendius and Matho, the mutiny escalated into a full-scale rebellion, attracting 70,000 Africans from Carthage's dependent territories 
who provided support and resources. Well, initially, Carthage struggled in the face of the rebellion, particularly under the leadership of General Hanno. Well, it couldn't all be bad luck for the Carthaginians. Things had to turn around, right? Well, they did. With Hamilcar Barco, the father of a very famous character in this story, which we'll get to somewhat later. In 240 BC, he was a seasoned veteran of the Sicilian campaigns, and he assumed joint command of the Carthaginian army, and later supreme command in 239. Well, his first job, and indeed a tall order, was crushing this rebellion. Employing a combination of military strategy and leniency, Hamilcar attempted to quell the rebellion. However, after Spendius brutally tortured 700 Carthaginian prisoners to death, the conflict intensified with unprecedented ferocity. That whole strategy of leniency, well, they weren't doing that anymore. Despite initial setbacks, by early 237, Carthage had regained control over the rebel-held cities. An expedition was organized to retake Sardinia, where mutinous soldiers had massacred all of the Carthaginians. However, the Roman Senate viewed this as an act of aggression, and demanded Carthage cede Sardinia and Corsica, along with paying a hefty fine, of course. Weakened by three decades of war, Carthage reluctantly agreed to avoid further conflict with Rome. This episode, characterized by Roman opportunism and disregard for existing treaties, of course sowed deep resentment in Carthage. The breach of the treaty signed just years earlier became a significant grievance, ultimately leading to renewed hostilities in 218, with the outbreak of the Second Punic War. It seems very obvious that Rome's actions were somewhat unjust and the key factor in this resurgence of conflict with Carthage. You must feel sorry for them a little bit. Well, after quelling the rebellion, Hamilcar Barker recognized the urgent need for Carthage to bolster its economic and military capabilities in preparation for future conflicts with Rome. He knew that it was coming. Following the First Punic War, Carthaginian territories in Iberia were limited to a few prosperous coastal cities in the south. In 237, Hamilcar led the Carthaginian army to Iberia, where he established a quasi-monarchical autonomous state in the southeast of the region. This move provided Carthage with access to valuable silver mines, agricultural resources, manpower, military infrastructure such as shipyards, and territorial depth, positioning it to confront Rome with a much greater confidence. Hamilcar governed this new territory as viceroy until his death after which his son-in-law Hasdrubal assumed leadership in the early 220s, followed by his son Hannibal in 221, and I'm sure you've heard of him. In 
226, the Ebro Treaty was negotiated with Rome, delineating the Ebro River as the northern boundary of Carthaginian influence. However, it wasn't all fun and games. Tensions escalated when Rome entered into a separate agreement with the city of Saguntum, located south of the Ebro River, sometime within the following six years. This move by Rome undermined the terms of the Ebro Treaty, and contributed to the escalating conflict between Carthage and Rome, which ultimately culminated in the outbreak of the Second Punic War. In 219, Hannibal led a Carthaginian army to besiege, capture, and sack the city of Saguntum, an act that directly violated the terms of the already broken Ebro Treaty and prompted Rome to declare war on Carthage in the spring of 218. This declaration marked the beginning of the Second Punic War in official status. The war unfolded across three primary theatres, the first being Italy, which saw Hannibal's audacious campaign, during which he repeatedly defeated the Roman legions in a series of battles showcasing his tactical genius and strategic acumen, and also giving the Romans nightmares for some generations after. While Hannibal's main focus was on Italy, there was also occasional subsidiary campaigns in regions such as Sicily, Sardinia, and Greece. In Iberia, modern-day Spain, Hannibal's younger brother, Hasdrubal, defended Carthaginian colonial cities against Roman incursions. Hasdrubal's efforts met with mixed success, until he eventually decided to move his forces into Italy to reinforce Hannibal. The decisive phase of the war took place in Africa where Rome sought to confront Carthage directly. It was in this theatre that the fate of the conflict would ultimately be decided. These three theatres formed the backdrop for a protracted and brutal struggle between Rome and Carthage, each vying for supremacy in the Mediterranean world. 218 BC, Hannibal crosses the Alps. Well, in 218 BC, several significant events unfolded across different regions, setting the stage for an escalating conflict. Naval skirmishes occurred around Sicily, with the Romans successfully repelling a Carthaginian attack and seizing control of the island of Malta. Meanwhile, major Gallic tribes launched attacks on Roman colonies in Cisalpine Gaul, prompting Roman settlers to seek refuge in the established colony of Mutina, modern-day Modena. The settlers were besieged there, leading to a Roman relief force breaking through the siege but subsequently getting ambushed and besieged themselves. The Roman army, designated for a campaign in Iberia, had one Roman and one allied legion detached from it to deal with the situation in northern Italy. The delay in raising fresh troops for this campaign postponed the army's departure until September. Meanwhile, Hannibal assembled a Carthaginian army in New Carthage, modern-day Cartagena, in Iberia. 
and embarked on a daring march northward along the coast. He crossed the Rhone River and defeated local Gauls, who attempted to obstruct his path. They did not get very far. Despite Roman efforts to intercept him, Hannibal managed to evade them and continued his advance into Gaul. By late autumn, Hannibal's forces reached the Alps, where they encountered harsh weather, treacherous terrain, and more resistance from native tribes. Now despite these challenges, Hannibal successfully crossed the Alps in only fifteen days, arriving in northern Italy with a formidable army that included infantry, cavalry, and a comparatively small number of surviving elephants from his previous Iberian campaign. It is indeed hard to get elephants across the snowy mountains. Hannibal's unexpected arrival in northern Italy caught the Romans quite off guard and forced them to abandon their planned invasion of Africa for the year, redirecting their focus to confronting the Carthaginian threat that was now on their very doorstep. In the late November of 218, the Carthaginian cavalry routed the Roman cavalry and light infantry at the Battle of Ticinus, following which most of the Gallic tribes declared support for Hannibal's cause. I think they probably wanted to be on the winning side. This, of course, bolstered Hannibal's army to a formidable force of 37,000 men. Subsequently, a large Roman army was drawn into battle by Hannibal at the Trebia, where it suffered a devastating defeat. Hannibal's victory led to a surge in Gauls joining his ranks. They just kept on coming. Perhaps even in these early days the Romans had left quite a bitter taste in the mouth of the Gauls. To block Hannibal's advance into central Italy, the Romans stationed armies at strategic locations, including Aretium and the Adriatic coast. However, in early spring of 217, Hannibal managed to cross the Apennines unopposed and drew the Roman army under Gaius Flaminius into an ambush at Lake Trasimene. In this battle, he inflicted a severe blow to the Romans, killing thousands, capturing many more, including the consul himself, Gaius Flaminius. Well, there was quite an uproar in the Senate about this. How dare they defeat us? We're meant to be the ones who win the battles. So following these defeats, the Romans decided to appoint Quintus Fabius as a dictator, entrusting him with the war effort. Fabius adopted a cautious strategy, known as the Fabian strategy, which involved avoiding direct confrontation with Hannibal's forces and instead engaging in small-scale skirmishes. Despite criticism from some quarters, Fabius persisted with this approach, aiming to wear down Hannibal's forces over time. In the subsequent elections of 216, Gaius Varro and Lucius Paulus, more aggressive-minded leaders, were elected as the new consuls. The Roman Senate authorized the raising of a massive army of 86,000 men, the largest in Roman history up to that point. Certainly, 
dealing with a national crisis. Paulus and Varro marched southward to confront Hannibal, leading to the fateful encounter at Cannae. And fateful indeed it was, but not for the Carthaginians. At the Battle of Cannae, despite initially breaking through Hannibal's center, the Roman legions found themselves surrounded as Hannibal's forces executed a brilliant maneuver. The Carthaginian cavalry, led by Hasdrubal, sealed the Roman fate by attacking their flanks and rear. They were completely surrounded, and they were all killed. They suffered catastrophic losses, and those who weren't killed were captured. All in all, it's estimated to be about 67,000. Very difficult to come back from that. Cane marked a significant turning point in the war, widely regarded as Rome's greatest military disaster and it left the city of Rome itself very vulnerable, with subsequent defeats further weakening its position, people were starting to get a little nervous. Fabius, recognized for his cautious strategy, was re-elected consul in the following years as Rome struggled to recover from the devastating losses suffered at Cannae and other battles. After the Battle of Cannae, Polybius's account of Hannibal's army in Italy becomes sparse, and Livy emerges as the primary surviving source for this phase of the war. Southern Italy witnessed a series of alliances and betrayals, with several city-states siding with Hannibal, or fa falling, rather, to pro-Carthaginian factions. Notable among these were Capua and Tarentum, along with two major Samnite tribes. By 214, much of southern Italy had turned against Rome, although some exceptions did exist, and central Italy's majority remained loyal. The formidable fortifications of most cities made direct assaults impractical, and blockade, particularly of port cities, often proved futile. Carthage's new allies lacked a strong sense of unity with Carthage or each other, adding to Hannibal's challenges in defending various fronts. In 215, the port city of Locri's defection to Carthage provided a significant boost to Hannibal's forces, marking the only instance during the war that Carthage reinforced him directly. Another intended reinforcement under Hannibal's brother Margo was diverted to Iberia following Carthaginian setbacks there. Meanwhile, Rome resorted to drastic measures to bolster its legions, including enlisting slaves, criminals, and individuals not meeting the usual property qualifications. By 213, Rome had fielded over 22 legions, totaling over 100,000 men, supplemented by Allied troops. Although unable to engage Hannibal in open battle with such forces, Rome's numbers forced him to concentrate his troops, limiting his movements. 
Over the next twelve years, post Calais, the war in southern Italy oscillated as cities shifted allegiances or fell to subterfuge, with the Romans retaking them through sieges or by manipulating the pro-Roman factions within. Despite Hannibal's repeated victories, Roman threats and successes in various regions gradually confined him to the extreme south by 207, leading to the return of several cities and territories to Roman control. In 216, Macedonian King Philip V pledged his support to Hannibal, triggering the First Macedonian War against Rome in the following year. Rome countered this threat by allying with the Aetolian League, a coalition of Greek city-states already at odds with Macedonia. By 205, however, this conflict was resolved through a negotiated peace. A rebellion in favor of Carthage erupted on Sardinia in 213 BC, but was swiftly quelled by the Roman garrison within. Until 215, Sicily remained firmly under Roman control, impeding Hannibal's access to sea reinforcement and resupply from Carthage. However, Hiero II, Syracuse's long-standing tyrant and a staunch Roman ally, died that year. His successor, Hieronymus, discontented with his position, brokered a treaty with Hannibal, defecting Syracuse to Carthage in exchange for control over all of Sicily. Roman forces led by Claudius Marcellus besieged Syracuse in the spring of 213. This siege was notable for Archimedes' ingenious war machines countering traditional Roman siege attacks. Bit of a revenge of the nerds scenario going on in Syracuse. In 213 BC, a significant Carthaginian force led by Himilco was dispatched to relieve Syracuse. It captured several Roman garrison towns on Sicily, expelling or massacring many Roman garrisons. However, in spring 212 BC, the Romans launched a surprise night assault on Syracuse, capturing several city districts. Plagued by disease, the Carthaginian army failed to resupply Syracuse leading to its fall that autumn, with Archimedes, unfortunately, killed during the conflict. Carthage sent additional reinforcements to Sicily in 211, mounting an offensive. In response, a fresh Roman army attacked Agrigentum, the main Carthaginian stronghold on the island, in 210. The city was betrayed to the Romans by a dissatisfied Carthaginian officer. Subsequently, remaining Carthaginian-held towns either surrendered or fell through force or betrayal, securing Sicily's grain supply to Rome and its armies. In the spring of 207, Hasdrubal Barca mirrored his brother's feet by leading an army of over 35,000 men across the Alps into Italy with the intention of joining forces with Hannibal. However, Hannibal was unaware of his brother's presence. The Romans facing Hannibal deceived him into believing that their entire army remained in camp while a significant portion marched north under the consul Claudius Nero to reinforce the Romans facing Hasdrubal, commanded by the other consul, Marcus Salinator. 
The combined Roman force engaged Hasdrubal at the Battle of Metaurus and decisively defeated him, resulting in the death of Hasdrubal. This battle solidified Roman dominance in Italy and marked the end of their Fabian strategy. In 205, Margo landed in Genua, in northwest Italy, with the remnants of his Iberian army, reinforced by Gallic and Ligurian allies. Hannibal's inconclusive Battle of Crotona in 204, in the far south of the peninsula, coincided with Margo's arrival. Margo then led his reinforced armies towards the lands of Carthage's primary Gallic allies in the Po Valley, but was halted by a large Roman army and defeated at the Battle of Insubria in 203. Publius Cornelius Scipio invaded the Carthaginian homeland in 204, winning two major battles and gaining the allegiance of the Numidian kingdoms of North Africa. In response, Hannibal and the remnants of his army were recalled from Italy. They sailed from Croton and landed at Carthage with fifteen to twenty thousand experienced veterans. Margo was also recalled, although he died of wounds during the voyage. In the end, twelve thousand of his troops reached Carthage. In Iberia, the Roman fleet disembarked its army in the northeast in 218 BC, gaining support among the local tribes. A Carthaginian attack in late 218 was repelled at the Battle of Caesar. Subsequent engagements, including the Battle of the Ebro River in 217, saw Roman victories that hindered Carthaginian reinforcement efforts from Iberia to Italy. Hasdrubal, Hannibal's brother and the Carthaginian commander in Iberia, suffered defeat at Dertosa in 215. The Romans capitalized on defections of local Celtiberian tribes over to their side. They captured Saguntum in 12, 212, rather, and hired 20,000 Celtiberian mercenaries in 211. Later on in 209, Publius Cornelius Scipio captured Carthago Nova the center of Carthaginian power in Iberia, liberating hostages and securing a vast treasure, despite subsequent resistance from some liberated tribes. In the spring of the following year, 208, Hasdrubal moved to confront Scipio at the Battle of Baikala. Although the Carthaginians were defeated, Hasdrubal managed to withdraw the majority of his army, preventing any Roman pursuit, with most losses among his Iberian allies. Hasdrubal then led his depleted army through the western passes of the Pyrenees into Gaul. In 207, after recruiting heavily in Gaul, Hasdrubal attempted to cross the Alps into Italy, to join his brother, but was defeated before he could do. At the Battle of Ilipa in 206, Scipio, commanding 48,000 men, half Italian, half Iberian, defeated a Carthaginian army of 54,000 men and 32 elephants, sealing the Carthaginian fate in Iberia. Gades, the last Carthaginian city held in Iberia, defected to the Romans. Later that year, a mutiny erupted among Roman troops, 
with support from some Iberian leaders disappointed that Roman forces remained in the peninsula. However, Scipio effectively quelled the mutiny. In 205, Margo attempted to recapture New Carthage amid another mutiny and an Iberian uprising. But he was repulsed, prompting him to leave Iberia for Cisalpine Gaul with his remaining forces. Carthage managed to recruit at least 4,000 mercenaries from Iberia in 203, despite nominal Roman control. In North Africa, Syphax, a powerful Numidian king, initially declared for Rome in 213 BC, prompting Carthage to send advisors to train his soldiers. However, in 206, Carthage ended this drain on its resources by dividing several Numidian kingdoms with Syphanx. Masinissa, a disinherited Numidian prince, returned to Rome for support. Publius Scipio, commanding legions in Sicily, embarked on a plan to end the war with an invasion of Africa in 204. After landing in Africa, Scipio defeated two large Carthaginian armies and, with the help of Massinissa, captured Syphax. Hannibal was then recalled from Italy, and a decisive battle ensued at Zama in October of 202. The resulting peace treaty, dictated by Rome, stripped Carthage of its overseas territories, imposed an indemnity and restricted its military capabilities, establishing Rome's political dominance over Carthage. Scipio was celebrated with a triumph and bestowed the agnomen Africanus. The war's pressures led to the Romans developing an effective logistical system setting the stage for future overseas conquests. Well, what happened after the war? Well, after the war, Massinissa emerged as the dominant ruler among the Numidians, leveraging Carthage's weakened state to expand his influence. Over the next 48 years, he repeatedly capitalized on Carthage inability to protect its own territories. Despite Carthage's pleas to Rome for assistance, or at least permission to take military action, Rome consistently supported Massinissa, denying Carthage any recourse. Massinissa's raids into Carthaginian territory therefore became bolder and a lot more frequent, effectively having a green light from the Romans. In 151, Carthage, in defiance of the treaty, mustered an army and launched a counter-attack against the Numidians. However, the campaign ended disastrously for Carthage, culminating in the surrender of its army. And although Carthage had managed to pay off its indemnity and was experiencing economic prosperity, it posed no military threat to Rome. Nevertheless, certain factions within the Roman Senate harbored long-standing ambitions to obliterate Carthage for good. The breach of the treaty served as a pretext for these elements, and in 149, once again, war was declared against Carthage. A Roman army of around 50,000 soldiers, 
under the joint command of both consuls, landed near Utica, situated about 35 kilometers north of Carthage. Rome issued an ultimatum, demanding that Carthage surrender all of its weapons and military equipment to avoid war. Carthage complied, delivering vast quantities of armaments, including 200,000 sets of armor, 2,000 catapults, and numerous warships. Well, the Romans thought that wasn't quite good enough. Then they insisted that Carthage destroy its own city and relocate at least 16 kilometers inland from the coast. Well, in response to this, the Carthaginians were a little bit upset. They then terminated the negotiations and began rebuilding their arsenal. In addition to defending the walls of Carthage, the Carthaginians organized a field army under Hasdrubal the Boethark, stationed approximately 25 kilometers, 16 miles, to the south. The Roman army attempted to besiege Carthage, but the city's formidable walls and determined citizen militia thwarted their efforts. Meanwhile, the Carthaginians launched effective counterattacks, raiding Roman supply lines. In 148, Carthaginian fire ships destroyed numerous Roman vessels, causing significant setbacks for the besiegers. Compounding their difficulties, the main Roman camp was situated in a swamp, leading to outbreaks of disease during the summer. Consequently, the Romans relocated their camp and ships farther away transitioning from a close siege to a more distant blockade. As the war persisted into 147, Scipio Aemilianus, an adopted grandson of Scipio Africanus, who had demonstrated exceptional leadership, was elected to consul and assumed command. Despite vigorous Carthaginian resistance, including the construction of warships and naval engagements, the Romans intensified their efforts. In an assault on the walls, the Romans breached the city, but subsequently withdrew. Hasdrubal, getting a little desperate at this point and seeking to bolster the Carthaginian resolve gruesomely executed Roman prisoners on the walls, eliminating any possibility of negotiation. In response to dissent with the city council, Hasdrubal ruthlessly silenced opposition and seized control completely. Scipio then implemented a close blockade and constructed a mole to cut off sea access. In the spring of 146 BC, the Roman army secured a foothold near the harbor fortifications. Scipio orchestrated a decisive assault, swiftly capturing the city's main square and systematically advancing through the residential area. After six days of intense fighting, during which the Romans encountered fierce resistance, they finally subdued the city. The last defenders, including Roman deserters fighting for Carthage, took refuge in the temple of Eshmon and perished in the flames. The Roman victory resulted in the enslavement of 50,000 Carthaginian prisoners. Marking not only the end of the war, but the end of Carthage. Despite the popular belief, there is 
not much historical evidence to support the notions that the Romans salted the city's fields. This myth was debunked some years ago by scholars. The remaining Carthaginian territories were absorbed into the Roman Republic and reorganized to form the Roman province of Africa, with Utica established as its capital. This new province played a crucial role as a significant source of grain and other agricultural products for the expanding Roman Empire. Many prominent Punic cities, including those in Mauritania, came under direct Roman control, although they were allowed to maintain their traditional Punic administrative structures. About a century later, Julius Caesar oversaw the rebuilding of Carthage, but this time as a Roman city. Over time, Carthage flourished and grew into one of the principal urban centers of Roman Africa during the heyday of the Roman Empire. Today, Rome remains the capital city of Italy, while the ruins of Carthage can be found approximately 24 kilometers east of Tunis, the capital of Tunisia, along the North African coastline. Well, we've reached the end of our video on the Punic Wars. Thank you very much for joining me. What an adventure. I feel a little sorry for the Carthaginians, don't you? Very mean trick for the Romans to demand they hand over everything, all of their weapons and catapults and everything else, and then tell them to simply destroy their own city. A very mean trick indeed. But that's just war. Thank you for joining me. Hopefully I'll see you next time. Good night everyone. In the heart of ancient Gaul, the drums of war sound in the deep recesses of the forests and the mountains. One man emerges as a leader and sets in motion a chain of events that would shake Caesar to his core. Today we discuss a great hero, so come with me and we may step into the life of Vercingetorix. Vercingetorix was a notable Gallic king and chieftain affiliated with the Arverni tribe. Born around 80 BC and meeting his demise in 46 BC, he played a central role in the concluding phase of Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars by attempting to lead a rebellion against the Roman forces. Following his surrender to Caesar and a nearly six-year imprisonment, he met his end in Rome through execution. Teltilus the Arvernian, Vercingetorix's father, led the Gallic tribes, and upon his formal appointment as chieftain of the Arverni at the Opidum Gergovia in 52 BC, Vercingetorix took his place 
and ascended to power, swiftly forming alliances with other Gallic tribes, he assumed command and orchestrated the amalgamation of all forces, orchestrating the most significant Gallic uprising against Roman dominance. A notable triumph for Vercingetorix was the Battle of Gergovia, where he emerged victorious against Julius Caesar causing substantial Roman casualties and leading to the withdrawal of Roman legions. Now, my dear viewer, if you know anything about Julius Caesar, and I would assume you know quite a lot if you had watched my other video on him, you would know that he is a man who is not easily defeated. Allow this to set the scene as we learn more about the great man Vercingetorix. Caesar had already exploited internal divisions within Gaul to secure its subjugation, rendering Vercingetorix's attempt to unite the Gauls against Roman invasion somewhat belated. The Battle of Alessia in 52 BC marked the turning point, with the Romans overcoming Vercingetorix's forces through a siege. Now we won't talk about that just yet, as it is the final act of our story. But do remember that we will come back to it later on in the video. Look forward to that. Vercingetorix's narrative is predominantly chronicled in Caesar's Commentary de Bello Gallico, the commentaries on the Gallic War, available at all good bookstores. Today he is celebrated as a folk hero in France, particularly in Auvergne, his native region. You would no doubt see the statue flashing up on screen that glorious green monument to Vercingetorix. You may go and see this monument if you have the pleasure of visiting France these days and gaze upon its glory. Now, what's in a name? Vercingetorix sounds a little confusing, right? Well, the Gaulish designation Vercingetorix can be translated to mean the great king or the supreme leader of warriors, or the great king or great leader of heroes. Now it's a pretty cool name. The composite name comprises of the prefix ver, denoting over or superior, attached to cingeto, representing warrior or hero and concluding with the rix, signifying king. And yes, it's the same thing as asterisk. I am aware that some people are going to comment with the asterisk comments, and I am fully prepared for them. Some scholars have suggested a potential Irish cognate for the name, articulated Ferkinged Anri, which is probably not how it's pronounced. Plutarch, in his Life of Caesar, presents a variant rendering the name as Vergentorix. Florus notes that Vercingetorix was endowed with a name which seemed to be intended to inspire terror. And indeed it did certainly after that Battle of Gergovia, where the Romans were on such a winning streak that they certainly were humbled. Now, Vercingetorix came from the Arverni tribe, which is one of the many tribes in Gaul, 
Despite your memories of Rome Total War, the first game, it was not just one amalgamation of people of the same cultures. It was many, many different tribes spread out over many different places, all having slightly different dialects of languages and different allegiances, including to the Romans. But we may perhaps talk about the uh, Teutoni and the Sequani and all the rest of them in a separate video. But let's understand Vercingetorix's people for a moment, shall we? The Arverni, under the rule of kings like Lernius and his successor, Bituitus, held a dominant tribal hegemony in Gaul during the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC. This supremacy rested on their advancement of metallurgical techniques and sophisticated weaponry. They were also prosperous in agriculture, traded extensively with neighboring tribes, and held military dominance above them. Because of this military dominance, they also received a lot of tribute, which certainly helps in asserting your dominance. However, the zenith of Arvoni power waned when Bituitus suffered defeat at the hands of the Romans, led by Fabius and Arnobarbus in 121 at the decisive battle of the Isir River. Of course, it's fine to be the toughest guy in Gaul, but when the toughest guy in the world shows up, it's certainly a little bit difficult to overcome. Now, following this defeat, the Aedui and the Sequani, which were other Gallic tribes, assumed ascendancy, and this marked a shift in the regional power dynamics. All of a sudden, the Arverni were not the top dogs. Unlike the Allobroges, who were brought under direct Roman rule in the 120s due to the Celtic Wars, the Arverni negotiated a treaty that preserved their independence. Now, this did preserve their independence on paper, but the catch was their territory was significantly reduced. And regardless of the circumstance, when you lose something that is yours to somebody bigger and stronger than you, you tend to feel a little ripped off. Now, let us set the stage for the hero of the story, Vercingetorix. Upon assuming the role of governor for the Roman province of Gallia Narbonensis, which is modern Provence in France, in 58 BC, Julius Caesar embarked on a conquest of the Gallic tribes in the subsequent years, employing a shrewd strategy of divide and rule to maintain control. Utilizing the internal divisions among Gallic elites, Caesar played favorites among noblemen, providing political support and Roman luxuries like wine to certain factions. Revolts such as Ambiorix's attempt in 54 BC, only managed to garner very local backing, and people were generally not keen to go up against the might of Rome. They'd seen it before. However, Vercingetorix, driven by a desire to avenge his father, Celtilus, executed by his own people for aspiring to rule all of Gaul, successfully unified the Gallic tribes against the Romans, adopting contemporary warfare tactics. Now, 
This wasn't just some barbarian horde, either. Bersengetrix was just as smart as he was brave and strong and all the other positive attributes he had. He wasn't going to just be running into battle, screaming and throwing stones and sticks at the Romans. He was a man with a plan, and that all started by having the diplomatic skills to unite his friends against a common enemy. Remember, our friend Julius Caesar was also playing this game himself. He knew perfectly well about all of the fractured unions within the Gallic tribes, the history and the bad blood between them, before the Romans had even set foot into Gaul, and he capitalized on that. It was now up to the Gallic tribes to decide, would they forget their past and unite against a common enemy, or would they take the safe option and be slaves? Vercingetorix's leadership in the uprising commenced in early 52 BC, coinciding with Caesar's recruitment efforts in Cisalpine Gaul. Anticipating that Caesar would be occupied with the unrest in Rome following the death of Publius Clodius Pulcher, the Carnutes, another Gallic tribe led by Cotautus and Conetodinus, initiated the rebellion by launching a full-scale massacre of all of the Romans living in their territory. Now may I remind you that by massacre of the Romans settled in their territory, I do not mean strictly military people. We're talking the entire families of Romans. Not cool, but moving on. Vercingetorix, a young aristocrat from the Avonian city of Gorgovia, inspired his followers to join this revolt. However, facing opposition from his uncle Gobinitio and other nobles who deemed opposing Caesar way too risky, Vercingetorix and his supporters were kicked out of the meeting. Undaunted, however, he rallied an army from the impoverished ranks. He then led this army of impoverished peasants, after a little bit of a pep talk, to capture the city of Gergovia. Of course, after he captured the city, he was immediately acclaimed as King Vercingetorix. Employing a strategic approach, Vercingetorix forged alliances with various tribes, presenting the facade of freeing Gaul from Roman dominance. Of course, once they were freed from Roman dominance, they would be under Arverni dominance. But that's a story for another day. Upon unanimously securing supreme command over their combined armies, he asserted control through stringent discipline and even the use of hostages. This level of leadership and unity was never before seen in Gaul, and it remained unparalleled for many decades after. He implemented a tactical policy of retreating to natural fortifications, showcasing an early instance of a scorched earth strategy. This involved the deliberate burning of towns to hinder the Roman legions from subsisting on the land, aiming to deprive Caesar of resources and safe havens during his southward march Vercingetorix executed the tactics of burning everything, vast stretches of land as his army moved north from Gurgavia. 
This no doubt caused incredible stress on the Roman scavenging parties. However, when faced with Avaricum, the capital of the Biturigues, directly obstructing Caesar's path, Vercingetorix opted to spare it from destruction. Despite the town's formidable protests, naturally defensive terrain, and apparent strong man style defenses, Vercingetorix refrained from raising and burning it. Choosing not to intervene, he set up his camp outside of Arecum and engaged in harassment tactics against the advancing Roman forces led by Caesar and his chief lieutenant, Titus Labienus. Despite Vercingetorix's strategic maneuvers, the Romans eventually besieged and captured Avaricum. In retribution, for enduring 25 days of hunger and contributing to the construction of the siege works necessary for breaching Avaricum's defences, the Romans carried out a ruthless reprisal, slaughtering almost the entire population, which was about 40,000 people. Reports from the time suggest that they left a mere 800 survivors. But why would they do such a thing? Well, there is a logical reason for the brutality. It was thought, and not just among the Romans, but among many civilizations, that if one were to exercise extreme brutality in one settlement, that it would send a message and bolster your reputation. So, whenever you went to the next siege, they would simply give up, as they knew if they did not, it would be far worse for them. The subsequent significant confrontation unfolded at Gergovia, the capital city of the Arverni. During this battle, Vercingetorix and his warriors dealt a severe blow to Caesar's legions and allies, resulting in substantial casualties for the Roman forces. Following this victory, Vercingetorix chose to pursue Caesar, but eventually experienced heavy losses himself, along with the Romans and their allies, in a cavalry battle. Consequently, he retreated and sought another stronghold, Alicia. Following the sub-optimal outcome at Gergovia, a direct assault by Caesar on the Gallic forces was deemed impractical. He was still reeling from that defeat. No doubt many people within the Roman army at the time must have been thinking, but where the Romans? Where the ones who do the winning? Well, not anymore, I'm afraid. Or perhaps this filled them with an anger for revenge. We shall soon see. So, Caesar had deemed it impractical to go on a full-on assault. Consequently, he chose to lay siege to the settlement, intending to starve out the defenders. Vercingetorix, seeing Alessia as an opportunity to set up a trap for a pincer attack on the Romans, actually welcomed the siege, and urgently called for a relieving army. While Vercingetorix may not have anticipated the extent of the Roman siege preparations, modern archaeology suggests that Caesar's descriptions may have been somewhat exaggerated. After all, there were Roman biographers, and are subject to a slight bias. Nevertheless, 
The Roman forces constructed remarkable siege works over the course of a month, spanning approximately 25 miles. These works included a trench for soldiers, an anti-cavalry moat, regularly spaced towers, and booby traps ahead of the trenches. The fortifications consisted of two lines, one facing the defenders, and the other facing any potential relief forces. Although archaeological findings indicate that the lines may not have been continuous as Caesar claimed and made extensive use of the local terrain, they did prove very effective. Despite the swift arrival of Vercingetorix's relieving army, coordinated efforts by both defenders and the relievers failed to dislodge the Romans from this very cleverly dug position. Now Alessia, situated atop a lofty hill and surrounded by two rivers on different sides, presented its own formidable defensive features. Recognizing the strength of these defenses, Caesar opted for a siege strategy to compel surrender through starvation. Given the substantial garrison of approximately 80,000 men within Alessia, including the local civilian population, a swift resolution was anticipated. To ensure an effective blockade, Caesar ordered the construction of a comprehensive set of fortifications called the Contravallation. The structure extended 11 Roman miles, which was around 16 kilometers, or 10 modern miles, with each Roman mile equivalent to 1,000 paces. It encircled the entire town of Alessia, and included 23 towers. Nobody was getting into Alessia, or out. During the construction, the Gauls conducted cavalry sallies to disrupt the fortification efforts, to counter potential sorties by enemy infantry. Caesar positioned the legions in front of the camp, tasking his Germanic allies with pursuing the Gallic cavalry. Upon learning that Vercingetorix had sent messengers to rally tribes across Gaul for war, Caesar got a little worried and began to take preemptive measures. He dug a trench with perpendicular sides measuring about 6 meters or 19 feet, and positioned it 400 stades, which is probably around 590 meters or so, away from the rest of the works. This strategic placement aimed to safeguard against surprise enemy advances, particularly at night, and protect Roman troops from javelins and other projectiles during the very grueling daylight hours of construction. Between the advance trench and the main entrenchment, Caesar dug two additional trenches, filling the inner one with water from the nearby river. Behind these three trenches, he constructed a rampart secured with palisades Atop the structure, battlements and breastwork were added, featuring large horizontal pointed stakes projecting from the screen's joints to deter scaling attempts by the enemy. Fetching timber for construction and securing provisions forced some Roman soldiers to cover significant distances. This had the effect of reducing their numbers at the construction works. In response to large Gallic sorties targeting the works, 
Caesar introduced additional defensive structures suited to the diminished troops. Cut tree trunks were shaped and sharpened into stakes, fastened at the bottom, and put down submerged around 1.5 meters or 4.9 feet with protruding bowels. I'm sure that one can imagine how much this would be an inconvenience to fall into. Tied in rows of five, these stakes pr proved challenging to pull up without the attackers risking impalement, and many attackers were impaled. Pits, sloping inward, were positioned in front of the stakes. Tapering stakes, resembling a man's thigh in thickness, were sharpened, fire-hardened at the top, and placed in the pits to protrude four fingers high. Earth was firmly pressed to a height of one foot from the pit bottom to secure the stakes, while the rest of the pit was concealed with twigs and tree branches. Preparing for the arrival of the Gallic relief forces, Caesar erected an outer fortification, mirroring the specifications, but facing the opposite direction to counter external attacks. This circumvallation traced a circuit of 14 Roman miles, which was around 21 kilometers, following the most advantageous terrain. Now things back in Alessia were getting a little bit difficult. You can only withstand a siege for so long. As the food supply dwindled for Alessia's population of 80,000 soldiers and inhabitants, Vercingetorix took command, ordering the collection of all grain and enforcing rationing. In response to the dire situation, a council convened among the Gauls, leading to the decision to send the elderly and the sick out of the town. Additionally, the town's residents expelled their wives and children in hopes that Caesar would accept them as captives and provide sustenance. However, Caesar, forbidding them entry into his fortification, left Vercingetorix's people stranded between the fortifications, subjecting them to starvation. One can imagine watching from the walls as your own people slowly wither away. Quite the clever psychological warfare from Caesar. Simultaneously, the Gallic relief force reached a hill a mile from the Roman fortification, eventually camping near the town. An assault ensued on both of the outer and inner Roman fortifications, yet their combined efforts proved to be futile. Subsequent attacks during the night faced reinforcements from Mark Antony and Caius Trebonius, who deployed troops from remote forts in support of their comrades. Fearing encirclement by a Roman sally, the Gallic relief forces withdrew at daybreak. The besieged Gauls, led by Vercingetorix, faced delays as they had to fill Roman dug trenches. Upon learning of their comrades' retreat, the besieged Gauls solemnly returned to their town. Identifying a weakness in the Roman fortification on the north side of a hill, the Gauls strategically placed a camp with two legions on challenging terrain. Selecting 60,000 men, they approved one commander, Versicavalianus, to lead an attack on that vulnerable spot. Marching before dawn, the Gauls initiated the attack at noon. Vercingetorix led a sally, targeting weak points in the inner fortification. In response, Caesar dispatched Labienus, Brutus, 
and Gaius Fabius with cohorts of cavalry to reinforce the defence. Joining the battle with fresh troops, Caesar repelled the attack. Recognizing Labienus' critical situation, Caesar swiftly intervened, reinforcing him and ordering a part of the cavalry to attack the Gallic relief force from the rear. The Roman cavalry appeared behind the Gauls, prompting a rapid advance of Roman troops and the subsequent flight of the Gauls. Intercepted by the cavalry, the Gauls suffered heavy casualties, leading to their retreat. The besieged Gauls were withdrawn from the fortification, fleeing their camps, and the Roman cavalry pursued them at midnight, resulting in further casualties and dispersal back to their homelands. Repeated assaults revealed the Gauls' inability to overcome the formidable Roman siege works. Realizing the futility of resistance and acknowledging the inevitability of doom of the revolt, the Gallic forces decided to disband. Vercingetorix, convening the Gallic council, proposed his surrender or death to appease the Romans. Caesar, ordering the Gauls to surrender their weapons, accepted the surrender of the chieftains. Vercingetorix was handed over, and captives were distributed among the Roman soldiers, including the Aedui and Arverni, whom Caesar sought to win over. Following the suppression of the revolt, Caesar strategically stationed his legions across the territories of the defeated tribes during winter to prevent any resurgence of rebellion. Additional troops were dispatched to the Remi, loyal allies throughout the campaign. However, resistance persisted in the southwest of Gaul, which had not yet been pacified. The Battle of Alessia marked the decisive conclusion of organized resistance against Caesar's invasion of Gaul and effectively signaled the end of the Gallic Wars. Subsequent to the victory, mopping up operations were conducted in the following year, 50 BC. During the Roman Civil Wars, Gaul was largely left to manage its affairs independently. In 39 to 38 BC, Marcus Vispanius Agrippa assumed the role of its first governor. He settled the Ubians on the west bank of the Rhine in 39 BC and quelled the rebellion in Aquitania in 38. Agrippa established a radical road network centered on Lugdunum, modern-day Lyon, which was at that time the new Gallic capital, and divided Gaul into three Roman provinces, those provinces being Gallia Aquitania, Gallia Lugdunensis, and Gallia Belgica. Only the Arverni retained their independence following their victory against Caesar at the Battle of Gergovia. For Caesar, Alessia represented an immense personal triumph, both militarily and politically. While the Senate declared twenty days of thanksgiving for the victory, Political complexities prevented Caesar from enjoying a triumphal parade, a significant honor for any general. Political tensions heightened, eventually leading to Caesar crossing the Rubicon in 49 and initiating a civil war, which he ultimately won. Elected consul for the year of the civil war, and appointed several temporary dictatorships. He 
He was eventually declared dictator perpetuus by the Roman Senate. Well, he was uh, assassinated in the same year, sir. He didn't get too far. But what about Vercingetorix? Well, captured during the Battle of Alessia, he languished as a capital in Rome, or captive rather, in Rome for five years, awaiting Caesar's delayed triumph to the ongoing civil war. They were effectively keeping him down in the dungeons, waiting for the day of the great parade, the parade that didn't come for Caesar until a long time later. Of course, the Romans had a great tradition of showcasing defeated enemy leaders for the citizens to jeer at and throw all kinds of insults. And eventually, Vercingetorix had his time to shine at the triumphal parade in 46 BC. He was then rather gruesomely executed by ritual garroting. The Gallic Wars lack a precise end date, with legions continuing their activities many years later. Gaul had not been entirely subdued, and it took a while for it to be fully incorporated into the Empire. There was always a fear in the Romans, underneath the veneer of confidence, that a character like Vercingetorix would rise up again. To this day, Vercingetorix is held up as a hero in France, for standing up against the odds for his homeland. A statue that was erected in 1865 reads as follows. Gaul united, forming a single nation animated by a common spirit, can defy the universe. Thank you very much for listening today. If you enjoy this comment, consider liking and subscribing, and leaving your comments down below. I'm the ASMR historian. Gloria perpetua, everybody. Good night, everyone. See you next time. Lucius Aelius Aurelius Commodus, born August 31st, AD 161, in Lanuvium, near Rome, was the son of of Emperor Marcus Aurelius and Faustina the Younger. His twin brother, Titus Aurelius Fulvus Antoninus, died in 165, and on October the 12th, 166, Commodus became Caesar alongside his younger brother, Marcus Annius Verus. After Verus's death in 169, Commodus became the sole surviving son of Marcus Aurelius. I'm sure you know who Marcus Aurelius is, and if you don't, or if you do and would like to learn more about him, go and check out my very extensive video on the life of this great philosopher king. Now, back to Commodus. Under the care of his father's physician, Galen, Commodus received education from various tutors, including Onesicrates, Antistius Capella, Pithalos, and others, focusing on his intellectual development, doing their best to give him a well-balanced perspective of the world. In 172, Commodus was present at Carnuntum, 
Marcus Aurelius's headquarters during the Marcomannic Wars. It is believed that on October 15th, 172, he received the victory title Germanicus in the presence of the army, commemorating his father's triumph over the Marcomanni. On January the 20th, 175, Commodus joined the College of Pontiffs, marking the beginning of his public life. In the April of 175, Avidius Cassius declared himself emperor in Syria amid rumours of Marcus Aurelius's death. Despite Cassius' rebellion, Commodus assumed his toga virilis on the Danubian front on July 7th, 175, signalling his formal entry into adulthood. Cassius was later killed by one of his centurions before the campaign could gather much speed. Commodus then accompanied his father on a journey to the eastern provinces, visiting Antioch and being initiated into the Eleusinian mysteries in Athens. They returned to Rome in the autumn of 176. And if you are waiting for a video on the Eleusinian mysteries, give me a few days, it'll be there. Marcus Aurelius, the fifth of the five good emperors, and the first since Vespasian to have a legitimate biological son, named Commodus as Imperator, on November 27th, 176. This date, while often considered the start of Commodus's reign, the exact chronology is still uncertain, but we generally can choose this as a roundabout date. He was proclaimed Augustus, or Emperor, some time before June 17th, 177, and he likely counted his reign from the salutation in 176. Commodus was the first emperor born in the purple during his father's reign, a distinction he held until 337. On December 23rd, 176, both imperators celebrated a joint triumph. On January the 1st, 177, at the age of 15, Commodus became consul, becoming the youngest consul ever up to that point. And this was a break from tradition too, because at the time, the minimum age for consulship was around 30 years old. So, he was doing very well for a young lad. He then married Brutia Crispina, and accompanied his father to the Danubian front in 178. When Marcus Aurelius died on March 17th, 180, Commodus, at the age of 18, became the sole emperor. Upon assuming power, Commodus devalued the Roman currency significantly. He reduced the weight of the denarius from 96 per Roman pound to 105 per Roman pound, now that's 3.85 grams to 3.35 grams. He also lowered the silver purity from 79% to 76%, with the silver weight dropping from 2.57 grams 
to 2.34. In the year 186 he further reduced the purity and silver to 74%, making it 2.22 grams, making it 108 to the Roman pound. This devaluation was the most significant currency manipulation since the reign of Nero. While Aurelius's reign had been marked by almost continuous warfare, Commodus's rule, rather, experienced relative peace on the military front. It was a good time. However, it was characterized by political strife and the increasingly arbitrary and capricious behavior of the emperor. Cassius, Dio, a contemporary and sometimes first-hand observer, described Commodus's accession as a descent from a kingdom of gold to one of iron and dust. Now, perhaps it's a little harsh. I mean, the reign of Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher king, is a very hard act to follow. But let's get back to Commodus. Despite the importance of his reign, Commodus's years in power are not well documented. The main surviving literary sources are Herodian, Cassius Dio, and the Historia Augustus, with the latter being considered unreliable due to its fictionized elements. Cassius Dio's reports for this period exist only as fragments and abbreviations. Commodus, after a brief time with the Danube armies, negotiated a peace treaty with the Danubian tribes and returned to Rome, celebrating a triumph on the 22nd of October 180 for concluding the wars. Unlike his predecessors, he showed very little interest in administration, often delegating governance to a series of favorites, starting with Sauterus, a freed man from Nicomedia, serving as his chamberlain. Discontent with this situation led to conspiracies and attempted coups, prompting Commodus to take a more dictatorial role in governance. Despite growing animosity from the senatorial order, evidence suggests that he remained popular with the army and common people, thanks to his generous displays of largesse and participation in extravagant gladiatorial contests. Though not a skilled combatant, he engaged in staged fights, killing animals from a distance and having fellow gladiators submit to him. It all sounds a little silly now, but back then I'm sure it would have made him feel like quite a tough guy. Now, of course the bread and circuses were serving as somewhat of a distraction. A distraction from what? Well, his reign witnessed economic struggles. We'll get to them. To fund his largesse and entertainment, he imposed taxes on the senatorial order. Notably, inscriptions provocatively reversed the traditional order of the two nominal powers, the Senate and the people, into the people and the Senate. Now, you'll probably see a lot of that SPQR. Well, that was the Senate and the people of Rome. Now, in Latin, we say Senatus Populus Que Romanus. But of course, he was saying, Populus Senatus Que Romanus. 
So turning this on its head, well, of course, this did not make the nobility very happy. But then again, they already have enough as it is, don't they? At the start of his reign, at the age of 18, Commodus inherited key advisors from his father. And his father had the best advisors, including Tiberius Claudius Pompeianus, Gaius Brutius Tasons, and Titus Fandanius Vitrasius Pollio, among many others. He was Marcus Aurelius. Of course he had the best advisors. With four sisters and their husbands as potential rivals, family dynamics at this time played a significant role in the politics. Lucilla, over ten years his senior, and holding the rank of Augusta as the widow of Lucius Verus, orchestrated a conspiracy against Commodus in 182, allegedly due to envy of Empress Crispina. Remember, that was the one that he had married. Lucilla's involvement led to her exile, and later, execution, while Pompeianus retired from public life. The conspiracy also resulted in the execution of two men who were allegedly involved. One named Anianus and another Quintianus. One of the Praetorian prefects, Publius Tarutenius Paternus, was later found to be part of the plot, and he and his colleague Sextus Tigidius Perennus orchestrated the murder of Sauterus, the disliked chamberlain. Apparently, Sauterus was running his mouth off all over Rome, and this does not win you many friends, of course. Devastated by the loss of Sauterus, Commodus's discontent provided an opportunity for Perennus to further his own position. Perennus implicated Publius Tarotenius Paternus in a second conspiracy, purportedly led by Publius Salvius Julianus, who was engaged to Paternus's daughter. Salvius and Paternus, along with several other notable consulars and senators, were consequently executed. As a consequence, Didius Julianus, a relative of Salvius Julianus, and a future emperor, was removed from the governorship of Germania Inferior. Following the assassination of Sauterus, Perennus assumed control of the government and Commodus appointed a new chamberlain and confidant in Cleander. A freedman from Phrygia, Cleander had married one of the emperor's mistresses, Demonstratia, and was in fact responsible for Salterus's murder. But nobody really knew that at the time. Following the attempts on his life, Commodus spent a considerable amount of time away from Rome, often at the family estates in Lanuvium. Given his physical strength, which was reportedly quite impressive, he just dedicated much of his time to athletic pursuits, engaging in horse racing, chariot racing, and combat with both animals and men. Now this was done mostly in private, but occasionally he would make a public spectacle of it, and this of course 
was much to the chagrin of the upper classes, but the people in the army thought that it was a fantastic display. In 183, Commodus assumed the consulship alongside Alphidius Victorinus and adopted the title Pius. During this time, conflict erupted in Dacia, but there are few details available. Notably, two future contenders for the throne, Claudius Albinus and Pescenius Niger, distinguished themselves in the campaign. In 184, the governor Ulpius Marcellus extended the Roman frontier northward to the Antonine Wall in Britain. However, due to the legionnaire's revolt against Marcellus, harsh discipline, another legate, Priscus, was acclaimed as emperor. Priscus rejected the acclamation, leading Perennus to dismiss all legionary legates in Britain. At the Capitoline Games on October 15th, 184, a cynic philosopher publicly accused Perennus before Commodus. Although the accusation was deemed false, the philosopher was still executed. According to Cassius Dio, Perennus, while ruthless and ambitious, was not personally corrupt and was actually a pretty effective administrator. In the following year, soldiers from Britain accused Perennus of plotting to make his son emperor. Commodus, influenced by Cleander seeking to eliminate his rival, granted permission for their execution, along with Perennus's wife and sons. Bad luck for them. This event led to a new wave of executions, with Alphidius Victorinus choosing to uh, take matters into his own hands, rather than having somebody else do it in a painful manner. Ulpius Marcellus was replaced as the governor of Britain by Pertinax. Marcellus was brought back to Rome, tried for treason, and narrowly escaped death. Very lucky for Marcellus. After Cleander concentrated power and engaged in corrupt practices, for example selling public offices and titles to the highest bidder, unrest began to spread throughout the empire. Army deserters, deserters rather, caused trouble in Gaul and Germany, leading Peskinus Niger to undertake a military campaign against the deserters in Gaul. While a revolt in Brittany was quelled by legions from Britain, things were certainly hitting the fan in the provinces, and this never bodes well with the people back home, especially when people are losing. In 187, Maternus, one of the leaders of the deserters, attempted to assassinate Commodus during the festival of the great goddess However, he was betrayed and quickly executed. That same year, Pertinax uncovered a conspiracy against Cleander by two of his enemies, Antistius Burus and Arius Antoninus. Consequently, Commodus withdrew from public appearances and preferred to reside on his estates spending his days in quiet contemplation. 
In early 188, Cleander removed the current Praetorian Prefect and assumed supreme command of the Praetorian Guard, enjoying unprecedented power. Cleander continued selling public offices, reaching its climax in 190 when he appointed a record 25 suffect consuls, all under his influence and close watch. Now in 190 there was a bit of bad luck for Rome, and a food shortage struck them very hard. Cleander faced blame orchestrated by the prefectus Anone Papyrus Dionysius. A mob protest during a horse race in the Circus Maximus led to Cleander's downfall. In June 190, the mob called for Cleander's head, and Commodus, under the influence of his mistress, Marcia, had Cleander beheaded, because you have to give the people what they want, of course. The purge also included the execution of Cleander's son, Praetorian Prefect Julius Julianus. Commodus' cousin, Ania Fundania Faustina, and his brother-in-law, Mamertinus. Papirius Dionysus was also executed. In AD 191, Commodus assumed more direct control, ruling through a cabal consisting of Marcia, his chamberlain Eclectus, and the Praetorian Prefect, Quintus Emilius Latius. In defiance of the Senate, which he loved doing, Commodus consistently emphasized his unique status as a figure of godlike power, generosity, and physical strength. He commissioned numerous statues across the empire, portraying himself as Hercules, reinforcing the perception of him as a demigod, formidable in stature, a guardian, and a warrior battling both humans and beasts. Now, by aligning himself with Hercules, he asserted his claim as the son of Jupiter, the chief deity of the Roman pantheon. These tendencies escalated to megalomaniacal levels, moving away from emphasizing his lineage from Marcus Aurelius, the true source of his authority, and instead highlighting his personal role as the architect of a new order reshaping the empire according to his own image. I'd like you to imagine for a moment the Roman emperor having a lot of help defeating the lions and all of the beasts in gladiatorial combat, not doing very much himself at least, what he was doing from a very great distance, and then upon defeating it, flexing his muscles and yelling, Look how great I am. I am the son of Hercules. I think this is fantastic. I can only imagine it. In 191, a destructive fire swept through Rome, causing extensive damage to the public buildings, including the Temple of Pax, the Temple of Vesta, and even parts of the Imperial Palace. Seizing the opportunity in 192, Commodus declared himself the new Romulus and formally re-founded Rome, renaming the city Colonia Lucia Ania Commodiana. That's right, naming Rome after himself. He altered the names of all of twelve monuments months, rather, 
to correspond precisely with his various names. Furthermore, in a rather grand display, he renamed the legions Comodiane, labeled the grain importing fleet from Africa as Alexandria Comodiana Togota, designated the Senate as Comodian Fortunate Senator, and bestowed the name Comodianus upon his palace, the Roman populace, and more. The day of these reforms was to be known as Dies Comodianus. All of a sudden, everything in Rome, including Rome itself, was named after Commodus. If it's not a little bit arrogant, then perhaps it's way too confident. By these actions, Commodus portrayed himself as the central figure of the empire, the essence of Roman life, and the core of its religious identity. Remember, he also claimed to be the son of Jupiter, so I'm sure the Roman people were very surprised to hear that they had a demigod ruling over them. I'm sure they felt very lucky. He even replaced the head of the Colossus of Nero near the Colosseum with his own likeness, equipped it with a club, placed a bronze lion at its feet to create the image of Hercules Romanus, and inscriber boast about being the only left-handed fighter to conquer twelve times one thousand men. Well done, Commodus. In November 192, he organized plebeian games, during which he engaged in a spectacle of shooting hundreds of animals with arrows and javelins each morning, followed by gladiatorial combat every afternoon, where, guess what, he emerged victorious in every single fight and was undefeated. In December, he declared his intention to commence the year 193 by assuming both the roles of consul and gladiator on the 1st of January. As Marcia, one of his confidants, discovered the list of individuals slated for execution, she found that she was on the list, along with some close friends of hers, Laetus and Eclectus. So, consequently, the three of them decided to get together. Upon having some rather heartfelt conversations about it, they decided they had no way out, and it was either die from the execution, or form a plot to assassinate the emperor. So, on the 31st of December, Commodus's food was poisoned by Marcia, but he managed to vomit up the poison. Subsequently, the conspirators dispatched his wrestling partner, Narcissus, to strangle him in his bath. Now, this seemed to work, and he lay there in the cold water for some time. Following his demise, the Senate very quickly declared Commodus a public enemy, and set to work on erasing his memory, and restoring the original name of Rome and its institutions. Remember all those statues of Commodus? Well, they were dismantled, and his body was interred in the mausoleum of Hadrian. The death of Commodus marked the conclusion 
of the Nerva Antonine dynasty. Pertinax succeeded Commodus, but had a very brief reign, becoming the initial contender to be overthrown during the Year of the Five Emperors. Video on that later on. In 195, Emperor Septimus Severus, seeking to curry favour with the family of Marcus Aurelius, rehabilitated the memory of Commodus, and finally had the Senate deify him. Well, I think that Commodus had already deified himself by that point, if you know what I mean. So, let's have a little bit of a retrospective on the character and uh, the strength that physical prowess that he was known for. Cassius Dio, an eyewitness to Commodus's reign, portrays him as not naturally wicked, but on the contrary as guileless as any man that ever lived. His great simplicity, however, together with his cowardice, made him the slave of his companions, and it was through them that he, at first, out of ignorance, missed the better life, and then was led into lustful and cruel habits, which soon became second nature. Commodus' actions suggest a rejection of his father's policies, advisors, and lifestyle, indicating an alienation from the surviving members of his family. Raised in an environment of stoic asceticism, he wholly rejected these principles upon assuming sole rule. And of course, if you know anything about Marcus Aurelius, I'm sure that you couldn't imagine him slaying the animals in the arena and rigging fights to make himself look good. This is simply something that is not within Marcus Aurelius's makeup. However, kids always want to rebel, and that's exactly what Commodus did. There were repeated attempts on Commodus's life, and Roman citizens were often killed just for the fact that they displeased him. Notably, the attempted extermination of the Quintilii family occurred, where Condianus and Maximus were executed on the pretext of their wealth and talent, making them discontent with the existing state of affairs. Another disturbing incident took place at the Roman baths at Terme Torin, where Commodus had an attendant thrown into an oven for delivering lukewarm bath water. Rejecting his father's philosophical tendencies, Commodus took great pride in his physical strength. He was all brawn and very little brain, or at least if he had a brain, he tended to ignore it for the other characteristic that he so cherished. The contemporary historian Herodian described him as exceptionally handsome ordering numerous statues depicting him as Hercules with a lion's hide and club, Commodus considered himself the embodiment of the demigod Hercules, and often replicated the hero's feats by engaging in arena combat with various wild animals. Notably, and in reference to the aforementioned, he was left-handed, a characteristic of which he was particularly proud of. According to accounts from Cassius Dio and the writers of the Augustan history, Commodus was a skilled archer 
who could shoot the heads of ostriches in a full gallop and kill a panther who was attacking a victim in the arena. Commodus harbored a fervent passion for this gladiatorial combat, going to the extent of participating in the arena himself, donned as a secutor. His engagement in gladiatorial contests was widely regarded as scandalous and dishonorable by the Romans. Herodian noted that the spectators found it unseemly for an emperor to partake in such sporting events instead of focusing on campaigns against external threats to Rome. Rumors even circulated that he was not Marcus Aurelius' son, but rather the offspring of a gladiator with whom his mother Faustina had a liaison at the coastal resort of Caeta. In the arena, Commodus, of course, always emerged victorious, as his opponents invariably submitted to the emperor. Now, rather than killing his opponents, he simply accepted their surrenders. The defeated opponents often welcomed their scars inflicted by the emperor as a mark of fortitude. Indeed, one can imagine that if you had a scar that was inflicted by the Roman emperor punching you in the face, that it would be quite a story to tell to your friends back home. Cassius Dio claimed that Commodus would have citizens without feet due to accident or illness bought to the arena where they were tethered together for him to club to death pretending that they were giants a sort of reenactment of the old mythological stories. Dio also asserted that Commodus privately engaged in lethal combat using deadly weapons to kill and maim opponents for his own amusement. For each appearance in the Roman arena, he charged the city of Rome a million sesterces, which of course put a great strain on the economy. It's no wonder he had to start watering down the silver content. Commodus was infamous for battling exotic animals in the arena, much to the horror and disgust of the people in attendance. Once again, according to the historian Cassius Dio, he once slew a hundred lions in a single day. On another occasion, he decapitated a running ostrich with a specifically designed dart, parading its bleeding head and his sword to the senator's seating area, suggesting that they were next. It's no wonder he was so popular with the other senators. So those senators in attendance did not quite see the humor in it, but they found it more ludicrous than frightening and it's noted by some contemporaries that they concealed their laughter at how ridiculous this was with laurel leaves. Commodus also took on three elephants and a giraffe in a single day, killing them in the arena single-handedly. It was hard enough to source these animals for gladiatorial combat without Commodus using them all up for his own vanity fights. Well, quite an interesting character, isn't he? The Emperor Commodus. And although he is long gone, we have the pleasure of reading about him, thanks to Cassius Dio and the writers of the Historia Augusta. It's such a great pleasure to be able to hear about these rather interesting ancient figures, don't you think? Now, if you are still listening, 
I would advise you to like and subscribe the video, and we can have more of this content in the future. Thank you for joining me this evening. I'm the ASMR Historian. Good night, everyone. As you wander through the timeless streets of ancient Rome, imagine the whispers of power and intrigue that linger in the air. The cobbled roads beneath your feet bear witness to the grandeur of Emperor Hadrian's reign. As you close your eyes, let the ambience of the city transport you to an era where political secrets danced in the shadows. I am the ASMR historian. Come with me as we explore together the life of a man who once shaped the destiny of an empire. Let us go back almost 2,000 years and explore the life of Hadrian. Publius Aelius Hadrianus, known as Hadrian, was born on January 24th, AD 76, in Italica, modern-day Santiponche, near Seville, a Roman town founded during the Second Punic War. His family's origin was linked to Hadria, modern Atri a town in Italia. His father, Publius Aelius Hadrianus Afer, was a senator of Praetorian rank from Italica, and his mother, Domitia Paulina, came from a distinguished Hispano-Roman senatorial family in Gades. Hadrian had an elder sister named Aelia Domitia Paulina, Hadrian's early life included a close relationship with his wet nurse, the slave Germana, who he freed, and she outlived him. His father's cousin, Trajan, a notable senator born in Italica, played a significant role in Hadrian's life. Hadrian's parents passed away in 86, when he was only 10 years old, and he and his sister became wards of Trajan and Publius Achilius Atianus, who later became Trajan's Praetorian Prefect. Growing up physically active and enjoying hunting, Hadrian was called to Rome by Trajan at the age of 14, for further education befitting of a young Roman aristocrat. Hadrian's strong interest in Greek literature and culture earned him the nickname Graeculus, Greekling. His early political career began with his service in various roles such as a member of the Decembriri, Stibilius Judicantus, a military tribune with Legio II Adiotrix and Legio V Macedonica, and later with Legio XII Primigenia. His three tribunates provided him with a career advantage compared to many scions of older senatorial families. In 101, Hadrian returned to Rome and was elected quaestor, later serving as quaestor imperatoris Traiani, acting as a liaison officer 
between Emperor Trajan and the Senate. He played a crucial role in composing and delivering the Emperor's communiques and speeches. He succeeded Licinius Sura, Trajan's influential friend and advisor in this capacity. Subsequently, he became Ad Actus Senatus, which means the person responsible for keeping the Senate's records. During the First Dacian War, Hadrian joined Trajan's personal entourage, but returned to Rome to assume the office of Tribune of the Plebs in 105. After the war, he likely served as Praetor. During the Second Dacian War, Hadrian served Trajan once again. He was released to become the Legate of Legio I Minervia and the later governor of Lower Pannonia in 107, where his responsibilities included dealing with the Sarmatians. Between 107 and 108, Hadrian successfully defended Roman-controlled Banat and Oltenia against an invasion by the Laziges, negotiating a peace treaty whose exact terms are unclear. The treaty may have involved concessions, including a one-time tribute payment and the transfer of Banat to the Laziges. In his mid-thirties, Hadrian embarked on a journey to Greece, where he gained Athenian citizenship and served as the eponymous Archon of Athens in 112. The Athenians honoured him with a statue and inscription in the theatre of Dionysus, providing a detailed account of his cursus honorum. After his time in Greece, Hadrian's activities became less documented until Trajan's Parthian campaign. It is suggested that he may have remained in Greece until he was recalled to join Trajan's expedition against Parthia as a legate. When the governor of Syria was dispatched to address issues in Dacia, Hadrian was appointed as his replacement and given independent command. Through all of these years, Hadrian continued to secure promotion after promotion and expand his sphere of influence. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And Hadrian, by this point, knew a lot of people. As Trajan fell seriously ill and returned to Rome, Hadrian remained in Syria, effectively commanding the Eastern Roman army. The Emperor Trajan passed away on August 8, 117, in Selenus Cilicia, leaving behind the legacy of one of Rome's most admired and popular emperors. Around 100, or perhaps 101, during his quaestorship, Hadrian got married, congratulations, to a lovely lady named Vibia Sabina who was actually Trajan's grandniece. The marriage, possibly arranged by Trajan's Empress Plotina, had complex dynamics, marked by a strained relationship 
between Hadrian and Trajan. Trajan was not enthusiastic about the marriages, and it faced challenges due to the couple's poor connection. So you see that this was more of a political marriage, as most marriages were during the day, but generally people got along for the sake of it. These two, however, were having some difficulties. The marriage may have, however, served more political purposes, as securing the support of Plotina, Salonia, Matilda, who was Hadrian's mother-in-law, and their extended family. Plotina and Matidia held significant influence, and Hadrian's succession could maintain their social and political standing. Despite these connections, the relationship between Hadrian and Trajan remained intricate, with evidence of conflicts, possibly related to Hadrian's attempts to influence Trajan through his boy favorites. Interesting. In 112, Trajan elevated Matidia to Augusta after the death of Ulvia Marciana. Hadrian's failure to attain a senior consulship late in Trajan's reign indicated a lack of clear favoritism. Despite Trajan's active support of Hadrian's advancement, he still wanted to exercise some caution as seen in the measured promotion and the withholding of certain privileges. So it wasn't like in some other cases where the one in power, if they did favor you strongly, would not just allow you to climb the ladder, but help you up in a very swift fashion. In Hadrian's case, however, Although he had many powerful connections, Trajan himself wanted him to do it by the book. The issue of succession was critical for the stability of the Roman Empire. Nominating an heir too early might be perceived as an abdication. That being said, Delaying it could lead to chaotic power struggles, and may land you in the same situation as many did with the Praetorian Guard, who certainly seem very fond of assassinating the emperors they swore to protect. So, as Trajan lay on his deathbed, slowly dying, the customary process involved a deathbed adoption wish, witnessed by others. However, this did not occur. Instead, an adoption document, signed by Trajan's wife Plotina, and dated the day after Trajan's death was prevented. Hadrian, still in Syria at the time, violated Roman adoption laws, which required both parties' presence. Therefore, the circumstances surrounding Hadrian's adoption raised rumors and speculation. Naturally, Feademus, Trajan's young manservant, died soon after Trajan leading to suspicions of foul play to avoid awkward questions. No loose ends. Historical sources differ on the legitimacy of Hadrian's adoption, with Dio Cassius considering it dubious, and the Historia Augusta writer asserting its genuineness. 
An Aureus mintered early in Hadrian's reign presented him as Trajan's Caesar, reinforcing the official position of his legitimate succession. Upon Hadrian's accession, he informed the Senate through a letter that he was the new emperor, citing the urgency of the troops' acclamation due to the belief that the state could not be without an emperor. The legion's loyalty was rewarded with customary bonuses, and the Senate endorsed Hadrian's acclamation. Public ceremonies celebrated Hadrian's divine election, including the deification of Trajan at Hadrian's request. Remaining in the east, Hadrian suppressed the Jewish revolt that began under Trajan, and addressed disturbances along the Danube frontier. In Rome, Hadrian's Praetorian prefect, Atianus, claimed to uncover a conspiracy involving leading senators. Hadrian found and executed the alleged conspirators, claiming Atianus acted independently. The reasons for these executions are unclear, but may relate to potential rivals and opposition to Hadrian's intended policy changes. One of the executed senators, Gaius Ividius Negrinus, was possibly Hadrian's chief rival for the throne, and the Historia Augusta suggests Hadrian considered him as his heir apparent before deciding to eliminate him. In 125, Hadrian appointed Quintus Marcius Turbo as his Praetorian prefect. Turbo, a close friend of Hadrian, was a prominent figure in the equestrian order, serving as a senior court judge and procurator. Hadrian's appointment of Turbo might have been an attempt to mend relations with the Senate, especially after the controversial actions of his former Praetorian prefect, Atianus. Hadrian restricted equestrians from trying cases against senators, reaffirming the Senate's legal authority over its members. Despite these measures, Hadrian's relationship with the Senate remained strained for the rest of his reign. Some sources indicate that Hadrian occasionally used a network of informers known as the Frumentari to discreetly investigate individuals of high social standing, including senators and his close associates. This further contributed to the discord between Hadrian and the Senate during his rule. His reign marked a departure from traditional Roman imperial practices, as he spent more than half of his rule outside of Italy. Unlike previous emperors who relied on reports from imperial representatives, Hadrian wished to personally witness the state of the empire. While previous emperors often left Rome for extended periods due to military campaigns, Hadrian's incessant travels reflected a calculated shift in attitude. Rather than viewing the empire as a purely Roman hegemony, Hadrian aimed to integrate provincials into a commonwealth of civilized peoples with a shared Hellenic culture, albeit under Roman supervision. Because we couldn't have people developing their own cultures now, couldn't we? 
Adrian had also supported the creation of municipia, which means municipal towns, allowing semi-autonomous urban communities with some of their own customs and some of their own laws. Instead of immediately imposing new Roman colonies with Roman constitutions. This cosmopolitan and ecumenical approach is evident in coin issues from Hadrian's later reign, depicting the emperor raising up personifications of various provinces. Aelius Aristides noted that Hadrian extended a protecting hand over his subjects, helping them stand to their feet. However, Hadrian's departure from traditional Roman practices did not sit well with Roman traditionalists. Nero, a previous emperor, had faced criticism for neglecting his responsibilities while enjoying a prolonged and peaceful tour of Greece. Hadrian's extensive travels, his embrace of diverse cultures, and the creation of semi-autonomous municipalities drew criticism from those who thought that he was a little bit too Greek and perhaps much too cosmopolitan for a Roman emperor. Before Hadrian's arrival in Britannia, the province faced a major rebellion from 119 to 121, leading to the dispatch of troops and military losses. In 122, Hadrian initiated the construction of a wall. I'm sure you can guess what it's called. That's right. We all know Hadrian's Wall. With the stated purpose of separating Romans from the barbarians. And a quick reminder that the word barbarian to the Romans meant anybody who was not a Roman. So it's not just the uh, image we have of Celtic people running around looking like Vosengetorix and that sort of thing. It was just anybody who was not Roman in their culture. The actual threat, or its resurgence, is speculative, but the decision may have been influenced by a general desire to halt the Empire's expansion and reduce defence costs, because after all, the bigger the Empire, the more expensive it is to patrol. The Wall, serving as a deterrent and controlling cross-border trade and immigration, was complete by the time Hadrian concluded his visit to Britannia in the year 122, although he never actually saw the finished wall himself. Its construction continued to be associated with his name. After his time in Britannia, Hadrian likely continued through southern Gaul. At Nemausus, he may have overseen the construction of a basilica dedicated to Plotosina, his patroness who had recently been deified at his personal request. Around the same time, Hadrian dismissed his secretary Ad Epistolus, the biographer Suetonius, for excess familiarity toward the Empress. I think we all know what that means. The dismissal of Gaius Septicius Clarus, a colleague of Praetorian Prefect Marcius Turbo, under similar allegations, may have served as a pretext to remove him from office. 
Hadrian spent the winter of that year of 122-23 at Taraco in Spain, where, in his spare time and grand wisdom, he restored the Temple of Augustus. In 123, Hadrian sailed across the Mediterranean to Mauritania, where he personally led a minor campaign against local rebels. However, his visit was shortened due to reports of war preparations by Parthia, prompting him to swiftly change course and head eastwards. Now, during those travels, he stopped at Cyrene, where he personally financed the training of young men from well-bred families for the Roman, Roman rather, military. This investment in local communities exemplified by his earlier restoration efforts in Cyrene after the Trojanic Jewish Revolt in 119 was described as characteristic of Hadrian's approach. Upon reaching the Euphrates, Hadrian personally negotiated a settlement with the Parthian king Osroes I, inspected Roman defences, and then headed westward along the Black Sea coast. It is likely that he spent this winter in Nicomedia, the principal city of Bithynia, which had recently suffered a rather terrible earthquake. Hadrian provided funds for its reconstruction, and was hailed a hero out of restoring the province. During this same period, Hadrian may have visited Claudiopolis and encountered Antonos, a young man of humble birth, who later became Hadrian's lover. Ooh. Details about their meeting are unclear, and depictions of Antonus suggest that they met when Antonus was around twenty, shortly before his death in 130. If they had met in 123, Antonus would have been a youth of about 13 or 14, which is a big yikes. The historical specifics of their relationship remain largely unknown, and probably will remain largely unknown, for a great long time to come. Continuing his journey through Anatolia, Hadrian is traditionally associated with certain locations, including the alleged foundation of a city, Hadrianathere, after a successful boar hunt. During this time, Plans to complete the Temple of Zeus in Cyzicus, initiated by the kings of Pergamon, were implemented, and a colossal statue of Hadrian was also placed in the temple. Several cities, including Pergamon, Ephesus, Sardes, and more, were promoted as regional centers for the imperial cult. In the autumn of 124, Hadrian arrived in Greece and took part in the Eleusinian Mysteries. He had a special commitment to Athens, where he had been granted citizenship and an archonet. At the request of the Athenians, he revised their constitution, adding a new tribe named after himself. He also actively intervened in Athenian affairs. For example, he created two foundations to fund public games, festivals, and 
competitions when no citizen was willing to sponsor them themselves. He also granted an imperial subsidy for the Athenian grain supply, a move which no doubt made him wildly popular among the lower classes. During the following winter, Hadrian toured the Peloponnese, visiting Epidaurus, where he erected temples and a statue in his honor. It is believed that Hadrian and Antinous may have already been lovers at this time. Hadrian showed particular generosity to Mantinea, restoring its temple of Poseidon Hippios and rebuilding ancient shrines in the region. In an effort to integrate Greek nobles into Roman political life, Hadrian persuaded Hercules Herculanus, the leader of the Hercules family that had ruled Sparta, to enter the Roman Senate. This marked a significant step in overcoming the reluctance of Greek elites to participate in Roman politics. In March 125, Hadrian presided over the Athenian festival of Dionysia. Added to this, he was wearing Athenian dress, which is quite a special thing for a Roman emperor, not something you see every day, that's for sure. He also committed extensive research to complete the construction of the Temple of Olympian Zeus in Athens, which had been under construction for more than five centuries. Upon his return to Italy, Hadrian visited Sicily, and coins commemorated him as the restorer of the island. In Rome, he observed the completed pantheon, and his villa at Tibur in the Sabine Hills. In March 127, Hadrian began a tour of Italy, restoring the shrine of Cupra in Cupra Maritima, and improving the drainage of the Fusine Lake. However, his decision in 127 to divide Italy into four regions, each under an imperial legate with consular rank, was not very popular with the Roman Senate. These legates had jurisdiction over all of Italy, except for Rome itself, shifting Italian cases from the Roman courts. This change was not well received, and it did not last long beyond Hadrian's reign. Around this time, Hadrian began to fall ill, but it did not prevent him from embarking on a journey to Africa in the spring of 128. His arrival coincided with rain ending a drought, and he took the opportunity to inspect the troops, delivering a speech to them. Hadrian returned to Italy in the summer of 128, but his stay was brief as he embarked on another tour that would last for three years. In September 128, Hadrian attended the Eleusinian Mysteries once again. During this visit to Greece, he focused on Athens and Sparta, the two ancient rivals for dominance in Greece. Hadrian had initially considered concentrating his Greek revival efforts around the Amphiketonic League based in Delphi, but he eventually opted for a grander project. His new Panhellenion 
was intended to be a council that would unite Greek cities. Kinda like a EU sort of thing. Hadrian initiated the preparations for this council, which involved determining the legitimacies of each city's claim to be considered Greek. After setting things in motion, Hadrian traveled to Ephesus. From Greece, Hadrian continued his journey through Asia to Egypt, likely transported across the Aegean with his entourage by an Ephesian merchant named Lucius Erastus. Hadrian later sent a council a letter, uh, the Council of Ephesus that is, endorsing Erastus as a suitable candidate for town councillor, and uh, offering to cover the requisite fee. Hadrian arrived in Egypt before the Egyptian New Year on August 29th, year 130. His stay in Egypt began with the restoration of Pompey the Great's tomb in Pelusium, where he offered sacrifices to Pompey as a hero and composed an epigraph for the tomb. This restoration was likely connected to a need to reaffirm Roman Eastern hegemony following social unrest during Trajan's late reign, as Pompey was widely acknowledged for establishing Rome's power in the East. During their time in Egypt, Hadrian and Antonius also held a lion hunt in the Libyan desert, marking one of the earliest pieces of evidence that they travelled together. During a journey on the Nile, Antonos, Hadrian's favourite, drowned. The exact circumstances of his death remain unknown, and of course, that opens it up to various speculations, including accident, murder, religious sacrifice, or perhaps Antonos had just had a little bit too much of life. The Historia Augusta provides an account of this event, and I'll read it now. I quote, from the Historia Augusta. During a journey on the Nile, he lost Antinous, his favourite, and for this youth he wept like a woman. Concerning this incident there are various rumours, for some claim that he had devoted himself to death for Hadrian, and others. What? both his beauty and Hadrian's sensuality suggest. But, however this may be, the Greeks deified him at Hadrian's request, and declared that oracles were given through his agency, but these, it is commonly asserted, were composed by Hadrian himself. In honour of Antinous, Hadrian founded a city for him on October 30th, 130, and it was of course called Antinopolis, the city of Antinous, if you didn't work that out already. Following this, he rather sadly continued his journey down the Nile to Thebes, where he visited to the Colossi of Memnon on November 20 and the 21st was commemorated by four epigrams inscribed by Julia Balbilo. Hadrian then headed north, reaching the Fayum at the beginning of December. After journeying down the Nile, Hadrian travelled east during 130 to 31 to organize and inaugurate his Panhellonion, centered on the Athenian temple to Olympian Zeus. 
This grand league aimed to bring together all Greek cities, with membership applications requiring mythologized or fabricated claims to Greek origins and affirmations of loyalty to Imperial Rome. Hadrian saw himself as the protector of Greek culture and urban self-government, presenting himself as the heir to Pericles. The Panhellonian, based on games, commemorations, and a non-political Hellenism, had varying appeal to Hellenized cities in Asia Minor. Hadrian bestowed honorific titles on many regional centers, including Palmyra. After spending the winter of 131-32 in Athens, where he dedicated the Temple of Olympian Zeus, Hadrian headed east to Judea around 132. During his visit to Roman Judea, Hadrian considered plans to rebuild Jerusalem as a Roman colony with various privileges. The intent was to assimilate the Jewish temple into the traditional Roman civic religious imperial cult, a practice that was very common in other provinces. However, strict Jewish monotheism resisted these efforts leading to a massive anti-Hellenistic and anti-Roman uprising led by Simon bar Kokhba. bar Kokhba punished Jews who refused to join the rebellion, and a Roman army was requested to suppress the resistance. The revolt is traditionally linked to Hadrian's abolition of circumcision but some scholars dispute this claim, citing issues with the reliability of the Historia Augusta and suggesting other contributing factors like Roman administration, tensions between locals and Roman colonists, and messianic expectations. The Jewish uprising, believed to have started around the summer or perhaps the fall of year 132, overwhelmed the Romans with its organized ferocity. There was just too many Jews. Hadrian summoned General Sextus Julius Severus from Britain and brought in troops from various regions, including the Danube. Roman losses were substantial with an entire legion, which was around 4,000 troops, reportedly just lost, wiped out by the rebels. Hadrian's reports to the Roman Senate omitted the customary salutation, reflecting the severity of the conflict. The rebellion was, however, quashed by 135, resulting in significant casualties among the Jewish population, with estimates of 580,000 Jews dead, numerous towns destroyed, and many enslaved. In the aftermath, Hadrian made some pretty significant changes to the region. He erased the name of the province and renamed it Syria Palestina. Jerusalem was renamed Elia Capitolina, after Hadrian and Jupiter Capitolinus, and it was rebuilt in the Greek architectural style. The main forum was placed at the junction of the main Cardo and Decumanus Maximus. After suppressing the revolt, Hadrian built a temple dedicated to Zeus, uh, Zeus rather, Hypsistos for the Samaritans on Mount Gezerim. 
The harsh repression marked the end of Jewish political independence from the Roman imperial order. In 133, Hadrian took to the field with his armies against the rebels, and then finally returned to Rome, likely in the same year. In the final years of his life in Rome, Hadrian faced the aftermath of the Third Jewish War, which he considered a disappointment to his aspirations for a cosmopolitan empire. In 134, he issued an imperial salutation for the conclusions of the war, although it wasn't officially concluded until the next year. Commemorations and achievement awards were subsequently kept quite minimal. Empress Sabina died around 136, after an unhappy marriage that Hadrian had maintained as a political necessity. Hadrian himself acknowledged that Sabina's ill temper and irritability would have been sufficient grounds for divorce if he were a private citizen. Unfortunately, when you're an emperor, you have to keep up appearances. Following her death, there was speculation, of course, as there always is, supported by the Historia Augusta, that Hadrian may have had her poisoned. Well, I suppose we'll never know. Sabina, who had been made an Augusta around 128, was deified shortly after her death, in accordance with the established imperial tradition. His marriage to Sabina was childless, and given his declining health, he turned his attention to the issue of succession. In 136, he adopted Lucius Saonius Commodus, an ordinary consul of that year, who then took the name Lucius Aelius Caesar. Aelius was the son-in-law of Gaius Avidius Nigrinus, one of the four consulars executed in 118. Despite a delicate health and a reputation more akin to a voluptuous, well-educated great lord than a leader, Aelius served honourably as joint governor of Pannonia Superior and Pannonia Inferior. Unfortunately, he didn't last very long, and died on January the 1st, 138. After Aelius's death, Hadrian adopted Titus Aurelius Fulvus Boenius Arius Antoninus, who later became the Emperor Antoninus Pius, which is a much easier name to say. To ensure dynastic stability, Hadrian required that Antoninus adopt both Lucius Seonius Commodus, that son of Aelius Caesar, and Marcus Annius Verus, the grandson of an influential senator of the same name, and a close friend of Hadrian. Annius was already betrothed to Aelius Caesar's daughter, Seona Fabia. The eventual co-emperors Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus were descendants of this arrangement. While Lucius Verus was not that relevant, Marcus Aurelius certainly was, and if you look through my videos on the old philosophers, you'll find a rather detailed video about his life and his philosophies. Hadrian's final years were marked by conflict and discontent. The adoption of Aelius Caesar was very unpopular, and it led to conflict with Hadrian's brother-in-law and Servianus's grandson. In 
137, a possible coup attempt involving Fuscus, resulted in both his and Servianus' execution. During his last years, Hadrian faced illness and multiple attempts at taking his own life. Now, I personally think that these attempts of taking his own life may have been out of loneliness. I think that in his later life he pictured himself with Antoninos, not lonely and all by himself. Perhaps Hadrian left his heart in the Nile River. So sad. Hadrian did pass away on the 10th of July, 138, at the age of 62, in his villa at Bellier, after a reign of 21 years. Historical accounts by Dio Cassius and the Historia Augusta provide details of his declining health, with some modern interpretations suggesting signs of coronary artery disease in the later portrayals. He was initially buried at Puteoli near Baie on an estate once owned by the orator Cicero. Subsequently, his remains were transferred to Rome and interred in the gardens of Domitia, near the nearly completed mausoleum. After the completion of the mausoleum of Hadrian in Rome 139 by his successor, Antoninus Pius, Hadrian's body was finally cremated and his ashes were placed there alongside those of his wife, Bibia Sabina, and his first adopted son, Lucius Aelius Caesar, who had also died a rather early death in 138. The Senate, initially reluctant to grant divine honours to Hadrian, was eventually persuaded by Antoninus, who threatened to refuse the position of emperor if they did not do so. Hadrian was given a temple on the campus Martius, adorned with reliefs representing the provinces. To recognize Antoninus's filial piety in advocating for Hadrian's deification, the senate awarded Antoninus the title Pius, Despite some ill will towards Hadrian in the Senate, commemorative coinage honouring his deification was kept to a minimum. It would seem that you have to do everything right to be remembered in a good way by the Senate. They seem to be very, very judgmental people. Don't hang around judgmental people, everyone. Find people who appreciate you for who you are, not what they want you to be. And, on that note, we've reached the end of the life of Hadrian. I'm glad you've joined me today. And I hope you've learned something. If you can hear me out there, and you're not already fast asleep, then allow me to wish you good night, and I'll see you next time.